Hi, Michelle. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Hi. Hi, Sam. Your Hi. Substack is amazing and a work of art and should be shared with the world. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. It's like an, it's like entirely true. Like every it's like an event when Sam puts out a sub stack. So I hope I hope you are doing well. It's good to see you. And Tyler, thank you for being there yesterday during the live. That was fun. Yeah, my pleasure. That was a lot of fun. And we have Chiton and Javi. I'm going to be using that idea of the philosopher as helping you make informed decisions like the doctor. I found that a really helpful metaphor. Uh, so really well done on that. Do you have any like additional thoughts based on your thinking on that? Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm always like hesitant with that analogy, but like I can only give like something approximate to that, you know, because I feel like when people hear that, they might be like, but you're not like a certified doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, like what, what makes you think that you can give me any basis for decision making, but then even decision making itself doesn't really come with, um, a kind of doctoral study i mean unless maybe we're talking about like ethics or something um but even then like that framing of like you need to be a sort of certified form of authority would probably be the obstacle in that kind of analogy for people like they would just instantly associate that kind of a thing so that that's something that i've been thinking about but then also at the same time i'm just like it's analogous right like it's supposed to be just an analogy it's not supposed to be the um the fundamental equivalence of that um but yeah i i just found it useful because i was just like i i think right now there's a kind of like you know there's a lot of anti-intellectualism going on a lot of suspicion of authority um which i think is valid and fair um but i also think there needs to be a lot of reframing going on in terms of the philosopher is supposed to be the one in some sense that brings the possibilities to the table mm -hmm. it brings the other aspects to the table and says this is what's here perhaps we did not consider and and this is what we can consider now in relation to our decision making or our life um and so on um yeah yeah, I think yeah. i've That's always true. felt like yeah experts sort of make sense in making decisions in a world of perfect knowledge but it just doesn't make sense when you don't have perfect knowledge and like the future is always unknown so it's like that's where you you need leaderships probably informed by experts but like it's a different mode of thinking yeah no no that, that's exactly right like it's a different mode of thinking like it's like it's like the philosopher is more about what we don't know, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's hard to express that because it's like um, because people assume when you're assuming this position that you are in a position of knowing, but it's more like the Socrates equivalence of, no, I just know how much we don't know in this situation, um, which is the, the hard part to get across because that comes across as you know better, but it's more like trying to point out that perhaps we don't know and these are the possibilities of the ways we don't know um and when we look at the ways that we don't know we can perhaps make better decisions but again it's a it's a it's a clearing of the things that we don't know um or that we can still have problems with um so yeah i mean it's such a hard conversation to have just in general with like general public like the use what's the danger of philosophy what's the use of it and so on no, I, th I think that's magnificent. And Emilio, it's a treat. And Thomas Jockin and Chitan, it's wonderful to see all you people. Well, now you have me thinking because the problem of the expert that Ivan Illich is all about on how today we exist in a society where expertise d does our thinking for us. But then, of course, it seems very dangerous to fall into the legitimization crisis where you say experts don't have a role at all, right? There's this real tension. And also, as you bring up in your substack, and you know, then David Hume and all of this, there's this idea that there's a form of philosophy that is very dangerous and destructive and leads to the philosophical melancholia or the Peter Berger and all this different stuff. But then it seems complete, then it seems erroneous, though, to say you don't have any philosophy at all. 
It also seems like when Ivan Illich is warning in Medical Nemesis that doctors can kind of control people, and now we have a medical apparatus where people don't even own their own health. They just let the doctor tell them to, and it leads to stuff like Nassim Tlaib talks about all the deaths that happen in hospitals, right? Maybe it's an anti-fragile, right? So that seems to be a problem. But then it also seems to be a problem to say that we don't need doctors, right? And this is what's very interesting. It's like, it's like yes, and, yes, though, yes, but, that you see in all these different things. And it's almost like, there's some sort of like ordering here. Um, is there a way, I wonder about this, maybe a role of the philosopher is the identification of presuppositions that people don't realize are there. Like, I'm not the expert. I can't tell you what to do with health, but I can tell you maybe if there's a presupposition there that you don't realize is there that leads you to following a certain tract of thinking that you didn't even realize was there. So the like the philosophers in a kind of business. I think there's also, I'll also note, there's a difference between someone coming up to you and asking, what do you think? Or what do you think I should do? Or what do you think is best? And you kind of kicking down the door and saying, hey, everyone, I'm the philosopher. Shut up. I'm going to tell you what's up, right? Like, you know, they're, that kind of active and that passive thing. I think also it's hard now because we kind of, I think there's an association of the philosopher with the totalitarian one because of the history of the 20th century and also because you're forced to go to school. Like you feel like you're forced to encounter intellectualism. So there's something about the very like being forced to go to school that creates a certain like forcefulness regarding it. And Mr. Lubert, it's good to see you so, sir. But if we think of it more as a preparedness or something that's optional, that can take away from the kind of forcefulness of it. But is it something about it? We've talked before about philosophy as having something about um, self-defense, et cetera, and so forth. Maybe philosophy is about spotting presuppositions that experts have that when you turn to the expert that you need, perhaps, you don't realize that presupposition is placed. So then when you appeal to the expertise, you get taken down an entire tract of a lifestyle that you didn't realize you were going to end up following almost like a game theory dynamic. Um, because, you know, belonging into, we're going to talk about like Simone Weil and neodiversity and non-rationality and the necessity of that, where philosophy has a lot to do with non-rationality and in a way helping you avoid the neurotypical or thinking in a typical manner, because those tend to lead to Nash equilibria, but that results in a lot of the spotting of presuppositions, the spotting of an autonomous rationality that is problematic. So is there something about philosophy and spotting the presuppositional, that the help of being aware when there's a presupposition at place that often does creep into an expert class that they themselves don't even realize is there precisely because of their expertise? Is there something to that that we think, Mr. Rivera, to put you on the spot? Yeah, I mean, I think the conversation is actually the way we approach elucidating people's presuppositions. Generally, people don't like being revealed about their presuppositions in a direct way. <laughs> I would say in most conversations, that's just a non-starter. Like, that's just not something that people want to engage with most of the time. Um, so... I think this is where, in my opinion, I, I, I lean on the psychoanalytic take. I lean on the psychoanalytic synthesis here a little bit because the way psychoanalysis approaches asking questions is something that fascinates me and how it reveals the presuppositions of the patient themselves. Like, basically, how do I get the, the patient to self-reveal himself to himself without me telling him or telling them what what they are presupposing. That's where I think psychoanalysis is very helpful in, in the philosopher kind of negotiation between authority and so on. I think what we can, I think what philosophers can do is to actually defer the authority and say that there is an authority somewhere. And that authority is actually within the presupposition itself that the individual takes for granted. The question is, how do we elucidate it? Um, you know, I think psychoanalysis is one way, one way to elucidate those presuppositions. Like for me, I'm, I'm more interested in crafting, crafting questions than making claims, you know? So someone like, actually Chetan did this to me last session. <laughs> he went, uh, something about free association, but sometimes, you know, it, it takes for granted the idea that sometimes you need to tell the patient what to do. You actually have to tell the patient what to do sometimes. Not let the patient, um, you know, come come to their own conclusions. So 
that's also a, a, a tricky side to what I'm saying as well, which is when do you decide to um, not allow the self elucidation to happen for the for the person and just tell them? That's another thing. That's another thing that is that is there in that. Um, that that to me it is it isn't always clear. It's it's going to be contingent on the patient. But I actually think Freud's point is we care about the person. I think I think that's that's the point too that matters. We have to care in order to make that move that Chitan is suggesting, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I, oh, yeah. Excellent. And it's very windy. So if the internet dies and I vanish, I blame it on the wind. Uh, hopefully now I'll pass it. Well, so first there's a question of, is it always good to point out presuppositions? Because belonging again, one talks about the loss of givens driving us crazy. But then there's also presuppositions. If you don't question them, you can get captured in a delusion sensor controlled by the expert class. And presuppositions can get in the way of experiences of beauty, perhaps, or kind of putting your head down and not making absolute choices because you follow the presuppositions. So there's an interesting tension here where in some ways it seems good to question presuppositions or that you're in great danger if you can't, but in other ways it seems incredibly risky, uh, right? Because then you open yourself up to the, well, what do I think if it's all just assumed? And then you you go into Madland and meta mentality and all of that different stuff. But let me pass it to Sam, Mr. Jock, and then Cheetah. Sam, it is always a pleasure to see you. Hi, it's very much nice to be here. I really like when I have time to do this. Um, okay, so I feel like we're kind of setting up a little analogy, right? Like, it's like a little metaphorical world where we're discussing experts and philosophers and things. And we've got like a doctor and then a philosopher and a patient. And um, each of them are trying to do different things. But I feel like I want to like take them and dissect them and and create Frankensteins out of these little characters that we've created because I feel like although you know it's easy to define a doctor in like or an expert in like literal uh, in in legal terms and, and in terms you know just familiar to us as people in society um like it's not so easy to do that with a philosopher like does your degree make you a philosopher you know like um and then you have like this other thought of like the concept of the philosopher king, like this is a type of person that should rule. He's a philosopher, but he's also a king. Philosopher king doesn't necessarily seem like he's just a philosopher. Um, and what I, I kind of think is like, I like I think that um, Javier, I very much agree with what you're saying on like an archetypal level. And then when it gets washed down into the world of actual people, I would hope that like um, it is the philosopher's job in the um in the doctor you know the, there is a philosopher in the patient there is a philosopher in the doctor and they're operating you know like in a way that you're describing which is to say okay there are some things that i don't know and he's also an expert there's an expert in the doctor which is to say oh there's some things that i do know and i know them really well but there is an expert in the patient which is to say like hey bro i experienced this whole thing this is my experience so i know some things you don't know and so there's an expert and a philosopher, but to, hopefully they're in both the people and, and like both of those things can mediate each other. And then um, actually, um, which sort of brings up another point that I wanted to bring forward, which is when I was listening to your piece, Javier, um, when I initially uh, read just like the title, like, is philosophy dangerous? Um, kind of what I, I was thinking, well, <laughs> What I was thinking um, was kind of more like in the sense that like, and I, I think it relates to this little analogy world that we're creating because a lot of like what occurs in situations that would be covered under the umbrella of like what Nassim Taleb or um, Ivan Illich talk about is like, I think it's not so much like necessarily the expertiseism so much as the customs around expertiseism, which is like a little bit different where it's like, is philosophy dangerous? I hope it is dangerous. I hope that the philosophy within the doctor gives him some freedom to escape or recognize the dangerous custom when it is, when, or the, to recognize the harm or the dehumanization or the you know whatever the ill may be of the custom when it's not 
you know, rightly applied. Like, um, yeah, so I, I, I do hope that philosophy is dangerous, stays dangerous, keeps being a danger. <laughs> I just want to see like all the college like philosophy classrooms have danger like on the door. That'll be amazing. <laughs> Mr. Thomas, when it's a pleasure to see you, sir, and your paper on Heidegger and Hegel, which I had the pleasure of going through is masterful. Everyone should read that in the uh, anthology coming out. I'll pass it to Mr. Jockin and Cheetan. It's very interesting. I like this point on the ideas that the expertise, the problem with the custom, the culture that forms around the expertise. I think that's really good. It makes me, again, I think that's very astute on what I think Illich would agree. Like he's not saying expertise is the problem. It's um, it's expertise that is situated in a culture that then gets in a feedback loop to see it's like to become overconfident, right? And, it, and to me, this problem is huge because it seems to really come out at the problem of scale. The problem that makes everything horrible uh, is that because as you scale, and you have more and more complexity, you then have the impossibility of people to know all of the, like, you can't have everyone go to medical school, right? So there has to be a certain level of trust. So then you trust people, but then there's a certain nakedness and vulnerability and how do you live with that discomfort and what would it look like to then be able to identify the expertise from the culture of expertise of which then exists in a feedback and how do you even discern that and where do you even learn that? So there's a lot of thoughts that come up with that. That's a really wonderful comment, but let me pass it to Mr. Jockin and Chita. Mr. Jockin. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. Javier, uh, always a pleasure. So actually immediately when I I jumped in halfway during your talk session, but Daniel Summary gave me, caught me up to speed. You know, I'm reminded on this discussion of experts, what we talked about with the Eugenian ethics, Javier, right? The idea that we were, sidebar, just give people context. Me and, Javier, me and Javier were having a side conversation about Hegel and basically how much I hate him. <laughs> how much every time I wish I could give him the space to read him, I just get upset. And I, one of the parts was this like obsession with reason as this universal principle that orders all our existence, all reality. And I'm and I'm going, no, you gave me an ethics book, eight, go. And I just throw it in there immediately. It's like, this is a non-starter for me. I just bring it up because you gave me an ethics brings up the idea that uh, using medicines, that's why I'm bringing this up. The idea that uh, medicine has both the medicine, the medical science and the principle of health. Medical science is the means to gain that end, the principle of health. That's the why we reason we have health. We desire, we aim towards health. And in fact, in metaphysics, Aristotle comments that rational acts are rational acts because the agent has the power to do X or not do X. So in this case, to heal or not heal. That's what makes actions rational. I always find it fascinating, Aristotle's account on that. I also bring that up because even this discussion, like obviously, um, legally, the accusation of experts or people who who have certifications, like the, the equivalence of a certification to expertise, I think it's clear is a cultural one. Uh, so I would say generally, probably the more traditional view is one who has the accounts, the logos. We talked we talked this before many times. The, a person with a logos of medicine has a perception of reality that is that is different from someone who doesn't have a logos of health, specifically. And obviously, that uh, that's a point is that of medics can be medicine, as human clarified, because that's the point is that the medical science is a ruling principle under some context in the demon ethics book gave, but so is, so is health. What I'm getting at is everybody knows health. We can see something, obviously, broken legs, vomiting. There's, there's points we can know, even without the account of logos of the science, we know health when we see it and when it's lacking, generally, usually in very extreme points. But then the example from Phaedrus, for example, in Plato, but you can't answer how to change it. You cannot answer to address how to make something go from a state of lacking to su sufficiency, from going from uh, discordant notes to harmony, from broken bones to fixed bones, et cetera, et cetera. That's the medical science. That's the logos in that case, that, which explains a method of how to intervene, which then immediately thought, Daniel, of your point about Nassim Taleb. Like, that's basically the big question. And I, I love Sam's point about custom, because it's very true. The question of when culturally do we intervene? It's a very significant point, and that is culturally set. There's a difference between allowing, basically giving, having a kind of long-standing patience for deficiency, for stressors, for pain, versus the need for immediate intervention. In general, we have a cultural account that, no, we have to intervene. It's actually a liability if doctors don't intervene, for example. Or raising children, they're deficient in some developmental stage. No, we have to intervene immediately. There's a kind of not willing 
to let things abide for a moment. So I think that's absolutely cultural. Um, I think even also the range of what people think they even have capacity to intervene on has changed over time and it's gotten more and more extreme. Uh, there's tend to be, this is more just kind of me shooting off the cuff on this point, but it tends, my appearance, my observation tends to be, we think we have more control over reality than we do. And we therefore think we're more responsible for all the outcomes of reality. Uh, like for example, child raising used to be a very indifferent attitude, wildly so. I always think about the statistic about the French being very notoriously indifferent about their children, as opposed to everybody else culturally in the modern times. But in the past, it was generally, children raising was just an accidental thing. I mean, Plato makes a, Plato has Socrates say this in Credo, where like, what about your children? Aren't you, if you die, who's going to take care of them? Socrates says, what of that? That's not my, that's not a problem. <laughs> it's such a non-starter of a point of like concern. Um, so that's, a, I'm going a little over the place, but that's my point. I want to draw that. I think Sam's comment about uh, cultural expectations of a of what we need to intervene on. I think it's absolutely true to tag that within this scene to Leb's point about intervention. And in general, we get in trouble because we generally want to do additive interventions versus reductive ad via negativa modes of reduction of intervention. I think it's actually really important, not just an abstractional thought experiments, but also, I mean, as a designer, it's basically what we have to worry about all the time. When do we intervene and how? Almost always, it's probably better off just to simplify, like to negate, simplify, break down. Uh, but that's just also just a, that's interesting. That culture tends to work the other way. Like if we try to, if we strip away culture of the kind of infrastructure, so customs and norms, it tends to fall, it breaks apart. I just think I just think of um, the Dawkins. It's on Twitter now. Like this whole thing that Dawkins is like basically Islamophobia is coming out. I'm being a little hot takey about it, but there's a kind of um, he's like, oh, this Christian uh, Christianity air quotes putting some big quote, air quotes on that. Uh, we lost this. He's like he's, he's going to get. He was trying to negate it for so long from a cult. It's a cultural artifact, and now he's turning around saying, wait a minute, we need to talk, come back and talk about it. I think it's widely contradictory and it's whatever. But I'm just using this as a demonstration to show that in certain accounts and discussions, via negativa mode seem very appropriate. In fact, probably is a better optimal way to intervene. But in cultural operations, it seems in custom, it, on this one domain, it seems like it's contrary. It seems to be the other way. Um, also, just one last note, I just want to bring up this account, is that generally, just from Aristotle, I, I, I circle about this a lot because general accounts about universals, so like health, per general, right? So a doctor has an account of health per general, and they're concerned about those mo the means of achieving health that an individual patient may not know because they don't have the medical science logos. However, that's universals, not particulars. Aristotle is very aware of this by giving an account for what's called the equitable. So the equitable one is the person uh, who address who fits the rule to the, to the particular circumstance because if there's a lacking indifference or something lacking in the particular the, of the universal that needs to be applied, that a, a kind of uh, procrustean embed application would not, would be, would do it a disjustice to. So that's why, for example, Aristotle has a comment about that. Sometimes individuals are better doctors than medical doctors because they know their bodies better. So I'm just giving a point that, you know, I think Sam made a comment about that. Like uh, individual patients probably do absolutely have accounts where they have better understanding. But I'm just kind of tying it into the, I was rereading Credo recently, which I think is an underappreciated dialogue from Plato. I find it just it, it, it's it's meaning in this drama it's like very powerful because in the section of it where the personification of the law is addressing uh, Socrates to say do not abandon your commitment to go die basically in the, in the hands of the law uh, he says uh, do not just run away and just at destroy the law by your own choices by your own arbitrary decision persuade us by universal reason I bring this up to point out that even in operations of uh, I think also really the ideas of like where tyranny comes involved is the idea that even in a state of weakness where one is in an inferior state by some universal principle of universal justice or something else, everyone has access to it and can justify their positions on that ground and persuade the powerful on that grounds of universal justice. I find that really interesting my player. Like he has that in there. Um, I just tie that in the idea is that um, – Especially doctors or either people or practitioners who, who are operating on, a, on accounts or addressing individuals under the principle of equity would need to have to address the individual fittingness to the particular. A kind of absentee of that kind of fittingness would actually, I would make an argument, be a kind of 
abdicating of universal justice in this case, because you're not fitting the law to the particular circumstance. I say that because in Islamic traditions and in Christian traditions, and even Aristotle talks about this, uh, mercy, which is a kind of, is superior to justice. In a sense, it's a kind of recognition of the particular circumstances and making and having it fit so that the universal law of justice would not apply in this case. It has to be fitted to the particular. That's for the better case. Um, that's a lot of things. I think it was a great conversation. I'm going to stop there. That's excellent. I'll pass it to Chichon, on Javier and Tyler. First off, Javier looks like he's on the band of a Dave Matthews uh, music cover. That's great. Second, the, the children will be fine because the animals will raise them. I've learned this from Sam Substack. They'll be perfectly fine. Uh, third, your uh, medium presentation on your recent talk on beauty was excellent. So I really enjoyed that. And what you were just saying on fitting this particular, it's very interesting because I'm thinking, how do you tell the difference between the need to abide and when you're being passive, right? Like, you know, there's this kind of idea that you need to abide and dwell and let the thing grow on itself, but then there's a risk of being passive, right? And so it's almost like without a doctrine of fittingness or the ability to discern that, then all you can do is interpret it as passivity. And maybe that's part of the problem today is not having that Aristotelian ethics. We can't tell the difference between abiding and passivity. We're nervous about being passive. So we're always constantly intervening. And actually, I've been re recently, and I'll pass it to teach on Javier and Tyler. I've been listening to a lot of geopolitics uh, in my, you know, because I think that's all quite fascinating on the decisions of nations and governments. Also, Dawkins just likes himself some St. Matthew's Passion and Christmas. Okay, guys, what is wrong with choir? He likes choir. He likes Christmas. Come on, guys. Let's just leave the poor man alone. It's fine. Get your cake and eat it too. It's the best kind of cake, Schrodinger's. And um, I've been reading a lot on how basically so much of the world is screwed up because when everyone's in the room and a guy's making a decision, nobody says anything because they don't want to lose their job and they're terrified, right? And so they're being passive when they know darn well they need to act. But then there are other situations where people need to abide, but they're acting because they're nervous. And maybe a role of the philosopher, maybe a lot of the role of the philosopher is the ability to tell the difference between these things that on the surface seem identical, like abiding and passive, right? Like, you know, in geopolitics, um, abiding or waiting to see what will happen results in a massive military disaster, whereas in other contexts is the ability to let abide allow leads to helicopter parenting and great anxiety, right? On the surface, they seem to be the same action, but actually they are quite different. And it has something to do, like you're saying, on identifying the universal and the particular and the fittingness, right? Well, all of that requires some sort of discerning of an entire context that is quite difficult. But um, but yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the geopolitical and then like Lorenzo's work on the likelihood of someone in that meeting at the White House speaking up and stopping the military industrial complex from doing something terrible greatly increases if you're a sociopath. Like if you're able to not care what other people think, like a sociopath, you're more likely to stop the Nash equilibria. Well, that's unfortunate. So do we need to be sociopaths? And it's almost like philosophy is trying, because sociopath in that context would be neurodiverse or menti diverse to not appropriate more of the um, genetic you know, thing. But it's like the ability to think differently from the rest would actually be what you need in that situation to avoid very problematic in interventionism. But it is very unnatural for people to do that. So maybe part of philosophy is about cultivating that ability to be more neurodiverse as such without having to be a sociopath, because I hear it's unfortunate to be a sociopath. But let me, uh, those are just thoughts that come to mind. Let me pass it to uh, Chitan, Javier, and Tyler. Chitan, it is good to see you, sir. It is a pleasure. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, just maybe putting it in context, discussion me, Javier, and you know, all of us were having last week. It was about, uh, in some senses, uh, thinking about this question of free association already involves that you have a memory of something. So in psychoanalysis, that uh, that distinction sort of emerges through the diagnosis of whether you're a neurotic subject or a psychotic subject. Psychotic subject would not have the memory for free association to take place, whereas the neurotic subject would. You know, so so there's something different that emerges with uh, with psychosis where the memory to free associate doesn't exist. And there the analyst stand has to reorient himself or herself uh, in, in a way that, that they, they can work with a, with, a, with a subject who's not functioning through internal memories. With an unconscious is not inside in that sense, you know, and then that discussion sort of shapes in that in that manner. I think the current discussion may be sort of uh, is an extremely interesting one. And I don't know, um, uh, I don't have something concrete to say uh, on it, uh, but one thing is, I think we can we can maybe I, I can reiterate something over here. 
uh, expertise is is an really interesting problem because expertise while necessary for society to function um, essentially destroys the public sphere you know that's the essential problem the reign of the expertise uh, is the most stupid and base base reign for that reason because expertise more and more sort of gets you distance from the everyday life the everyday common sense and once the political sphere is constructed with this, this exclusion of everyday common sense, politics demands a, a certain equality of opinions, even when the opinions are completely wrong. That is what public sphere sort of constructs from. Expertise demands that wrong opinions should be excluded even before they enter the public sphere itself. That's the fundamental contradiction there, which we, which we need to think about, which is why Expertise is cannot be a political question. I remember having this discussion with Radha uh, some time back about COVID, and he was sort of trying to argue that what uh, what's the name of the famous podcaster Joe Rogan? Uh, Rogan. Rogan. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Yeah. 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 So he Fear was Factor his, boy. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was doing his COVID podcast at that time. I don't I don't follow U.S. politics quite often, but uh, you know he was it became quite a sort of stare over there that should he be doing those podcasts? Should he be questioning COVID? Uh, you know, vaccine and so on and so forth. So my brother sort of immediately said to me that the problem with Rogan is not that what he's doing is actually correct or incorrect. The problem is that what he's doing, he's not an expert in. Essentially, he's, he's questioning a certain functioning of the public sphere without any expertise in that. And that is what is at stake. And I sort of immediately countered, that is why it's so important what he was doing in that sense. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to, that, to that degree. I don't agree with everything that he was, I was saying. I completely understand, but somebody had to play that role. Somebody had to, in some senses, evaluate um, the COVID um, uh, uh, morality and the norms and the rules that were emerging at that time, not from the expert position. And there weren't many people who were doing that because public sphere already, and we, we, we could see that if that would have gone, gone on for a little longer, the, our, our social life would have altered significantly. And it may already have, we don't know. We don't know what effects uh, that would have, which is why I think, you know, Hegel, I think, Zizek sort of always quotes Hegel in that. I don't know where Hegel says it. Maybe philosophy of right. But Zizek always sort of points out that in Hegel, the king should always be the stupid person who connects you back to the everyday common sense. King should not be an expert. <laughs> you know, he should purely sign things. But that, that, that figure of the king, in some senses, uh, uh, does that job of, uh, connecting you back to the everyday common sense, uh, which is uh, which I think uh, plays some role in that in that in that scheme of things. The interesting question which which emerges over here is, what is the role of the philosopher? Is philosopher not an expert? Is philosopher connecting you back to everyday common sense? Hegel's famous distinction between common sense and good sense. We can get into those discussions. Uh, more interesting question is that philosopher today at least is itself uh, not a philosopher which is a, which is which is rooted in any community philosopher is a philosopher of a global discourse in today's times uh, you, know, you don't have friendly neighborhood philosopher like friendly neighborhood spider man in some senses <laughs> you know we don't have that anymore we don't have communities having their local philosopher they don't need to be experts in philosophy they don't need to have that everything but a local philosopher to, with whom uh, to whom a certain kind of discussions, a certain kind of questions can be framed for the public sphere to ponder upon. That isn't happening anymore. Philosophers, that role is at least gone long time back. And maybe at some point uh, within the Greek um, uh, ambit at, at, at that moment, philosophers were probably playing that role. If you look at Socrates' writings and no, uh, reading about Plato's writings of Socrates, you get a sense that philosophers sort of emerge from um, this equality of opinion the public sphere sort of created in the Greek society. And philosopher was the antidote to that, that equality to some degree. You know, he, he, he was at least questioning the presuppositions, asking, thinking about the right questions to ask in the public sphere, such that those opinions can be, uh, you know, in some senses parsed or ordered in a particular way. Uh, that role is completely gone now. We, we, we are no, we, we don't have philosophers of that, that nature. Philosophers are playing some global game which is Completely, you know, devoid of this this local texture in that sense. In that case, how do we how do we think through 
philosopher and expert. I don't know. I am not saying I have, you know, well, who is the philosopher in that sense? What is his identity in today's, today's time? And that identity is certainly in crisis. I, I would say that. I, beyond that, we can have a discussion upon, you know. Yeah. First off, that was magnificent. Second, we got to get ChatGPT to redo all of Plato's dialogues in Mr. Rogers' voice. I think it's going to be the greatest thing ever because Mr. Rogers was the communal philosopher for kids on PBS and public broadcasting. So let's just combine and have the Rogers dialogues. I think it will be amazing, Credo, and all of that. I really like this point on the idea that the king is supposed to be stupid to kind of remind you to come back to common sense. And it makes you think, you know, I, I on the idea of if the king was just kind of the, the family line born into it, it's idea, well, he might be the king, not because he's necessarily an expert, but just because he was the kid on the family line. Is there something good in that? Right. It's almost like there's something good, too. Like you say, well, does that mean we want a stupid president? Maybe. But the problem is they make like executive decisions about geopolitical decisions in the new code. So that's the problem. It's like we now have a position where the leader of like America. Or, well, I'll just use that example, has such powerful executive decision making that they can make without even Congress's approval that this leads to a sense of, oh, we want him to be a world expert. But then there's another sense in which they really can't be or shouldn't be, or what does that even mean? That's really interesting to me. I'm going to pass it to Javier Tyler, Mr. Jock, and Mr. Yes. Mr. Lubin. Yes, yeah, please, Chitan. The president of King may not be necessarily stupid. They have to understand that the position is of their position is of, of stupidity within that system. Sure, you very know, good point. This itself demands some kind of insight, but <laughs> that is a very good point. Oh yeah, so absolutely. So they, so they, they definitely need like the puppets from Mister Rogers that they can put on each hand, and every time they do a press moment, they go, "Okay, what? Okay, what is that? Like Mister Bob or something?" So the president can play that role, like he's an MIT expert at being like performatively dumb. Uh, that, that 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 today politics demanding people like Trump coming to power. It mm. is a sign that people feel safe when a stupid person is there because they think at least he will understand the common sense. Uh, what better. a word. No. Oh, you're, no, that's actually an excellent, that's exactly right. You hear people say that all the time. It's like, he's an idiot, but he gets me. Oh, yes, okay. That's what is happening oh, in India. He gets me. That's exactly what people say. And there's something very profound in that. I'm wondering now, and then I'll, like, on this question of philosopher, king, expert, is the philosopher supposed to mediate the relationship between the expert and the king? Are they supposed to be a between man somehow? I, I'm not, no, I'm thinking aloud. I love what you said about the expert being outside the public, like the public sphere by definition. That is a central tension that actually I think gets into the question of free speech and how free speech needs to be unimpeded by the expert class. And yet the free speech is also aware that it can't impede upon the expert class. This is a really weird tension that someone like a jot, like, um, one of my, a really, really good book on this is Kindly Inquisitors by Jonathan Rauch. I think about that all the time, but I'll abstain for the moment and pass it to Mr. Rivera. Mr. Rivera, again, you look like you're on a Dave Matthews co uh, cover in Mr. Kashir. It is good to see you. Mr. Rivera. Thank you. Um, yeah, what Chaton raises um, it shows that really a uh, philosopher is an impossible position. It is an impossible position, really. It, it is a position that lacks um, because even like even on a local level, right? We don't have the neighborhood philosophers like Chitan is talking about. But even like on a local level, like my own relationship with my partner, right? I wouldn't say, okay, now you're talking to the philosopher. All right. Now let me know. Let me hear your problems. You know what I mean? Like that that's just not something <laughs> that's just not something that happens. Um so even the philosopher himself cannot even proclaim openly that he is a philosopher as such. You could say the only time that I've been called a philosopher as such was the first time that Cadell on his like podcast labeled me Javier philosopher, so on. I don't I don't even like label myself. <laughs> yeah. Me? Philosopher? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Neighborhood philosopher. <laughs> Here you go. But but you see, that's that's what's so funny about the the self-proclaimedness of the philosopher. Um, I don't think I, I want to say I think I don't think most philosophers openly go, yes, I'm a philosopher. Unless we are, unless we are designating a certain economic role that the philosopher earns money because he's an academic, in that sense he is a philosopher. That's the, that's the way that we would understand that. Um, but to to claim a, a philosopher as such without that economic 
um, you would say people would just be like, yeah, you're just like some couch philosopher on YouTube or whatever, you know. Um, and you can see the dismissiveness already um, in that sort of idea. But I do also agree with Sam how it's very unclear in terms of the philosopher is somewhat of a, it's really a, a characterization. It's something that in some sense we all have. There's a philosopher in the person and, and, and so on. Um, and so in this sense, I, I, I agree. I think the philosopher would be the mediating person between the public and the expert. Um, but we have to think, we have to think about this, this trouble with being, you could say, being doing philosophical things without being a philosopher and how to have discourse. Um and, and and so on. And basically being involved in the public, the social, um, without proclaiming to be an expert and yet mediating um that that idea. And I, I feel like that's a very delicate position. Um that is very unclear because I feel like none of this stuff we can say directly to other people. We cannot say this directly to other people. We can't say, oh well, the philosopher is just um you know, uh, the, the, the stupid, the, the guy that's actually dumb or, or something like that, because I imagine my partner's really good at questioning the intentions, right? She would go, well, isn't that just a way for you to hide your actual authority by playing the stupid one, right? Um, so th that, that, that kind of maneuvering, that kind of like way to, to flip the script is, is why precisely I would say now you can't even say it. You can't even say philosopher as such. I am a philosopher as such. What we're having a discourse now is how do we talk? <laughs> how do we talk without expertise? Um, and it's a very unique position because it's somehow we have still yet to differentiate it between, um, or maybe it's not differentiated. I don't know, between what the public would deem as you are somehow portraying a level of expertise. And I do think Sam's point about the custom of expertise is extremely the huge block here, is the, is the huge block between conversation. Because the moment, for example, in my own life, the moment that people know that I read philosophy, my um, anything that I say becomes uh, can be easily undermined because they assume that I know more. Right? They assume that I'm playing expert now. And this, this has to do precisely with the customs and views of expertise, right? It, it, it becomes undermined exactly for that reason. They go, oh, well, I don't want to talk to you because you know more because I've seen you read all this philosophy stuff. And I'm just not interested, but I can tell you have authority. You see how they already apply authority, authority that I was not willing to have or wanting to have. Um, and it can undermine the intentions of any conversation. Because what it is, is it, it destabilizes the power dynamics within conversing versus a person that is genuinely searching for help, wanting to understand things. It can it can deter this. And it's I think it's complicated. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any clear answers for it. No, that is outside. Well, nobody does because we don't have the neighborhood philosopher of Mr. Rogers to help us every single morning. So we're lost in a wide womb of uncreated night distilled of sound and motion. I'm going to pass it to Tyler, Mr. Jock and Luber, and then Michelle and Mr. Wynn has some outstanding comments. I think there is something about philosophy and freedom, and I think it ties to this. I mean, for me, there's something about philosophers. So there's a few things. Philosophy seems to be in the business of keeping us free from rationality, actually. That's the great kind of paradox is like rationality, autonomous rationality leads us in a direction. Because if you think about this tension it, between the expert and the public, it seems like it's irrational not to listen to the expert, right? And to make decisions for yourself without expertise. But then there's also a problem where the expert can't always close the divide between the universal or the particular or impede upon the public space without becoming totalitarian. So there's a tension here that if all you have is rationality, you end up in a Nash equilibrium or the dangerous philosophy, but in the self-effacing way, and you end up with a suboptimal result, right? You get a kind of systems behavior that gets everyone in huge, huge trouble. But you know, you're, like you're saying with philosophy, I mean, there's something, there's also a difference between the expert who comes in and says, 
hey, you can't make decisions about your own car because you're not a mechanic. And the, the mechanic who's waiting for someone to drive up and be like, hey, I can't figure out my car, right? So there's a kind of expert that is forceful, and then there's the expert that's ready, right? And I think that occurs with the philosopher. There's the philosopher who says, everyone's really stupid except me, so I should make decisions, and that's the tyrant. But then you also have the, I mean, another term people use is sense maker, right? Or whatever, the person who, if you come to, they might help you to think through things, but then it's up to you, right? And so there seems to be tension. But what's very interesting about all this is it seems like you have public philosopher expert will have those three categories, and that if you don't have all three, you're in massive trouble. Because the expert tends to step over the public, or the public could defer to the expert even when they should make decisions for themselves. And that would be the Ivan Illich disablement, right? Like, I get that all the time. Like, for example, people get so used to, and this would just be another Illich example, and Clayton, it's good to see you. Like, they get so you like, if you get a headache, and you're like, I don't need to take medicine for it, I'll be fine. They treat you like you're an idiot. You're irrational. You're a fool. You're being stubborn. You ought to go to the expert and get that taken care of. It's like, no, I'm, I have some confidence in natural processes because you're backwards and uninformed. Like if you try to make decisions for yourself outside the expert class, the public will actually turn on you. Not just the experts, but the public. So the public pushes you into the expert class, but then the expert class may also push you into them by their own power dynamics and status. And the philosopher, perhaps by having a role of maybe being identifying the presuppositions or assumptions can help stop all that if they see themselves as between the public um, and the expert located in the realm of what Jonathan Rauch is going to talk about the freedom of speech in that realm of the free discourse that's alive to help people discern these tensions. I'm very taken by this tension between like this question of public philosopher and expert. There's more to be said. But but if that's all the case, then there's something about the philosopher that is indeed in the business of freedom. Freedom, as Mr. Wynn is putting in the comments, because it's about avoiding the Nash equilibria of this total result that leads to rationality being the prison keeper or setting us up. And let me pass it to Tyler, Mr. Jock, and Mr. Luber and Cheetan. Tyler, it is good to see you, sir. Good to see everybody. Um, well, there's been so many things said since I began to raise my hand. So, um, but something that Thomas Jockin said about what I took anyways to be like this knee-jerk uh, reaction to intervene um, uh, made me think of like how, um, you know, we encounter a negativity, uh, you know, on a broad scale or even in a, you know, a personal uh, setting. And it's like really quick. Okay, let's, let's fix it. Um, and made me think of, I guess it's maybe connecting some things of like, maybe, you know, where Zizek turns around that saying where the point is not to interpret the world. Uh, the point is to change it. And he says, well, maybe now it's time, the time to, to interpret again. Um, on a personal level, just the other day, um, I sent this text to a friend uh, who's into Lacan and stuff with me. And um, so if I, if I'm, getting this right, like Lacan cautioned his uh, student analysts to be careful not to, to too quickly understand what is ailing your patient. And I had just been in this conversation uh, with a really sweet uh, Christian pastor friend of mine. And I was trying to kind of, I, I was just trying to be honest about where I was at. Um, uh, like, uh, with with my own spiritual journey and within about 10, 10 minutes of me talking there was just you know advice on advice on advice and I was just like oh wow this is what I do all the time too but like we hear a tiny bit of someone's struggles and we rush in with oh you got to listen to this podcast or you got to try this diet read this book um, but we really don't know what's uh, at root ailing someone um, and that that's where a gentle curiosity without judgment can be such a gift. And um, that was something uh, I've been meditating on from that uh, Mark Gerard Murphy uh, brought up in a, in a talk with Cadell last. Um, as far as like expert thinking goes too, I was, as you guys were talking, I was, I don't know if you've ever read, there's a really cool short essay by GK Chesterton. Um, on, I think it's called 12 Random Men, maybe. And it's a, 
it's about him going into uh, jury duty and how he was so, by the end of it, he was so glad that we have this system that just pulls from randomness to bring in to be the judges of these people because he realized that the judge or the lawyer or something starts to look at the people who were um, who who are on trial not as subjects themselves but as objects almost objects in in their workshop um, and that uh, that that's that's the problem of expert thinking is that we we it's almost like we look at things with a medical gaze we we get or I like we get obsessed with you know one way of one ideology one way of looking at the world and then everything becomes a a nail to our hammer whatever hammer that is so um anyways that's all dang tyler i'm gonna appreciate jury duty forever now wow very <laughs> nicely done uh because i didn't appreciate it last time i had to do it but now i feel like we're keeping the expert class from becoming overly expertise that's it. well that's fascinating actually as a point because I'm thinking, and then I'll pass it to Mr. Jock and Mr. Luber, Chiton, and Emilio on this idea. Is there something about the philosopher that needs to keep expertise in the expert realm, the public in the public realm, keep them separate so that they can dialectically relate in a manner that avoids a um, Nash equilibria, a suboptimal result? I'm also, with that point on advice, wondering if like philosophy is almost like partly in the business of stopping advice from getting in the way of beauty. Or getting in the way of uh, like like philosophies like holding back thinking or the logos from interfering in the place where actually we can grow as we we're talking about yesterday with the garden and the vegetation and different things like that. There's something interesting about the jury duty, like the expert says, "Oh, I actually need someone outside the expertise of the courtroom to see this clearly because everything becomes a nail to me as a hammer." And it's almost like that is what free speech and transparency is supposed to be. Like you write a book and you get people to read it because that's your jur jury duty per se. That's your jury to remind you, oh, actually, my argument's not that good because I forgot all of economics. I should include that. And where then maybe philosophy got this really problematic view because it was mostly specialized in colleges that were in an ivory tower and didn't have a jury duty per se. So maybe the problem is like, you got to keep expertise in the public apart, um, but then you need somehow enough relation between the two where the experts always go, oh, yeah, we're just experts. We're not the public. We don't know. And the public goes, oh, yeah, we're not experts. But it's keeping in a realm that doesn't become um, totalitarian or effacing or something like that. It's a fascinating point. Let me give it to Mr. Jockin. Mr. Jockin. You know it's good when I just come right back on come on again and talk when people start replying back. It's fantastic. Um, Tyler, your comment about the jury duty is excellent. I can actually, and you know, I want I, I want to build on this point though, because um, basically, not the challenge, which I think Tyler's saying is fair, but I think also just to build on it, because I was on a jury, just give people context. I was on a jury duty for uh, a murder trial, so pretty high stakes. I was on a trial for a month. It was a whole process. Um, let me tell you something. Uh, you don't know about you don't know about the opinions of the other jurors until you're after the the month of court case happens and you're filing deliberation. I was absolutely terrified in the initial discussion because uh, what I was realizing I was one of only two other of uh, one other individual. It was two be, of the twelve jurors. Two of us were on the we were on a not we were standing at not guilty initially. We were willing to be persuaded, but we, where we initially stood was not guilty. At rest of the 10, guilty. And when we started talking through, I was like, was there evidence I missed? Was there something like I was I was completely willing to hear it out? When I was realizing was, oh no, they just thought what the prosecution said verbatim as the truth. Like that was what happened. And I, I remember at one point it was like well, we had, we did five days of deliberation. At oh. one point, I lost it. I actually remember like yelling at the at the other at these strangers. I had like this umbrage of like injustice. I knew what was going on. It was it was an internal cultural custom in my mind. I, and I said, I actually I said out loud the presupposition. I was like, "What are you guys doing? Why are you taking the prosecutor at their word? We are the ones adjudicate on what the truth of the rea of the situation is, not them." You're and I said, and I kept saying over and over again when they made a statement that the, I heard from the juror, like the, a juror would make a statement that came from the prosecutor. I said, "How do we know that? Like, how do we know that?" 
Well, the jury, well, the prosecutors are like, and <laughs> what of it? What evidence does he have? That's our job. We have to adjudicate on this. I, I was, I remember I was in a pure terror because I was like, oh my God, these people do not realize why we're here. We're the ones guard safeguarding justice. <laughs> uh, because people were just advocating to the expert, the apparent professional, the prosecutor, and going, and I noticed like they were, and there was a, a lot of presuppositions in the group. For example, the idea that the defense had to make an argument to justify this defendant was not guilty. And I went, guys, that's not their responsibility. The responsibility is the prosecutor. It's not, and by the way, it's not like anyone told these people to have these presuppositions, to have these positions. Uh, they came in with it baked in. It's baked in the oven. And they, it, here we go. It's only in the revelation of a uh, deliberative discourse. That, that was incredibly intense. I know the last couple of weeks I've been meditating on this kind of like, when does the contest of uh, extreme polemic dialectic argumentation actually come to value is when truth has to get revealed through that sometimes. The jury is 100% the case of that happened. Uh, I actually, we eventually did come to a conclusion, a unanimous decision. It took five days and it was a very, we moved a lot and a lot of, a lot of positionality occurred to come to that. I said, I'm willing to be moved. I'm not sitting here saying the man not guilty at all. I can't say that in truth. That's ridiculous. I actually said originally, if the, if the state came to me with a lesser charge, oh, he's 100% guilty for that. I don't even, we don't need a trial for that. I think that's so obvious to everybody. I can see that. Uh, I said, it's the charge that we're putting in front of us that we have to adjudicate on. That's why I said from the get-go. Anyways, um, I'm just bringing that up just to like, clarify this kind of bill what Tyler's saying. It's not like, yeah, this, and by the way, also like the tribune, the tribune of the plebs in the Roman Republic was meant to do that. It was meant to be an opera, an op, a kind of regulatory release valve so that the experts or the majority or the high class could be regulated by a lower interface, class interfacing, which only had suboptimal results. I'm just kind of painting the picture for that. Okay, that was a very long humor me for that point. Um, I think the large point I want to make, though, is what Javier's talking about, this idea of like, yeah, it's really, it's, you're definitely a C word if you're proactively saying I'm a philosopher today. Come on. It's one of those things like, it's, it's literally, it's, I think of the, the Game of Thrones line where, Joffrey's yelling at everybody. He has no authority. And he's yelling, I am the king. And Tywin, the elder one, is saying, anyone who has to yell, I am the king, is not the king. Uh, your authority coming from a title by an exterior title object does not grant one authority, true authority. I think charismatic authority is the use in, psychology, in uh, sociology. I think Weber talks about that. Um, it's the interiority of the soul, a maturity. I say this because generally, like, uh, yeah, nice hobby here. I am the philosopher. Exactly. You're a massive C word if you're doing that. Like, no one's taking you seriously at all. Uh, real wisdom, having influence. I'm thinking of Phaedrus, uh, where in Pla where Plato talks about the philosopher is of, of the rhetorical philosopher. It's really fascinating. Because normally rhetoric is dismissed as bullshit. This is a horrible thing in Gorgias, for example. But in Phaedrus, it's like a complete counter argument is made by Plato. No. In Phaedrus, the, the philosopher is supposed to use rhetoric with dialectic by drawing distinctions that we are able to come to shaping the soul to desire the good, desire beautiful things. That's an entire purpose. Um, I say that because one, notice things like I think of the I think of the Joe Rogan with COVID. I also think of Jesus and the Pharisees. These interfaces. The problem with see Jesus, if Jesus is just basically just hanging out, talking to like had his twelve disciples. He didn't have thousands of people attending his, his sermons and doing these miracles and doing all this crazy stuff, doing all the stuff that's in that the Pharisees were saying are violation of the law as the experts. This is a good example of the idea of distinction of a ruling principle uh, versus uh, ruling science, you know, kind of a, that's a kind of fun distinction right there. Uh, the problems came when the masses got involved. And this is kind of the note. I make an argument, this is very modern politics from Machiavellian on, where the idea is our job is to regulate the masses so we don't destroy each other. Like the law is structured to stop us from destroying each other because we're inherently unstable and the masses are unreliable to, or, to, to orient towards the good and being beautiful souls versus the more old school position, 
from Plato and Aristotle, where the law is meant to shape us intentionally. It's not, it's not even like an accidental thing. It's intentional. The law is not even meant to stop us from harming each other. It's meant to shape us to be better, to be beautiful. Um, I just say that because when we see examples of the Pharisees in Jesus or Joe Rogan and COVID, the, dean, the problem was that people started having issues with it when it got too popular, when too many people were gaining influence by this information. So that's actually a really interesting dot. Inf like the whole point is that we have a general attitude of indifference for most communication, except when the masses get involved with it, when it gets too popular, when it gets too critical mass. Uh, that's a really interesting operation. I find that interesting that we have a, a almost our social body mechanism is aware. It's like that phenomenon I've seen multiple times. And I don't see people talking about with a name, giving a description of that phenomenon. That's interesting. Um, I just bring that last point about maturity because as we know, it's the externality of titles or masses of people listening to you, gaining you authority, right? But the difference is that for the interior, and I remember, I think it was uh, Tyler was talking about this, like this kind of need to, pers to, to prescribe, to kind of intervene. Men of wisdom, people of wisdom are generally people that are quite, are generally giving a space of abiding to listen, to seek to understand, right? And then it's at the opportune moment, that's from Phaedrus and rhetoric, to put the right words and the right phrasing at the right time and the right moment to shape the soul, to guide it towards being, what, what is its good it's trying to aim towards. And that's another thing too, by the way. It's like, that's kind of the point is that uh, Plato says the good is superior to the true, which is fascinating. I think I would not agree with that argument, but I think that's very fascinating. Um, you know, and there's our argument of their co-equality or the superiority one to the other. I say this because, so the experts, the whole pretense of why we have these mediating factors, by the way, of ju jury duties and courts, or we have uh, a discourse of the public to the experts, is the argument is that, yeah, the experts might have, might have truth. They might be correct, but they may not have the truth. I think of Heidegger talks about this point, right? Like correctness is not truth and it's still in a full expression. And that's a little fun language game a little bit, but I think it's useful in this context uh, in the sense that you could be correct, but be completely false. <laughs> like in the larger context, uh, because you're, this statement of truth or this propositional statement of truth that may have no standing in the greater context. Of, for example, um, if you have a bloody nose, and you're having a heart attack, I think the heart attack is a higher priority. Like both should be treated, but something has to get priority over the other. So obviously that meant the principle of priority takes or takes standing here to the correctness of like treating the nosebleed versus treating the heart attack. I'm using a very odd example, apologies. I'm just trying to use something to demonstrate my point. Um, so to kind of draw this out is that there's competing goods. Something has to regulate it. And one of the arguments of the political space is to regulate that. Or again, it's the idea of this, uh, this is the Machiavellian post kind of state of indifference orientation of the moral reality that there are these radically inc inc these um, uh, incommensurate goods that cannot be mediated. There is no way to order these towards a universe, towards a setting of the soul to one good. So therefore, we need a mechanism to regulate the contest, the aragon, the, the competition of goods. Uh, I just find this so uh, kind of drawing out these parallels, these operations, and one of them is this external. But, and I kind of think the way this gets expressed is through external titles, certifications, mass popular, popular opinion or recognition. These are external titles and objects that are used to, reg to give authority, to impose regulation or impetition. But I think about the kind of other orientation, this kind of more quiet, kind of the mode of wisdom, which Aristotle even talks about, close with this, is idea wisdom is, is noose with epistemic knowledge. So it's uh, knowledge of the universals. It's both. It's a kind of apprehension of both. And it's a kind of goodness, but not... A, a, there's some very interesting notes about what wisdom actually is. It's, and I think it kind of points to these kind of more subtle rhetoric doc, doctor of the soul, which is what Plato says in Vedras. That's what a philosopher is, is the doctor of the soul, which has interesting analogies to uh, Catholic thought, for example, with like priests, like the religious being a doctor of the soul, for example. That's a lot... Have fun, everybody. I dumped on the table. No, that's magnificent. I'll pass it to Mr. Luber, Teton, Emilio, Sam, and it's getting very windy, so if I vanish suddenly, that's why Mr. Wynn also has fantastic uh, comments as well, and Jacob made a good... Yeah, there's definitely a thing of, like, saying I am an artist as a dedication, which I think is a very good thing, but then there is I am an artist, so don't you dare tell me my music is bad. Like, shutting down to the discussion, right? But right there, same phrase, 
different meaning, philosophy is the discerning of the difference between those, even though it's the same language, right? And I think there is something to be said where today people are afraid to claim anything when actually that would be facing fear to do so. But how do you tell that difference, right? Well, you'd almost need to be in the particular, not the universal. There is no universal law of, is it good to say I am an X or not? It's all particularized, but that would require you having freedom in the public to make that discernment. And it's almost like, because the point you made on the jury duty, yeah, you have people like, eh, he's guilty. Huh? What are you freaking doing, right? Like, this is what, but this is the problem. Like, if the public is not thoughtful, then the expert class has a claim to infringe upon the public, but in that claim, they cannot do what the public can do. And it's almost like you need philosophy, I almost want to say as the mediator or the vanishing mediator between the public and the expert, where the philosopher is there to keep the public from falling into just voting what they want to do to keep them um, actually being thoughtful, but not in terms of the expert. Like philosophical knowledge is not the same as the expert knowledge of say like what the lawyers or the judge is doing, but it's able to move between the spheres to mediate them in a manner to where the public, where it's almost like you need the philosopher so that the expert class doesn't have a legitimate claim that they should just run everything. And then you could make the argument that the very fact today it seems like, it can seem like the experts should run everything until they do terrible geopolitical decisions, terrible like city state, and then you go, maybe not, but then it's like, well, let's let the public do it. And then you look at the public and they seem to not know what they're talking about. So you turn back to the experts and they're like, what the heck are we going to do? That may be signs that philosophy as the vanishing mediator, the mediator that helps these mediate but vanishes in its effectiveness by helping them relate, um, is not there. But then the funny thing, here's the last point, how then does the philosopher mediate without using force? Because the philosopher be like, you need us experts in public. And the experts in public say, no, we don't. What's the philosopher to do without appealing to power, right? This might be where beauty is everything because beauty attracts people to the mediator without force that then allows the public and the expert to interact with one another in a manner that has the vanishing mediator there. But the functionality of that vanishing mediator requires beauty so that philosopher attracts people into it and helps the public and the expert meet, interact without infringing upon one another. So the very fact that we have these problems of the expert class, and I'll give it to Luber, Teton, Emilio, and Sam, might be evidence that philosophy is missing and or that the philosophy that is present is failing in terms of beauty. Because in failing in terms of beauty, it can't have this mediating function. But let me give it to Mr. Luber, Teton, Emilio, and Sam. Andrew Luber, it is good to see you, sir. Good to see you too, my friend. Uh, so I am a philosopher, suck it, um, and a storyteller. A, a brother, a, a son, a this and that. I feel like you can't escape the label. I mean, I get what you guys are saying. I agree with it. I agree with what Jacob said in the note, and not the note, the comments. Um, it's just the line that you walk with that is like, I'm a philosopher. I say my stuff. Simultaneously, I can destroy my stuff. And that's the point. I you don't label you don't say that you are without you having the ability to undermine yourself and if you can't undermine yourself then you're not actually that thing so like for example the whole like king joffrey like i love that you brought that up it's like he has to say that because he can't undermine himself that's why he has to say it like you can say something like i'll say anything because i feel like i don't really care <laughs> like i could just i could just which changed my mind in a certain regard like correctness is in truth and like i feel like like i can say in the moment based off of how i'm framing that moment something that's absolutely correct but if i had a grip on the underlining principles then i know i can easily just change my framing and destroy the previous framing and have a different correctness um the, it's a it, few things. The, the 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 position of the philosopher between the expert and the public. Because I I've, I've I've actually thought about this a lot. Because to me, what we're missing here is like the role of the storyteller. And for me, it's it's just 
the expert and the public are both operating under some philosophy. You can't escape operating under philosophy. The question is, how transparent, how, how, how much do you realize that you're operating under philosophy? And how, how much do you realize um, how others aren't operating under the philosophy you think you're operating under? So an expert to me is basically someone who's able to realize the philosophy that they're operating under while being able to show with evidence how other people aren't operating under the philosophy they believe they're operating under given whatever like domain they're talking about. Where the public person can act like everybody can say their philosophy the question for the public person, for, not the question, but the point with the public person is they don't have the ability to realize other people's philosophy in terms of, in terms of how it doesn't actually relate to their own. So like, like for me, I'm not, I've really like tapped out of politics and it's Trump and like, that's not good. So it's just not, but like, it's just hard for me to like tap back in honestly. And Problem with I'm at, where, where I'm at with it is I can tell you my political philosophy, but I can't really tell you where other people go astray. I can't really, I really don't have a grip on, I can guess, but like it's hard for me with evidence, like an expert to show where it's like, oh, you're not operating like this. You're operating like there's a certain level of description that the expert is able to tap into that the public person can't. And that to me is the main difference. The storyteller comes into play where if you want to communicate how in a given domain, uh, the expert is able to express the discrepancies between their philosophy and other people's philosophy to the public person. That to me is where the storyteller comes in because the storyteller helps you realize a philosophy. It helps you realize a mode of being where a philosopher to me doesn't really help you realize a mode of being. If anything, when you talk to someone who like anybody that I talk to that I find more philosophically uh, in the waters than me, I get more confused. <laughs> I, I, it's not, I, I don't real. I might realize confusion, but it's not realizing a certain clarity. Like it's dislodging me. There's a certain dislodging going on with the philosopher. So a philosopher, philosopher everybody is operating under philosophy. A philosopher is just basically like keeping the grounds fertile. And that's all a philosopher is doing. They're not saying anything new. They're saying something that's already been said. What commute, what allows you to realize it is being able to take a philosophy put it in a particular description that this description is such that it helps you actually see other modes of being. It helps you become an expert in that particular description. And that is like, a, like a story that like a, a, to me, like I love this guy, Michael Levin. I follow his work. I find him a storyteller because he's able to take his crazy particular domain describe it in such a way that I'm actually able to think about a different perspective as it relates to what he's talking about. That is the storyteller to me, not a philosopher, not even a scientist. And he is a scientist. I'm not saying that he's not, but when he's like putting his stuff out on the internet and he's talking about his stuff, he absolutely comes off as the storyteller to me. Um, then I just, I wanted to talk about uh, the king being stupid versus the philosopher king. Um, I was actually talking about this two nights ago because I think it's actually very much related to how in the entertainment industry, like a lot of production companies put a lot of um, their focus, not in the substance of the story, but in what's going to catch your eye, the billboard, like cocaine bear. Like that was a movie that caught your eye on the billboard, but was in the fold in the unfolding was very passive. But the initial appearance of the um, story was very active. It was very, very in your face. 
cocaine bear, bear that gets high on too much cocaine, boom, like very there in your face. Um, that to me relates to how it's like you have a king that's stupid, but it look he looks right, he talks right, he he has the right billboard, so to speak. But when you actually go into the unfolding, it's quite it's quite lacking of substance. Um, I I think. Uh, I think basically we're having a dialectic between where does the substance go? Once upon a time, the substance was not in the initial billboard aspect. It was, it was in the end of the story. You had to get to the end of the story to realize the substance. So we have to get to a point where there's a middle ground where you understand that there ne there needs to be something that catches your eye and that there's something at the end of the unfolding that's truly of substance. Um, the question I have is, is that a real thing? Can you have a king that has the billboard appearance, but at the same time has the substance like the philosopher king? Because just to like touch on this for a little bit more, the philosopher king, if they truly are a philosopher king, needs to recognize in a certain respect that the billboard matters. Like you're not going to get people's attention without the billboard. But at the same time, it's like if you put too much focus on the billboard, then you're going to lose sight of the unfolding of the story. So I'm not sure if a philosopher king is able to multitask. That's the problem I think of it. Like, like not multitask in a way where like Plato talks about where it's like, sorry, I'm looking for my puppy. I heard a weird noise. Uh, I was chewing on his own. Um, so like, it's not like, oh, like you and you should get married, like dealing with different particular things happening in the society. I'm talking about multitask in terms of, um, from an optic standpoint, like an individual optic standpoint versus like versus um all the actions that they do after that initial optic whether uh it's meaningful if it's fruitful if it's beautiful in a lot of regards i don't know if you can have something where you can have one person pay attention to the beauty of the billboard and the beauty of the unfolding that's why, in my opinion, there is no such thing as a philosoph a, a singular king or a singular storyteller. Like there's, there has to be a group. There has to be more. It has to be at least two, where they're paying attention to the presentation and to the substance behind the presentation. Otherwise, you get lost in the sauce, or you have uh, a situation like we have in the entertainment industry where it's all billboard, no substance, because they're just so focused on a one like a very myopic way of looking at the story it's like how do i create the billboard and then i'll get the story it's like ass backwards now which is which is which is uh crazy um trump i think embodies that where it's like i'm just gonna keep throwing money at the lawsuit we'll get to the truth later but i'm gonna have this billboard of they're trying to get me they're they're Everything is focused on the billboard and the truth will just come much later down the road whenever that happens, if it happens at all. If the story even ends in, in, a, in a normal way. Um, I, I, I also wanted to just point out that um, in terms of beauty, there was a point that you said, Daniel, that I just sort of want to push on. I'm sure we're on the same page in actuality. But um, <laughs> exactly, um, beauty, the beautiful and, the, and force and, and force, because like you like when you're writing your story, like the, like it is very taxing. It is quite painful in a way. It is very difficult. There is this force, a clash, if you will, where it's what you want meets what is needed. And the, 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 the need versus the want clashes and there's a certain force that happens in order to have the beauty unfold so i kind of wanted to address that where what is 
the Force's role in the beautiful when it does take a certain clashing. A classic, uh, forget a story example, like a sunset. Let's say you're going on a hike, like it's, and it's like a difficult hike, and it's like a really high up on the mountain, and it gives you the most beautiful sunset if you get there. I find that like I don't like hikes. Like I'm gonna be out of breath. I'm gonna be like fuck this shit. Like I want to see the sunset, but it's taking me forever to get there. Um, I do find there's some work that goes into putting yourself in the position for beauty to happen, and in that sense, that work is where the force kind of comes in. Um, I I wanted to say also that. Um, one more thing with like the expert um an ex i forget this there's like a saying where it's like an expert's made every mistake kind of thing and that's what makes them an expert um an expert the difference between the expert and someone that's in the public is that um the true to me the the current state of affairs someone that's in public can like change their mind willy-nilly an expert it's like they say this they can't move they literally can't move their position or it undermines their being an expert where i find that once upon a time it was the opposite like if we go like 200 years ago it was like the expert had this like wonder where it's like i'm gonna put this out but then i'm gonna try to undermine it to get to the truth where the public person would have some opinion and they would be like that's that's my opinion you can't change my opinion and I still think that's still true to some degree, but it's like, especially with COVID, if, if a scientist changes their mind on how you should behave in the COVID stuff, then you're an idiot. You're not an expert. Like, like Trump on Fauci, it's like, he, you can't like, you can't trust them. This guy says anything kind of thing. Um, so I just wonder how you're, how you ought to balance that out between the expert having the ability to like express how they're wrong and still maintain the, their expertise while the person in public can still feel like they can say something that they are part of the public without necessarily like being a part of a cult or being part of an ideology or being too much in the wind, you know, like they're just going from ideology to ideology in that sense. They're like dispersed so much that they're not in part of any public group whatsoever um and then I, i've been saying a lot i'll say one i'll say one more thing i i do think it, like there's a lot of work to be done on what a storyteller means and i think a lot of these dichotomies these tensions where there's these circuits if you will it's hard to really think about the silver lining when we don't think about the strictly the communication aspect of how we are understanding these circuits I don't think philosophy is honestly the place where we focus on communication in terms of how we actually communicate. I think philosophy talks about the essence of communication, the metaphysics of communication, which absolutely goes into how we communicate, but the actual how-to, the tangible reality part, I definitely think that it's a storyteller. Cause that, I mean, that's what we all are at the end of the day. Like we just tell, we tell each other and everybody and everything around us things um which are stories essentially so i i just wanted to squeeze that in and this conversation is great can't wait to hear more uh delightful and i think um first off what you were saying one there is this first that you're asking what is the substance it's cocaine uh cocaine bear so we know that we got that covered i think absolutely beauty is only possible because of ble like beauty has to bleed Beauty is also like the force is something that is a result of an internal process and art and struggle that then makes possible something that attracts. And one of the issue is, is that if you don't use beauty and in a way put the struggle on yourself, you tend to externalize the force on other people. Right. So it's an ordering thing. There's always going to be all things all, you know, involved. But the question is the ordering. And I think beauty has to be through that. It, it's like there's also an issue here, like you're saying, of story. Flannery O'Connor has that wonderful line based on to, to the Chardain that is uh, everything that rises converges. And there's this issue that when you tell a good story, the words on the page, there's grammar, there's action, there's characters, there's thought, but it all vanishes. Like it all converges and becomes invisible in its functionality. Likewise, when you talk about the Christianity, like the Trinity and Christianity, the persons vanish in the relationship, right? 
So there's something very strange that, in my opinion, when philosophy is doing what it's supposed to do, it starts to unveil the theme. It starts to kind of vanish into storytelling as story vanishes into philosophy, and yet there are still distinctions. And that's one of the reasons why this is very difficult. I think also if the philosopher is indeed having this function between the expert and the public, then this whole thing kind of vanishes because it functions in the dance, the Dante dance, right? It becomes this, it becomes a harmony of a multiplicity as a one. Clayton has talked about wisdom as the coordination of the many into the one. There's something like that that's going on. And then when it breaks apart, you can't, because you don't have that mediator, you can't imagine them dancing together. And so then they have to conflict. So it's almost like conflict or da dance. And if you don't have these mediations, it becomes a problem. You mentioned, yeah, with the president, it's like you need a team, right? You can't have one person doing everything. But the problem is um, when you have a team, then they tend to become yes men and just do what the guy with authority says. And then the team falls into those pathologies you're describing. Ergo, why systems? So this is the problem. The larger the scale, the more you need a team. And the more you need a team, the more susceptible it is to the Nash equilibrium of everyone saying yes to the yes man. And the one who can break through that is the sociopath. So all the CEOs now are sociopaths. And the president's a sociopath. Like, like literally the system incentivizes sociopathology, like neo-diversity in this negative way. Because that's what follows at scale. Like the, all of what you're saying is what the problem of scale then leads to an incentives of the sociopath where philosophy can offer a neurodiversity alternative to the sociopath. Now, I have to argue that in belonging again, too. But this is the Simone Weil. I have to, much, you know, et cetera, so forth. Um, and that that's that's a lot of the issue. So this like it's like Friedrich Hayek and the road to serve them asked, why do the why do the worst tend to rise to the top? As like a key question he asks in it, he gives his explanations. I think describing how the system at scale, because of game theory dynamics, incentivizes a sociopath is part of the problem. The person who doesn't feel things, which in one way makes their me, and then I'll give it to Chiton here, but there's there's more to be said, but I'll give it to Chiton. That means the sociopath is more likely to be like Ulysses with wax in the ear and just go through the sirens, which in one way is remarkably good because they're not susceptible to public opinion and they can just do what needs to be done. And in another way, that's absolutely terrible. They don't listen to other people and just go through the sirens. So you have a incentive of a kind of sociopath based on the image that is then just reinforced by the public. Mr. Luber, please. Let me, let me just squeeze in, um, because when you're talking about a sociopath in this way, um, you're making me think of myself in a certain context, <laughs> funny enough. Um, I want to kind of just like quickly describe a different type of sociopath given a certain context. Like, I think that like when I'm writing, I'm writing with multiple people always. I'm almost like sociopathic where it's like, sure. I don't really care how you feel or what you want. I really don't care. All I care about is what this theme needs, like what the story needs in terms of the theme. And in that sense, it's like, I am psychotic in a certain way, but it's, 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 I don't care about what you want because I know I have a faith at the end of the day that the theme will actually satisfy what you want at the end of the day. And I, that, that might be lingering in the back of my mind, but there is a type of sociopath where their orientation is towards something that actually constitutes the parts. And, and in, in, in that sense constitutes the, the, the emotive uh, desires that people want when be experiencing these parts. Um, and I do think like like a position like a king needs there needs to be some like architecture where they're able to look toward this where it'll help it'll, it'll not help but it will constitute the part in that sense that it might from an optic standpoint looks psychotic but it's not in actuality because their orientation is toward like you know goodness and extending you know human want and I, I think you get my point but sorry oh, yeah no i'll just say very quickly and give it to Cheetan is i'm not necessarily saying the sociopath is all bad because in the ulysses standpoint it's extremely important and you could bring in the delusian individual at this point with that ability to actually move is part of what makes the negan tropy but there's an ordering question here and the issue is what happens if the system at scale incentivizes the sociopath that then gets out of order with the expert the public and the philosopher and maybe there's a leader as a fourth part i'd have to think about that and there's some sort of vanishing mediator there but let me give it to chitan chitan please i think andrew sort of uh, the vocation is a brilliant one who is a storyteller in all of this 
know what do we do with the storyteller in that in that sense and i think we need we, there's a lot can be done you know um, it's a completely different horizon for thinking around this in this kind of question uh, i think one of the things that we are we are trying to coming at over here is that expert somewhere silences us uh, is silences the subject so i i i know when, when i'm talking to my friends about certain certain issues it's very interesting that minute certain expert knowledge such entering in the conversation in any friendly conversation i see points of silences emerge in, in, within that space i see other person going silent he's saying there's no point con- continuing this conversation anymore it may be so that he will agree to the expert knowledge at certain moments when in scientific and so on and so forth but often you will find that 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 point of resistance emerges through silence um i remember seeing this um in covid a lot uh, not everybody could wear mask the way that we were expected to wear not everybody could you know change those masks and you know follow the protocols and so on and so forth and i, I remember um that certain people sort of taking this moral high ground other people uh, i live in some sort of a corner of delhi in that sense and of course people are not following the covid covid protocols and you know and somebody from say the um, so us would come to delhi and i one of my friends did come and he was shocked oh this is the covid will spread and so on and so forth and and it it was interesting that that minute you will see that to people living over here whose lives are you know they will mostly go silent they will not even fight you they will not even debate you on that point usually and even if they were debate you they would debate you like a mad, mad, mad people they would be debate you like without any sort of hold on reason and so on and so forth this fundamental asymmetry the question becomes can philosopher uh, uh, in some ways alter this asymmetry can philosopher some way shift this asymmetry uh, philosopher's position as uh, as having some kind of uh, legitimacy towards uh, or uh, some kind of uh, you know uh, authority over thinking you know uh, should be able to do so i think that, that is how i i read the greek philosopher in in, in that sense that that they expected the philosopher to in some senses um create the ground on which experts and common man can meet it's not simply that they are simply mediating it's the creation of the ground on what ground this this conversation can be had uh i think that is a fundamentally a failed project in our times that that story is long gone we couldn't create that ground and that it doesn't exist uh you know uh, in fact today we reach a stage where where uh, where most experts in their field will tell you we don't need philosophers we don't need philosophers to think with we don't need philosophers to create that ground within that sense uh you know and that that story i think uh, for whatever reasons took a different turn and we can ask the questions but this problem of silence and silence in in in, in our public life in the social life still remains we all go silent at certain moments we all knowingly or unknowingly uh, you know don't express ourselves and that knowledge can be coming from anywhere and don't get me wrong i think experts have a very very instrumental role in play in, in our life i don't think we can leave the i'm saying we should not have experts that's not the point of course uh, experts are extremely important uh, primarily because without experts we would not have any f- form of domain specific knowledge you know such that uh, the chaos of the public sphere can be sort of reigned in, in any way uh, they they are definitely needed in that sense they they do play a role the question is not that they're not important the question is that they're so important such that they overtake everything else you know that is how that is how that problem emerges and, and and what we are left with is what do we do with these silences that that emerge in these in these interspersed uh, moments you know um, can philosopher uh, bridge those or or make some voices present for us can philosopher play that role um i personally think philosopher's role has drastically shifted from that point uh, and that is where storyteller comes into picture storyteller can still play that role storyteller can give still give voice to uh, uh, those silences in some senses a uh, philosopher on the other hand probably can start uh, 
finding a separate discourse with a separate conversation with the, with the experts now. That is what is happening. That is what we are seeing happen, happen at least that, that philosophers are having their own conversation with the experts. You know, and, and they are thinking that that conversation will eventually be of value to resilience. We are hoping at least they would it would be. <laughs> you know, we are hoping that somewhere some value would be would be created from the from the conversation that we are having with experts. And uh, mostly experts themselves are not uh, not interested to most of the times have those conversations with, with any of the any of the people who sort of even remotely take on the identity of the philosopher. You know, uh, that's 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 I think uh, one thing that that emerged, I just I'll just quickly finish by making the last uh, uh, point that I was thinking about uh, that uh, regardless of these terrains that and this this kind of movement that we are we are seeing um, the position of the expert in many ways uh, has been framed in a manner uh, such that that such that it it necessarily undermines or or, some, or, or undermines or exceeds you know. Its role in in, in 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 the society, so that tension that expert is creating is not tension for the philosopher either. As philosophers, we can think, and we will think and get away with a lot of things. We will have answers to certain questions. You know, it, it is a tension that that on which philosophers start thinking. That tension or the contradiction still hurts a lot of people. It has real pain and real, uh, you know. Um, and that, that is where I think the question becomes, is thinking the sole uh, property of philosophers? It, it, does, does thinking needs to be completely domesticated by, by philosophy? Or are there other ways of appropriating this act called thinking? And what does it entail? Does it have to be, or, 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 or we play the reverse game? Is all thinking just philosophy? And we are trying to play that game also. We are trying to include because we, we are such a you know people who engage in real philosophy, that tradition that we've been reading. We are, we are so, in such a so in minority that we've started saying that oh, anybody who's thinking is a philosopher eventually. <laughs> because we want to, we want to in some senses find some kind of a you know uh, common ground. But that may not be true. People can think from very various standpoints that that may not be part of this long conversation that we are having. In that sense, and we can also see that because experts are exceeding and undermining themselves, we also see that that they themselves are losing their own authority over the public sphere. Also, so wherever people can rebel in questions of ethics, questions of religion, questions of knowledge, uh, they rebel very very strongly against the expert. So, it, where they follow, they follow completely, and where they rebel, they rebel completely. And usually, the experts in the scientific discourse gets that certain kind of following. But experts in other discourses, humanities, social sciences, anthropology, all of these dis discourses where experts have a role to say to something to say to the public sphere, they are undermined across the board. So it's not simply that experts are getting this great day. Most experts are in terrible situations. <laughs> and they're, they're facing extreme poverty in, in, in that sense, both in the political, the political governance sphere and the public and social sphere also. And just sort of there. That was all magnificent. Um, no, I think you're exactly right that the expert is also facing trouble. I'm going to pass it to Emilio, Sam Clayton, Javier, Jockin, and Thomas Wynn. And I think, so there's a few things. Um, first off, I love this idea that the philosopher is like, please, experts, love us, love us. Okay, you don't have to love us because all thinking is philosophy. We have a role, dang it. Like, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> please love us. Wait, please. I think that's exactly right, because there's an, a lack of clarity about what the philosopher does. And I think this speaks to Luber's points in the Heidegger and to Mr. Wins, where basically, until there's a new story, philosopher can't say its role and it can't have this role. Like, it seems to me philosophy has some sort of role of the mediation between the expert and the public, but it can't do that without a new story or a new theme by which it can hold that. Without that, it's stuck appealing to the expert class where the experts are like, we don't need you. Then the experts are like, no one trusts them because they try to overfit their expertise into the public. Then people hate them and the sociopath wins. Uh, so that's not too good. And it seems like, so it definitely seems like that. Um, so it's like philosophy basically seems like without story or beauty and or common life, 
doesn't really know what it does, it becomes unclear. And in that it becomes very oscillating. It doesn't know what it's doing and it becomes confused. So like you're saying, like the contradiction causes people a lot of difficulty. Well, David Hume would be like, exactly. In common life, philosophy can help people live with these contradictions because if you don't, they repress them. And when they repress them, they become very susceptible to fascism, totalitarianism, and blow up. So the philosopher has a therapeutic role that is not like a cheap therapy, but dealing with people's real lived experience in their common life to help them think through complexity and difficulty, right? And so likewise, philosophy can be in the business of creating clearings for the experience of beauty or helping people find the theme to situate it. You don't have any of that. Then philosophy is begging to experts, doesn't know what it's doing, or just claims all thinking is philosophy. Please love us. Please mommy please i think like for me it's almost like i want to say here there's something about for me free speech and philosophy that's tied together if we understand free speech is not merely expression but the very way a society finds knowledge thinks lives together and operates that's why jonathan rouch's book is a freaking huge deal maybe what the philosopher does is when the expert tries to come in and threaten free speech the philosopher can be like hey check your presuppositions and so you can check and balance the expert from infringing upon the public. But then when the public is like, we don't need the expert, the philosophers go, hey, you don't have the technical knowledge to build the house, as Mr. Wynn was saying. You need that in order to have a place to dwell. So there's some sort of check and balance function that can be occurring. That it, And then if Jonathan Rauch and all these people are right about free speech being central, if you lose free speech, you basically lose the society. You, lo you lose a means to test knowledge. You lose a way to, yeah, it's an amazing book. I'll put it, it's like one of the best. Um, Without free speech, the society basically is doomed. Just take my word for it. In terms of knowledge, testing, acquisition, living together. And basically, the it seems like the philosopher can keep the expert and the public relating in such a manner that free speech doesn't die. So you have the dance that is the social order, where then the expert class doesn't suffer, nor does the public. There's something there. There's more to say. But let me give it to Emilio, Sam, Clayton, Javier, Mr. Jockin, and Wynn. Emilio, please, it is good to see you today, sir. Hello, always a pleasure to be here. Wonderful conversation as always. Um, I think um it's it's interesting because um like I, I, I wrote some notes for like the of all the conversation and I and one and, and maybe it's a, a naive question, but I think like what what is um a philosopher, right? In the sense that um you can be a philosopher in the academic sense that you, like your profession is is being a philosopher, and you can be like um uh, like the neighbor philosopher, right? That you're like, this type of person that has this type of role. But I think that um a philosopher is like one possible definition or one way of of looking at it. It's like it's someone that no notices things that others uh maybe don't and ask. And they ask questions, right? And I think that in that way, like most people are philosophers, in like um, it's in one point of their lives because it's not like I am a philosopher, right? It's like I play the role of philosopher in this conversation, right? Maybe I'm an expert on this thing, and in, in this conversation of three people, uh, three persons, I'm the expert, right? And another person is going to play the role of philosopher, and it's going to question me and and say like, oh, but you didn't think of this, and the other is going to be like the like the the common like person right that doesn't know the, the the topic we're asking about so i think that that's the way that can you can kind of bridge the gap because it's it's not like, like the expert role is more fixed right because you cannot it's not as fluid but i think the like a common person can act more philosopher like and i think that could help like with the unknown like with the um anonymity and the well like the you know like uh, so people don't view it as like philosophers as enemies or something or, or adversarial and I think um, and just like if you invite like people if into the into the conversation or to, into idea like they I think they respond quite well because something that Javier said is that like he reads philosophy books and like people think like he's an authority right like they, they aspire that authority to him and that and like and I think that there are ways of breaking that um, given authority. Like, for example, you say, like, oh, this book is about philosophy, uh, about, like, I don't know, like, Nietzsche, right? And you, like, explain, like, one of the two topics in, like, 
common words. And so the person is like not intimidated by the book anymore. So he might say like, oh, this person knows about philosophy, but it's not like, oh, like he has this authority over me, right? And I think that works really well. Just using common words in the sense that, like, for example, you can say that dialectic of something, blah, blah, blah. But you can also say like the conversation of something or like the relation. And of course, like words are, are interesting because each one, like has different nuances and subtleties, right? It's not the same, say, dialectic and conversation. But if you're as like speaking with someone that has never read philosophy or has never approached it, like you can speak to them in a way that they will understand the idea and they won't feel like and that you're like an expert or just like big words or specific words. Like for example, in business, I can like throw around like these concepts and, uh, and like these words and stuff, but that's not like, you can say the same thing with like normal everyday words right it may take a couple more of them but you can say the same thing and i think that helps um and i think like most people and, and it's an invitation because i think most people are insecure that's why they delegate their um their thinking to experts because they are insecure right like i don't know like you take the decision and it's going to be your problem if it's going to go wrong right so like people are, are insecure um, so they just delegate. But I think if you invite them, like, no, you, like, what do you think about this? But, like, if you invite them to become, like, this, do this thought process of becoming more philosopher-like, I think that that's, that's a good way of going uh, about it. And also, as you said, Daniel, like, if you need, a, like, a sociopath, like, uh, to ignore, like, social uh, conventions uh, to, to act, I think, like, you can train yourself to feel that social like resistance but still act in the sense that um i, I think the, i think of two stories like in both stories like the the character like defies uh, social expectations but in one story it's because he's like a soci sociopath he doesn't feel anything and the other is because in this particular story he loves someone so much that he's going like he understands perfectly what's the the social situation he reads the room perfectly and still um decides to go completely against it right so i think like um i don't like to to and i don't think it's that difficult well I mean, it's scary, but it's not that difficult for people to go th uh, through that process because, like, you can say, imagine if you say three contr controversial things, like, every week, right? And it could be, like, something, like, controversial, but, like, uh, innocuous enough that it's, like, I hate dogs, right? And I like cats. That's going to be, like, really controversial for a lot of people, right? But you, like, do you get accustomed to, like, stating something that you, that you believe in, but, and experiencing like a little bit of backlash of people right so if you just like some uh, really simple exercise like three times a week you say something controversial i think you can build that tolerance so that, like so you don't go with the flow and you and, and delegate right so i think in that sense i mean it's scary right but it's not uh it's not even that difficult in the sense or complicated so i think that um that would um uh, that would work and also like when when you have like these systems right I think it's it's difficult because you almost always have to have like someone looking from the outside for the system. Like if the system goes wrong, like who's going to check the system itself, right? But I think that one way I, I've thought about that could possibly mitigate this thing is that you have like a rubber band system. And I would and I mean by this that you have two systems, right? To make it uh, simple, I don't know if it would work with more, but you have two systems, two factions, two, two opposing parties. And then the, um, well, allegedly this is what how democracy works, but it doesn't really uh, function because like, let's say like you give equal power to both um, parties, functions, etc. Like, because by random chance, one is going to get a little, a little bit more, more power by even chance, right? Because they, like, I don't know, someone got sick, like, they're going to have a little bit more power. And it, this and this power, it's going to exacerbate itself. So it's going to go bigger and bigger and bigger until it's not an equal um, footing anymore. So what you need is, like, a rubber band measure. Like, the farther you go against, like, the harder the system pulls. And and the system is designed, like, it's an external thing that the parties don't really control. It's the way it's set up like for example if you like in and something and it's um 
And we see that this in like everyday games, like for example, in soccer and football, if you score the goal, the other team is the one that has like the, the first kick, right? Like the winning team doesn't get more advantages. That Like the more you win, like the more, uh, well, in this case, you, you score a goal, the other team has like a little bit of an advantage to, to catch up, right? Um, so imagine that like repeated, like the more, for example, the more goals you have, maybe um, like you don't get like, if there's like, if you throw the ball outside the, like the, the cancha, like, I don't know, well, like when you, it, the ball goes out of bounds, right? So like, even like if the other team is the one that plays it out of bounds, like normally the, the other team is the one that gets the, to, to get the, the first kick, right? But if like, maybe you're winning like five to zero, like the other team always get the first kick. For example, right? So, like, if you design the game for it to be like a rubber band, like the harder you win, like the tighter it wants to bring you back. I think that's uh, a nice way to design the system in a way that not the experts, like the the further the experts go trying to push power, like the more the system tries to pull them back, or like the more common people try to do this, like like okay, no, like relax, like come back. And I think that's a, a nice way to, to develop it because if not, the power just accumulates in on one side until it's like a completely uh, imbalance and it everything uh, explodes and it's bad, right? So, um, so yeah, that those were kind of uh, thoughts and it's been a lovely conversation. So far. Well, it's outstanding. I've had to descend, Clayton, Javier, Jockin, and Wynn. I think, you know, for me, what you were saying, um, basically, like, on the idea of facing the emotion so you can actually, like, make the the um, non-rational choice in the game theory dynamics to avoid the Nash equilibrium, you either need to be a sociopath who have gone through the training to be able to feel the difficulty but still do it. And the argument of belonging again is this becomes more and more difficult the greater the scale. And a point that Luber made about now if the expert makes a mistake, they're killed. That becomes more so the case the greater the scale. The greater the scale, the bigger the system, the more the expert class can't make, make mistake without undermining their authority which then creates a, a big problem because the public would then have to be like what in a sense wise enough to know on average, not just random individuals on average, that experts will make mistakes, but that doesn't mean they're not an expert. All of this would suggest to your point, Emilio, that for me, basically the education system needs to be in the business of making the average um, neurodiverse so that we don't fall into Nash equilibrium. There's always this argument that democracy is doomed if people aren't educated. The problem is we've established education merely in terms of technical knowledge. The argument I would like to make is that education needs to be far more in the business of menti divergent or neurodivergent, which again, by that, what I mean is the ability, that's not merely a matter of intelligence, but the ability to think non-rationally when so fitting, to use Mr. Jockin's language, so that you avoid Nash equilibria, because if the education system does not teach that, then the system on average will incentivize the sociopath in order to become more of the expert. Like that's how it's just going to be in terms of probability. Now, what that means though, is not that school's teaching a necessarily a particular subject, but that it's going to be a matter of the medium structure following a Neil Postman, Walter Ong and different things about how to engage with information in a manner that is going to be menti divergent. What we mean by that, we can associate with Nietzsche's childhood, the absolute knower. Mr. Wynn had a lovely comment on that's exactly what would have to be something that is more scaled on average so that people can actually avoid these sort of Nash equilibria situations. But that is also going to require a story or theme of which is then plausible to people that that is in fact what they should be doing with their education. Uh, to be thinking in those abilities to actually not let the expert class come too far, but also not let the public go too much into the expert. And it all becomes this very difficult dialectical um, tension. But it has something to do with the ability to actually be someone who can feel the pain, feel the emotion, and still maintain like Ulysses through the sirens, right? But that is something that right now the system does not necessarily teach on average. And as a result, it tends to incentivize. That's why you have such a high number of CEOs that like are, are sociopaths, basically, or don't feel things, or that's what your leaders have to go. But that's just going to be the natural incentive structure that falls. A lot was said, but let me pass it to Sam, Clayton, Javier, Jockin, and then win. Sam, please. I just wanted to point out that I think, um, and you seem to be bringing it up again and again, um, Daniel, that like through trying to articulate what experts are doing and what philosophers are doing and what leaders are doing and juxtaposing their activities against one another, I feel like we're kind of defining a negative. Um, uh, um, I want to say 
like I don't want to say like a class, but like a mode of of being in society that you know we've called like the layman or the masses. Or you keep up bringing up the Nash equilibrium. Like what is that discooperation, right? And um, I kind of think like Thomas, when you were talking about your experience with the jury duty, I felt like oh yeah, this is really pivotal. Like this is because like there's this discooperation here, but it's and, and there's this uh, this complacency that's occurring, like, let's just do what the prosecutor told us, like, let's just accept that. But like, it's almost like, um, like, um, I want to say that we've forgotten in our discussions, we've forgotten an element of, of authority and, and duty, because really what's occurring here when you have experts saying X, why is it saying this is true and when you have leaders saying we must do this and you have philosophers saying we don't know this is all of these things like intersect in order to ask something of us and i think the reason we want maybe a dumb king i, I know that's not what you were saying Chudan, but but like in in this identification with with the common sense king there's this sort of um vibe reassurance which is he won't ask too much of me, you know? Th we want that kind of leader. There is a mode of being, you know, which lives in the Nash equilibrium that, that doesn't want to do the crazy thing, doesn't want to give too much, right? Ask not what your um, country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. No, don't ask me what I can do for my country. What can you do for me? Like, that's what people, I mean, a lot of time, that's what they want. Um, and that's, it's sort of a mode. And, you know, like, not to judge anybody like you know like everybody goes through different phases of their life but um i think yeah i do think this is a missing element in our conversation um and i think it speaks a lot to the ways that language and um symbols are a part of our immune system you know because um and a part of our bodies because it's like uh we we've talked on this conversation about experts who impose their expertise or philosophers who impose their thinking but how do you impose well there's one way to impose and that's the tried and true method which is might you know like um at the end of the day the nation has a policing force has an army right like that's how they impose um but there is another way of of imposing you know your philosophy and and that's because language is a part of our bodies and you can move a person through higher values, like towards action, um, to do some remarkable things, just on on the basis of of belief and and faith and and hope. And I think that's really hopeful and 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 not to be discounted and not to be um, considered as just like, uh, it, like that's an active and chaotic agent in this system and often does great, great things. Um, and it made me think of, uh, uh, it made me think of some, some writers who I've kind of had on the back burner at the moment. Um, I feel like there's this sort of like, I'm building a sort of bridge between um, some texts. I'm reading Moynihan's uh, Spinal Catastrophism. I was listening to a podcast on um, Alamaru's uh, selective breeding, and then I'm also an avid Slaughter Dyke reader, and I feel like there's a sort of progression through the three authors where you get Moynihan saying, like, yeah, in human phylogeny, we had to do this weird thing where we decided to stand upright, and that's really unique. And what did it afford us? Well, um, it afforded us a lot of difficulty. It afforded us back pain, but it and it afforded us neuroses. But it also gave us this like capacity to do to step out on the wire to do the crazy thing, um, and just you know, Moynihan speaking biologically, like in, in the literal ph phylogeny of, of humans, human being. And then you get Coast, and I, I realize that's a dangerous uh, piece to have on my reading list, but um, quite uh, yeah. Um, but he's saying there's this move in societies between societies which operate purely on custom, and then there's the birth of philosophy. And, you know, I, I feel like this sociopathy that you keep bringing up, Daniel, it's like a shadow of what you're trying to say, because it's not really sociopathy, right? Like, it's, there's like, it's like the, the rebel, the renegade, there's something, you know, like, you could put a little 
million terms and dance around it, but but I think like when Costin talks about or Alamaro, sorry, Costin Alamaro, when he talks about um uh this this society which realizes nature, this class of people which realizes nature, realizes they can cultivate themselves um with with practices and and with their with with their breeding, but I don't know if that's a great thing to bring up but like they they want to dominate other people and that's terribly immoral but but they realize that they can do it and so like um and a lot of the ways that they do it is by just denying custom by saying it's mere custom like we don't we don't need to be subject to to the fears of gods um and then you could kind of move th through history you know if that's at, at the sort of axial age you come to slaughter dyke in his discussion in his book you must change your life of just the practicing being human as the practicing being and this sort of like loops back into the moynihan thesis which is just like it seems like in the to try and flesh out what's around our current conversation it seems like oh, okay we are a, we are a being which is engaged in ontolo Frege's ontological design, a process where we create ourselves. And um, as a result of that, in a, in a, on a very deep time scale, we've been changing ourselves to metaphorically and literally stand up. When you stand up, you require vestibular systems. You know, metaphorically, I'm using this as a metaphor, at, even though it's literal. Um, you might fall down in the way that having four points of contact with the earth is much more stable. We've done something where we require training and we require discipline to maintain just a baseline level of, of like that. That's why we teach. That's why we educate, you know, like that's why we teach kids to read. Like it, it takes a lot of work to like get up to a level where you can just do things on a regular basis. Like kids need to learn to read. They need to learn to, um, they need to in soak up all of our, our all of our customs, but we try and do this extra step, which is to like say, okay, here's the customs, here's the way we do things, here's the skills you need, here's the reading, here's the math. These things will help you understand the interactions that are going on around you. But like, there's this extra step, and maybe that's psychopathy, but maybe it's philosophy. Um, you know, and I, I think. And you know, all these three thinkers that I'm bringing up would say it's philosophy. Um, that and, and and you brought this up earlier, Thomas. It dislodges, right? Like it dislodges you out of out of the matrix of those customs and gives you some freedom to to act, you know, and to do the crazy thing when when the crazy things need doing. Um, to say, hey, to remember our self authority and our duties when we're in. We're, we're in jury duty, you know, to say, no, we have an we have a responsibility to justice, not just to like each other, not just to like co polite interactions between each other. Like there's something higher at stake. Um, and yeah, maybe that's a sociopath, but I, I really don't think it is. Um, and 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 against that, I think the, the foil to that renegade is um something Chiten, you've been talking a lot about which is like i don't know the masses the public but but you brought up the very important point Chiten, that like it, it is really important because um there is like a drive to return like moynihan talks about this a lot like the the there's a drive in in all species to return to like a fetal state and we are the n most neotenous species like there's a like um to return to the womb, there's like a comfort in that existence that standing up is just like, it's so exposed, it's so unbalanced. Um, I, th I think sometimes, you know, in, in, I think sometimes like we can succumb to that where we, where we say, no, what, what can my nation do for me? Like what can, it, it's, it's kind of like a, met a metaphorical falling down. You know, I'm not willing to like do the teeter tottery vestibular um expensive dance of of, of standing I, um i mean every night we fall down every night we sleep we live horizontally um but you don't want like 
whatever that impulse is, and I don't know how to name it, you don't want that to overpower um, the, the thing that, that's keeping us up. <laughs> That's outstanding comments. I love the metaphor of standing up. That is extremely useful. And and no, by sociopath, like I think the way, like I don't mean by that psychopath, like I think it's absolutely tied to the idea that we're not bound by customs. You are not bound by the givens. You're able to just move. You are indifferent to the social order. And the issue is that what ends up happening is one of the reasons why I think as a system becomes more powerful in scales, it tends to incentivize people who do not actually feel as much or as embedded in the social order is because power and custom actually exist in a kind of tension. Like custom is a way of operating and organically having people operate without force so much. But then, of course, when the custom fails or the custom goes in the direction we don't like, say it leads to slavery or Nazism or different things, then power comes in to correct it, but that very active power then coming in to correct it threatens the reestablishment of the custom, because if it could lead to a banality of evil, or if it could lead to these problems, then people don't trust it, but then that means all you have is power, which then means what do you do if that becomes too large? So, no, I really like how you, I, I, I very much appreciate how you describe that in terms of the standing up, that is magnificent, and I think the loss of custom, and the issue becomes though, like, you know, again, there's a lot of push today about decentralization, Web 3.0, kind of, well, well, yes, in history, people talk about that, and states' rights, and that tends to work great until people then, in their custom, legitimize something like slavery, or legitimize something terrible, and then you need a big power to come in and stop that, but then if it comes in, doesn't that, how do you reestablish the decentralization or the custom when, without that sort of power structure there, that could always um, overtake it, Right. Well, you would have to have a kind of mediation or a way where people don't in their custom do that. But then very often people fall into these great um, moral atrocities, not because they necessarily think it's evil, but because it gets integrated into their everyday life. They being banality of evil, right? And so then could you have the philosopher there to go, hey, you've accepted a presupposition that actually is a threat of human dignity. Oh, I didn't even know. It's like philosophy seems to have something to do with the problem of the banality of evil, but philosophy all has something to do with keeping authority, like Mr. Wynn has been saying, like making authority realize that it's groundless and yet still authority. This is the weird thing that seems to be, I'll talk about like the intersuppositional. All of this is very strange. I think also I the point that is, and I'll give it to Clayton, Javier, Mr. Jockin, and then Thomas Wynn. Um, I think also part of the issue though, and I think you brought this up very well, Sam, there's kind of a problem in talking about classes. And it's almost mm -hmm. like, it's almost like the understanding to reason in Hegel where you have to talk about categories because then when they're rightly ordered, they vanish. It's like if philosophy is in the system, then philosophy is a vanishing mediator that then has it all danced together and it's not these clean cuts between categories. But then when it's missing, you have to talk about it as a category because it has to be intelligible, but you're talking about it as a category to then when it's in place, deconstruct it. This is really freaking bizarre. Um, and it's like, I think I, the only way I can think about it is in terms of artistic metaphors, because you work really hard of saying, I'm a dancer, so I'm going to work really, really hard to be a good dancer. But then you do that to get on the dancing field that people, so that then people are, they don't see you. They see the dance. There's something in ballroom dancing, I think, where they talk about like the rose and the dance. That was in an anime too. It was really good. Uh, where it vanishes, it becomes that kind of self-forgettable flow. Like, you take a stand in a category that you're dedicated to, as Kassir was saying, to enter a space of vanishing. And that's a vanishing mediator. But then the very process of getting to that place runs the risk of reifying a category that then blocks that occurrence. And so does a philosopher exist to keep all these juggling acts alive? Of which, if they're doing well, you don't think of them as a philosopher, but as a human being and the category of philosophy vanishes. Lots of fun for all the girls and boys. Let me give it to Clayton here. Clayton, it is good to see you on this fine day. It's, uh, it's an intense conversation. Um, <laughs> and quite interesting. And a few thoughts here. Um, it seems to me that the philosopher is also an expert because, <laughs> well, if you think about expertise as uh, a compounded uh, a compounded relation or practice that's been going on, you know, by someone, then 
if we take it from that perspective, it actually makes everyone an expert. And and that's where you'd say authorship comes from. Like you can't you cannot author. You cannot author without some kind of honing of a certain amount of experience, like a lived experience that you have gone out there and gathered. And then that then gives you that optimal grip that allows you to be an author. And if you can be an author, then you can have that authority. And then if you have the authority, then you can challenge other authorities. And so, which comes to the standing up, right? Like <laughs> that, that authorship is going to drive you to have to stand up, right? And stand for that, for that expertise or that, that experience that you have like really compounded over, you know, a long time. So to me, it all, it's all coming down to, I think we, we work with that assumption of uh, our interiors are transparent, but they're not. <laughs> they're only transparent to us. But somehow we believe they're transparent to everyone. It's like, if I can see my interior and, and I understand my expertise, the expertise of being this unique instance of being, uh, therefore, everyone should be able to see that and everyone should be able to relate appropriately to it and respect the authorship it's putting forth. Um, but it's not that transparent. It is opaque. And so now we we have to use tools like language and gestures and all those things to start to take this world and connect it with all the other instances of being that are around us so we can you know be that collaborative organism that you know impresses itself upon this environment that we are in and you know push it further uh, but all that to say that i think we need to play play respect with each other <laughs> right and be and have that kindness i think if we, if we come at it from that perspective and sort of like stop not really stop like try to get disentangled from the the pointed game of just trying to be at the point <laughs> uh maybe it's possible to increase our our collaboration, which then allows for everyone to bring forth that authority, that expertise that they are compounding in all their unique capacities. And, you know, kind of like what is happening here, the net, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's my, my short contribution to that. So I, I, think, I think the net is a good example of where we should be going. More nets, please. Bam, I agree. I completely agree. And yes, the love is renegade. I'm going to give it to Javier Thomas and Thomas Wayne. I mean, basically, like to me, what you just said on the collaboration, I think I think you can make a historic claim basis that the spreading of rhetoric in the Dutch Empire following Dietrich Mikhailsky leads to the creation of wealth. Following Jonathan Rauch, you can see that freedom of speech leads to knowledge acquisition. And the more you can create a collaboration of people that can handle a more and more diverse conversation, the more and more that tends to increase the quality of life at scale because you replace the problem of scale with the issue of spread. Um, and so it has something to do with speech. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm obviously biased towards your comments on the net, but I agree. And there's some, this is what's kind of weird. It's almost like philosophy. The component of philosophy is to make everything vanish. Like philosophy comes in and makes all the categories vanish in the dance or the speech, right? It comes in and has the expert and the public relate in such a manner that there is expertise, but the category vanishes in the interaction. And likewise, there's a public that has to observe the authority, but the authority is then more shown. And it's almost like, I love what, like, on the idea of language as body that Sam was getting at that makes me also think about Kimsky and then Joel's work. It's almost like the philosopher is there to make sure the language is always embodied, that it's always in the body. It is always bodied, that it is never abstract, but it's always body. And maybe that's when speech is freed. So philosophy is about free speech, free speech, 
from abstract categorization, free it in the body. You, I know you talk about the language of experience, and that does seem to be actually, again, the conditions following a McClowski and other historians that would show that actually the quality of life of the average person on planet Earth goes up. Uh, now that claim has to be expanded, but actually here's the kind of funny thing. I would actually argue that this question of speech that I keep pointing at, because um, I think it's tied to all of this and the interrelation and the intersupposition and gets into storytelling, beauty and all these different things actually is to address also the socioeconomic problems in the same swoop, which would be a kind of radical claim. But that, that's the kind of radical claim I'd like to make. But uh, Mr. Rivera, Mr. Jock and Mr. Wynn, Mr. Rivera. Oh, man, so much. Um, just <laughs> just a quickly comment on Sam Williams' uh, idea of like sitting upright. Uh, I'm reminded of when I was reading ML Sharon and he had such a hot take on human beings um, upstanding. <laughs> he was like, this is when we got cocky. He said, this is when we assumed authority because we could stand. <laughs> like, he was like, this is when, um, you know, and I, and I always thought that was a very interesting um, take from Emil Sharon, the same way he would always give gripe about the philo the philosopher <laughs> the philosopher's notion of being. He would always be like, why are you calling it being? Why don't you just say God? That's way more interesting. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, I'm sidetracking. Um, I, I do think there is something here. Um, I think we're all been elucidating through our various conversations about the way we've been describing the philosopher um, and then this idea of a provisional moving on to like storyteller like Andrew Luber is talking about. Um, you can see immediately that to me, philosopher as a signifier is virtually empty um which then we lead to another signifier when uh chitan goes what is thinking basically now we're thinking like what is thinking and and someone say oh well we're thinking about what is thinking right but that would already you know it, you, we could go into those groundless tautologies maybe or maybe we say it's not a tautology right that thinking would be something different i think even heidegger says like something like thinking is thinking um I think that's what he, he said, something like that. Um, but I think that the main point is that we come across a kind of just like we can only answer what we perceive as the preconceptions of this time. Meaning that people do perceive philosophers as a, as a category of, of thought. Expert Experts are perceived as a class of, of people who are experts in specializations of certain categories. Um, we have to already build up from the presuppositions or, or or play with the presuppositions that they're already holding and and reveal something in in, in those things um this is why i like the, the story about what thomas jockin did in the the jury duty because basically that's exactly what i would say philosophy is in the act of communication it's why are we assuming that this is the case and you don't have to claim to be anything. It's a simple pointing to. Why are we talking about you know, the way that we are? Um, the other thing is, I've been reading this book um, called Sexuality Beyond Consent. Um, she's also psychoanalysis, um, A.G. Sacabatello, I think. Um, she came up with this wonderful principle in my mind. She calls it limit consent. Limit consent is this idea that actually... Um, affirmative consent is not enough. Why? Because it's only in relation to the other person. Limit consent is in relation to yourself, meaning that there is something that you find within yourself, which is an other. And she calls this other a kind of opacity, a kind of thickness that you, 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 you resist against. And what's interesting about this opacity is that the person in the sexual act wanted to take back the consent. Okay? And she's really challenging this thin line between um, what we would perceive as very clear, translucent, affirmative consent. The real question is, why would somebody take back the consent? And I think this we can broaden this concept into some, something like, why would somebody take back the expertise? Right? Why would somebody refuse the expertise? Because that would involve the sort of uh, uh, translucent consent, okay? But the but the limit consent that uh, she's talking about is that what I would call fundamentally con contradiction is the idea 
that actually there's a resistance within the ego itself. That's how I interpret her idea of limit consent. That what you perceive as contradiction is actually the resistance of the ego. And what the ego resists is not, it's, it perceives itself as a dissolution, but actually it's its own ego expanding moment. Right? <laughs> um, so what I, what I find interesting about um, this idea of limit consent in, in relation to expertise and, and the trouble is that once expertise fails, because I do think we are in an age of suspicion of authority, but then ironically also we lean back on this other foot where we say authority is all that we have. <laughs> you know, like there is like this, there's this really hard paradox that people perceive themselves to be in, which is, you know, like I said, that suspicion of authority and then yet at the same time, I have no choice but to do uh, lean on authority. Derrida himself talked about this. When you're being responsible, what does it mean to be responsible? The moment you try to be responsible, you end up leaning on a body of knowledge. And that for Derrida is ultimately, ultimately irresponsible. <laughs> because you are already leaning, you're deferring the responsibility to a body of knowledge. Okay. But he's also talking about how like this is virtually kind of unescapable um, a little bit because there's something undecidable happening here. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think I want to focus on why would people resist um, not experts, but why would people resist um, not depending on one? Why, why would people resist not depending on one? Or, or why, why would people resist, um, how, many, how many I'm phrasing it correctly? <laughs> like, basically, why would they want to depend on one and what's that resistance? Because it's not perceived as a resistance to depend on one. And I think limit consent is a way of saying that actually, virtually, we are afraid of unknown ideas we we want to defer and i think what hasn't been talked about is that expertise originally was a very pragmatic thing nobody had time and expertise was the most pragmatic thing right defer to the doctor defer to the shaman and so on they are the ones that had the time to do all this stuff nobody else did that was the pragmatic function of it now the thing that's happening and this is what chitan and andrew luber are getting at is Technology has mediated that function into a bottom up, a bottom up now, meaning that we are not just passive consumers now. We are actually very much collaborative consumers. Um, so, and, and the question is, nobody has been able to really uh, give a proper response to how do we deal with this bottom up issue? Because it's no longer a top down, it's a bottom up. And it's that bottom up that we're missing that people would be, well, I mean, if you think about it, it pragmatically makes sense. If I don't know what to do, I will lean on the expert, right? Like now I, I will just lean on the expert because I understand the vastness of, of this loss. Um, but now there's people like Joe Rogan and stuff that are challenging the, the expertise and that allows the bottom up. But they are not providing, in my opinion, an adequate um, way of dealing with this dilemma, right? Um, and so we're still, in some sense, lost, right? We're still playing this dichotomy of don't listen to Joe Rogan, you're not an expert. And then there's Joe Rogan's idea of like, this is just controversy, this is just um, an inside play on the government and, and, and so on. And we still don't know what to do <laughs> and and people are lost with that um so i think the bottom up feature is is fundamentally the new paradigm of, of what's causing a lot of issues the fact that we can communicate with each other gro globally uh the fact that there's all these other notions of authority influencers and so on um but we can't quite think through the information that is being given it's either the CDC is your authority or Joe Rogan is. I mean, you, you see what you see what the problem is. We we're not thinking through authority. 
And I, and I think perhaps that's what it is, is this idea of thinking through authority, which is a new problem because typically pragmatically that's what functioned <laughs> that's what was the pragmatic function but now I, I i think we're on a on a new level of of pragmatism that i don't think works the pragmatism that we're still functioning is the same one that we've always been functioning with um this is why i pro proposed to jitan the idea of negative pragmatics because <laughs> the immediacy is gone like jitan had pointed out to me the immediacy is gone can you yeah. explain negative pragmatics then uh, <laughs> yeah, so negative pragmatics is is basically the question of what do we do with lack? That's that's it. That's the pragmatic question. It, it's negative pragmatics is what do we do with lack that is always going to be there? And you could say, actually, Thomas, you're very much in the line of what I would call negative pragmatics. This letting be um, showing itself. <laughs> why you provoked me enough to speak up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's it for me. That's magnificent. I'll give it to Jack. And then Mr. Wynn, if you'd like to speak, please. And um, so there's a bunch of things here. It's very good. I think it's very important. You know, I keep bringing up the problem of scale because the problem of expertise, like you said, expertise arises as a problem and then a technological problem, the bigger the scale. Because expertise becomes more difficult to check and balance. If the doctor in town is the expert, but you know him and he knows you, it's more it's more easy from your particularity to have at least a feeling of check and balance and skin in the game. In the sense of he comes over for dinner on Friday night. So if he screws up, you know, that's going to be bad. And you're probably the blacksmith that takes care of him stuff. So there's more of a sense of we're all experts. But we're not just cattle, in a sense, to the experts, or we're not just digits, right? The more you scale, the more the problem of the, of the expert arises, which then, of course, that's why a lot of people are like, so let's just isolate Duganism, all this other stuff, because that will deal with the problem. But then the geopolitical consequences, et cetera, so forth. So I think that's very astute. I mean, in a way, too, what you're saying about annihilating pragmatism is this weird thing where it's like you need philosophy – it's almost like we, I was talking with Mr. Jockin about this. You need philosophy to really, really, really get at what a particular thing is. But when you really get at that particular thing, then it, your expertise that you gain only applies to that thing. And so you annihilate its ability to reach beyond it. So there's this, that seems to be how authority is supposed to work philosophically. You're working to become authoritative at something that then you work incredibly hard to be only to use it for that thing and nothing else. And that's really horrible. But that seems to be the truth. And like, it's so difficult because in the same way, if we think about it as love, like Jock and I were talking, is like, you have to love a particular person, like not woman, but Michelle. And you work, and that love, as it becomes deeper, becomes unable to move it to someone else. You can't take a love of Michelle and apply it to Jane. That's not how it works. There's an expertise that comes from the work that a testament to the expertise is the fact it can only be applied to that particular person. So it has annihilation in the unleashing of the beauty. And that's where I think a bit about the clearing, the annihilate. The more you become, you're using your expertise that's not merely a technical knowledge, but a full human knowledge, fictuated in a Leibniz situational, going in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And in that expertise, you are setting yourself up to be unable to generalize it. But it is incredibly authoritative in that particular situation. And this seems to be getting at the proper role of authority that's then tied to annihilation, that's then tied to the confirmation of the authority is the beauty, is the Beatrice that comes forth, is the unfurling, is the theme, but it's also humbling. And you see that, you could say in a way, if we look at Heidegger's kind of technological essence, and I'll give to Mr. Jockin here, is that's where we want authority to generalize. We want to believe if we work really, really hard at something and gain authority, then authority... The confirmation of authority it is its spreadability, is its generalizability. That means you have authority because what you know can be generalized. But what we're saying here is it's the exact opposite. The more generalizable it is, that doesn't mean it can't have technical value because there's general technical, but the more and more it actually runs the risk of being particularly useless. Yeah, we did talk about that in the talk. It was great. Uh, so, you know, and that actually, I bring up, I want to bring up Leibniz with that as well. Um, so the issue is, well, because you have to stay in a one place committed relationship for the possibility of the real to break through. 
If you can always move, then you can always avoid the real. And the real, the possibility of the real is the condition of the possibility of the beautiful and the theme of that absolute choice. And so that's really the issue is we have to understand that the kind of geek human authority comes from precisely the fact that you are bound to a particularity, which runs counter to the logic of scale that defines the entire socioeconomic political order. The logic of scale is that power and authority comes from size. But what we are saying is the philosopher actually recognizes that authority comes from particularity because that is the revelation of the definite object, as Jockin and I talks about, which is the beautiful that locks you into that common life in that absolute choice, that that is what the human is really supposed to be an expert in and the full humanness comes out. And in that, you can, I think, find a way to think together authority, particularity, com common life, annihilation, and things like that. But then, of course, the problem with scale or the problem with spread would be, be increasing the probability that the average person on the planet is able to do everything I just described. And that would be what would then help you avoid the Nash equilibria on global scales on different problems and actually would increase the uh, prevalence of uh, the spread of rhetoric, as Mikowski says, that would be wealth creation versus the great stagnation of a Tyler Cohen. Uh, but I will stop there and give it to Mr. Jockin. Mr. Jockin. You know, it's a, it's a good net session when I have, let's see, I got five pages of notes <laughs> from the conversation. You know, that's a good sign, guys. Real good, real good work, eh? Um, Two parts. Part one. I'm surprised. I mean, Tyler threw it. I mean, is Tyler here right now? Where is Tyler? Is he still here? Okay. Tyler in the chat stole my thunder, where he basically was like the sociopath, air quote, sociopath versus the suspension of uh the ethical i'm like why did no one say this this is like the first thing coming screaming at me of no that's exactly because like um oh good luber's still here so like that's the point so like the i brought it up oh sorry javier <laughs> i got some hooked up with you javier with the F, with the limit F, the limit consent i got things to talk about that's really good so I, my mind went to that first my bad okay um luber your point about like violating social norms to be effective and critique like, I see that as an example of suspension of the ethical. Like, in the sense, like, there's a higher good, there's a principle that has to be acted on. You know, one has a duty to. And, um, uh, oh, dang, uh, Jacob already left, but he made a, he has some critique with me, or not, not critique, but, like, he has some questions about this title question of declaring oneself a philosopher or artist or whatever. Um, and then I wanted to bring it up, it was, that there's, you know, a really important distinction of the interior versus the exterior nature of the title. No? In the sense that when a title is just, it's labeled by, I do this for money, that is why I'm a philosopher, that is why I'm a writer. And by the way, I know I'm an artist. Like, I have seen that argue when people have, like, um, imposter syndrome, that am I really an artist? Am I really this? The one of the rhetorical methods to address it is to say, well, are you being paid to do it? Well, yeah. Well, then you are. I mean, I... I feel like people like some people buy that, but other people I I get is I feel like everyone in this room would agree that's a there's a there's a tension in that argument. Because then that's an example of an exterior title definition. It is no different than just the quite frankly, all it's saying is then there's sort of social agreement that someone is paying you money to give and thus you're given the title because you're paid money. This is like um I'm an adult who has sex. Because I'm a pro like it's like a weird. It doesn't make any sense. He tried to translate that because then what would the title be? Be a prostitute. Someone's getting paid to have sex. It's weird. It doesn't express the essence of what it means to be a man, like to have sexual relationships. Very bizarre. Anyways, even just even that example just draws that out. Versus the interiority of devotion, and I add that word devotion really important because that's in Phaedrus, uh, and the discussion of by proper discourse and training uh, to give the soul its the desired belief in virtue. So training, the Greek for that is devotion. Uh, it can be translated as training, but it also means devotion to pursuits. I think there's something very important. It's about an interior um, devotional love. Because that whole point, that whole desired belief from Phaedrus is related to what gets translated as temperance. But in the argument it's made there, it's about uh, the desire for the best. That's what temperance is, which is so fun. I always love that, that Phaedrus. Um, but all this is to draw out is like, no, sometimes we have to, to honor a principle. We got to strike through the kind of cultural custom norm of the ethical. I think that's what that's kind of what I draw out. So, you know, sometimes you got to be a dick for the greater good, like for the thing that's the more like touching on the principle, like you violating, you not doing that being a dick move is 
violating the principle. Because I guess that's a little big point too, an education, for example. Like there's a lot of times when people like do not want to give the proper critique to a student because it's just easier not to. You can just say, oh, it's good. Give some general comments, move on with your life. But you know, you're, you, you may be doing a service for yourself short term, but for that student's long term success, you're not doing them a favor. Because especially if your account is actually legitimate, like you're not just doing a biased presumption of perception of the work, but you're looking at the how is this actually going to operate in the marketplace or in the world or in other in, other, in reality. Um, you not giving your professional account is a disservice to that student. It is. Um, even if it's so, even though in terms of all the incentives of your institutional structure, that's the other thing too. Also, I was thinking about my title as a lecturer has nothing to do with like the fact that I'm being paid. If I look at what my functions are by my contract and what I'm paid, it's to register grades in a textbook, in, a, in an online platform, and to provide class modules. That is not what an instructor or a lecturer is supposed to do. It's the other side. It's the devotional dimension of the love of the knowledge and teaching the students and da, 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 all this good stuff. And by the way, I know there's been comments on like this nature of expert. I think there's actually a big presupposition. And that's another thing too, by the way, I want to draw out is that like the jury duty, my talk last time about this whole Twitter polemic argument, part of being a good philosopher, and Daniel brought it up, uh, is drawing out those presumptions, right? It's that's like, that is the whole point is to wake up people from their operating presumptions that they're operating on and not even realizing they're operating on. That takes an incredible skill to do that. That takes an incredible training to be able to do that. That requires a certain kind of displacement of the emotional tensions of the circumstance to actually, and then draw out through powers of summarization, uh, articulation and context and modeling to draw out what are these invisible patterns that are operating behind people's discourses with each other. I think that's really a great palling uh, what a, someone trained the philo in the philosophical practices should do is be able to draw that out. Because that's, that's part of what a good, I think, therapist does is draw out people's imaginary models in their head, their fit fucking phantasm, excuse my language, but I just get it. The argument of mental health is on the idea there is an external reality that is true. And that the problem is our mental models are disconnecting what we want to do interfacing with reality. If you don't have that argument, if you don't have that presupposition, then there's no point of therapy. There is none, because then all your delusions are just as valid as anyone else's, any others. Who cares? And then the only moderating property then is just mental distress, which is another which point we just discussed many times. And that's the other thing I'll say is that a body of knowledge is is used to use the instrument of names to articulate reality. That's an, that, like that's its purpose. So, for example, like if this, if if uh, emotional distress, if stress is just simply always negative by using that word stress and, an, and not even any distinction of distress versus, I only learned it recently, there is a word for positive stress, uh, eustress, yeah, edu stress. Like it's, it takes the Greek from good, edu. Um, it's relatively new. It's a basic, it's from positive psychology it's from 1976. Uh, an anthropologist uh, coined the term. But the reason, why, like, why did that require it is because if you don't have the name, you cannot point to the phenomenon and the, and the demarcation of reality because there's a presupposition in the words we use. It's baked in. Another example, um, you know, the study of, of aesthetics, that word has a bias built in because the Greek origins of that is from phenomenon. It's basically, it's, it's experience sensation. That's what the study of beauty is, the study of sensation. I think Daniel, we all. I think anyone from our store, from our discussions, we would say that's probably that is not really like the word really should be one of like filiochilia, like basically this like love of beauty, like that should be the word. The kalon is the is what the beautiful is from the Greek. It's not about sensation, not per se by itself. Um, so that's an example where the because look at that that word that coin is of aesthetic, the study of philosophy, the study of beauty has colored the entire discourse of it. So it's by the act of the name, it's causes like bizarre, like warping of reality because of that. Um, and last note, just with experts, by the way, who use these instruments of names, right? To kind of like map on to kind of demarcate reality. There is a presumption that's built in everything. I want to draw this point of it, presumptions, that the expert has certainty knowledge. I think any expert who's actually legitimate would concede there are always limits to our knowledge, always. Now the illusions, the doctor in the, in the co lab coat, 
the big philosopher on a podium, the artists in their huge studio with a gallery exhibition. There's these impressions of normative authority that they have all the answers and have all the clarifications of all the points. But any expert, when you really speak with them sincerely, they will say, oh, no, there's always limits. Like, there's things we don't know. And even on the, and we have to, and part of the purpose of why we're in the, the practice of our disciplines anyway is because there are things that are lacking still, always. I mean, a great example is in, in Plato, Aristotle. Aristotle coined Anagea. Plato has no mention of the term. They're operating with Dumasus. Dumasus was a known term and existed. And they were doing a lot. And the problem was, was that by the time we got to Plato, especially, we're running to all these contradictions and tensions with only using Dumasus to explain the phenomenon of, of, of reality. It wasn't good enough. It took Aristotle to kind of to coin the term Anagea and put it in a contrary relationship with Dumasus. And it's really interesting that Aristotle doesn't even define Anagea, only provides an analogical uh, reference of compare of relation to define it. He doesn't even give you a proper definition of species differentia, for example, um, which I find interesting. But then in all the work of philosophy is based on, by the way, to kind of simplify this, it comes down to one mode of interpreting is this actuality and potential. Like that's insane. It's so funny because we treat that so transparent it's like, obviously, that's the case. How could you understand reality without actuality and potential? But that's my point. It's like, it didn't exist as a term. It didn't have the theme, and it didn't have an operation to understand it, let alone the nuances that come from that. Um, so that's an example where, like, the only way there's actually any kind of living power in a discipline is when there's acknowledgement of a limit. That's why I'm, I'm so happy you had to leave, because I caught that note about limit really powerful, what he was talking about. Um, because the... One note about that it was really interesting. Was he? I think Javier was right about this idea of time. Again, the time kind of fast that comes in once again in so many different ways. Um, so it is true that a lot of times when an expert is 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 a suppression, like what their body of knowledge is, is a compression of time into their souls that they can then basically reveal in an instant, what seems like instantaneous moment, but may took it take decades. I mean, everyone hearing, I mean. Daniel is my classic example of that with his and same amount of note taking. His quantity become, became a quality <laughs> uh, by his amount of note taking and like the man, how much output it demonstrated over time. That's a quantity by basically just like this, like distributions of objects, let alone time duration, things like that. Uh, it also points out why time and space are not the same. Daniel, shout out to you. Okay, so to put this all together, I think there's a presuppos the presupposition of experts having certainty. It's probably what all this is circling around, right? Is that basically we get to be, we get to defer and forget because of the certainty operation of the expert. But even though every expert would absolutely admit there are limits to their knowledge by default, that their body knowledge is a limit, they use names to opt to kind of operate on reality, to kind of demarcate it, to come to better understanding. But there's always lacking. Thus, Javier's kind of negative, uh, apparently, that ne the negative terminology, the negative mode of operation. Um, Okay, that's all I got. Great call for everyone. No, that's magnificent. I'll pass it to Thomas Wynn. Um, I love what you were saying on the potential, and thank you for your kind notes. I think, again, the problem is if we're biasing from a space-time, we think actuality and potential, and then we can't understand beauty. Whereas if it's time-space, beauty is not so much a potential, but an unfolding of a certain that is possible in a certain conditioning. So we don't have categories of conditioning. And, you know, again, if we think about time, space, compression of time to be able to put it forth, you meet a certain condition to be capable of that. And you meet a certain condition so that your experience of the world can unfold in a beautiful sense. The funny thing is a lot of what the it's completely counter to what we think, because a lot of how we meet the conditioning is through something more like nihilating, the more like consenting to a limit. And it makes me think of Mr. Ebert's work, like a lot of philosophy seems to be about locating or conditioning the limit so that it becomes limitless like the limit unfolds into the limitlessness right this is where everything gets so weird which makes sense because the more you limit yourself to michelle a particular person the more you find a definite object a definitive object that is limitless the limit creates a clearing from nihilating that then puts forth beauty in the unfolding and philosophy seems to be an awareness of that and what's weird is that philosophy seems to know that presuppositions are often a risk to you locating or conditioning limit in a limitless way. That's the problem, is that presuppositions almost are kind of a counterfeit limit. They come forth as if this is the limiting principle because it's true. No, it's an assumption. 
is like a counterfeit limit. And often, now, I, I, you know, there's a way in which you can't escape presupposition, but there's something about the presupposition. Let's put it this way, like from our talk, Mr. Jockin, presuppositions tend to be located in their use in the realm of definitions. But as you move to the definitive, then you're talking about a limit that then in the partiality of that object is the unfolding of beauty. So presupp the problem is we have presuppositions move. Like, how do you be presuppositional about Michelle? What does that even mean? That would be like assuming things or expectations or all the stuff you're not supposed to do in a relationship, right? So there's something about where presupposition is what the philosophers like you, you it cannot come, it cannot come here because this is the definitive realm. Keep your presuppositions in the general as maybe they're useful maps, maybe, but they're not the territory and the territory starts here. So keep those presuppositions out. And so you limit the presupposition so that the limitlessness of the definite definitive can come forth. You limit the presupposition and now you have the limitless limit. The limitless, the, li the limitation of which is the unfolding of the particularity. All of which is what we should expect if reality is time space versus space time. And which comes from our conversation. But let me give it to Mr. Wen, and then if anyone has final things, please. Mr. Wen, thank you for being here, sir. It's good to see you. It's good to be, it's good to be very silent during this conversation which is a sign of how nice it is because I'm just kind of enjoying the notes. Thanks, Thomas. Like five pages, I think I have six. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in obviously the most beautiful way. Um, that's the problem. How do I begin this conversation from the end? Um, I, I want to start like with Daniel, your comment, like the, the love for, these, you can say like these specific regions of like technical thinking, which have their truths, they have their rationality, they have their logos. They have their way of implementing reality as we know it. I think philosophy is there to, like, I think this is like Thomas, your comment before, because obviously I'm going from your conversation, like what you've said before, like, philosophy is there to kind of correspond with like the predominant logic of each field. It's there to kind of like affirm it in some way. I think the problem is like with a lot of philosophy that I like, it's very negative towards these fields of thinking, which are very, practical or pragmatic like as Javier said like they are pragmatically engaged even if they're negative or positive they always introduce a kind of affirmation of the fact that they do things you know like science does things building a house does something it builds a house but my point is like maybe philosophy is a techne and this goes to your point Thomas like techne has that affirmation of something which affirms the curiosity and the correspondence to the possibility of like actually doing something like philosophy in the greek time was always about the fact that actually thinking can do things thinking is affirmative of phenomena thinking is able to be with or change or manipulate in a good way what is before us like there, because there was no distinction between what's before us and our experience there was pure disclosure there was pure an affirmation of what is, you know, there wasn't that dichotomy of subject and object. There wasn't a dichotomy of being two things in an experience. There was only experience itself. And I, I think like what philosophy teaches us today is kind of like what Heidegger says or Hegel as well. Like there is a return to the experience whereby we can love philosophy because philosophy is that which enables us to be skeptical about those compartments of techniques by saying they're not negative in themselves, they do things. They are in their space affirmative of the ability to build a table, to build a phone, to construct narratives, to use language, to talk about technical things in any instance of any domain of existence. Like thinking is capable in any way, calculative, meditative, in any form thinking can think, like thinking happens. We as human beings are released to experience technical or cal like technical, calculative or spiritual meditative thinking. There's, I think this is Heidegger's point. Like there are different qualities of experience concerning thinking. None in themselves in experience are negative. And this kind of goes to Nietzsche's earlier work with the birth of tragedy. If we prioritize the logos, the rationality, we somehow end up in like technocraticity. Like we end up in a society which prioritizes the technocratic. 
And then you find the meaning crisis. Then you find the crisis of that world of philosophy, which you can love. And this is the Greeks' number one lesson. You can love philosophy because, and this is my note. So I found one note and this is my reference. Like, if you love one person and you think that you're finding that person everything, then you're obviously going to find it lack. And this goes to Javier's comment, like, concerning, like, negative pragmatics. And I like I like to be pragmatic, but I don't like negative pragmatics following Lacan and Zizek because they're too pessimistic about different domains of knowledge. I think what you can love today is philosophy because it shows you, and this is my note, philosophy opens up the open within which each person lives, and that's the universal. Philosophy is that which all it does is it makes you skeptical about that which bridges each form of technique each form of science, each form or domain of it living. And it shows you, be skeptical about this. Don't trust this, but also in like the most affirmative way, because technique is not trying to give you being's truth or being's way to be. Technique is to build a boat and to sail across the Greek islands, like Socrates did, and like in a negative way, but he did, he sailed because he was on a boat. And it's to say that as a human being to think the personal or social domain means to accept limit, but also to be aware that actually what you can love is philosophy. And philosophy begins with that experience of awe or openness, the possibility that you can experience that which is beyond technique. Then this is the question, can technique bring you to philosophy, which today, especially within the postmodern, skeptical, nihilistic condition, teaches you to be overly skeptical overly postmodern overly nihilistic and this is the point of my re and the reason why this is so fresh for me is because my the first half of my research is about postmodernity it's about being very skeptical like overly skeptical concerning every single word that you say it's a pure interpretation but in the end i finish with heidegger who says well if you if you take interpretation seriously you'll find that technique has a limit techne but if you affirm it in the sense that a science about physiology concerning the body has its limits, if you affirm it, you can affirm thinking, which opens you up to that domain of mystery, which Plato himself lived with. He lived with the mystery of the ideas. He never described where the ideas came from. I think in that experience, you, you become more malleable or susceptible to excess. And this is why Zizek's not completely wrong, but he stops too soon because he becomes negative about excess. Heidegger becomes completely optimistic about excess, something outside of what you're thinking, because he understands that what gives you thinking is the openness, is the clearing, is that which is always provoking you to think something other than technique or technology, because the word technology comes from techne. Techno music <laughs> comes from techne. The rigidity of techno music dun, 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 comes from this rhythm of like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, you know. <laughs> but in the rigidity, there's always a gap. And this is what Heidegger in the early years causes like the ontological difference. There's always a gap between one, two, three, four. And that gap is where if you, if, and this is okay, now it's the summary. I always find this point, I always come back to it. In politics, in the communal domain, if we focus on one, two, three, four, we end up in lack and we find a philosophy of lack. If we open ourselves to the difference between one, two, three, four, we find potentially the question of a different way of experience, which is called philosophy, which can show people, and that means anyone, like anyone, and this is where democracy really comes in. That what we call technique in the terms of techno technocracy, like especially like how I experience it today in England with technocracy like Brexit, European Union, like the experts know both sides of the argument and it ends in a completely like deadlock situation because you have two confronting dialogues concerning technique, like like knowledge. Like Brexit's good, Brexit's bad. Yeah, it's good and bad for different reasons. You can't equate one with one. It's one, two, four, five. It's quantity, it's impossible. Philosophy shows you that there's always a question concerning limit, but only in the sense that it directs you to a different quality of being. And I think this is where philosophy then disengages from praxis. So like, 
the first half of my research is is based upon like philosophy becomes praxis. The second half is a different quality of experience that can't even be called practical or unpractical. It's just a way of life, which is about releasement, being open to, being released to, you know, like the open of the open. It's, it's about the experience. And that goes back again, sorry, like to Thomas, like that's your point. Like the Greeks understood this, you know, they understood that there's a kind of openness between idea and practice. There's a kind of like, so when a philosopher, a philosopher in that sense has a role, but they wouldn't call themselves a philosopher. It's just a way of life. That's, I think that's your point. Like, it's not like I, I identify myself. Today, we identify ourselves. But back then, it was like, no, I'm just, I'm just talking about what's exposed to me or disclosed to me. I'm not, I'm not telling you that this then becomes an identity that I have to like sustain because of pragmatic reasons. And that's Nietzsche's criticism of modernity. It became overly obsessed with the symbol that it forgot the kind of like non-duality of the experience of between knowing and doing anyway that's my final comment that hopefully brings some yeah definitivity magnificent I, th I think that is magnificent and this has been a fantastic conversation i appreciate it very much um i think i i i think lack is an effect of a finite framing of an excess i think mr ebert and i talked about it like lack is an effect of finitude and counting excess because the moment you encounter that, then there's something that's not there, but that lack is then actually a testament to the excess. In the same way that the encounter of a definitive particular person means you're lacking all the other persons, but that's a testament to the excess of that particularity, actually, and the fact that then the commitment to that person allows that excess to unfold through time because it is time space. And so I think that's beautifully put. The releasement you're talking about is, that falls in what I would call the non-rational. And basically the argument is without that, that you just described uh, with the releasement and the Heidegger, then society falls into mass equilibria, autonomous rationality, and we suffer um, self-effacement. So basically that, that aligns with what I, I would agree with that. I think also before I forget, like what Mr. Jockin was saying, like on in, with um, Mr. Kashir, and I think it aligns with what you were saying as well, is there are times where it's important to say, I am an artist, to face that fear, and other times it's arrogant. Well, that's very interesting because that means it moves. It's almost like the philosopher is in the business of identifying what is fitting for this time. This is the time where you need to say you're an artist. This is the time when you shouldn't. Well, the phrase, I, I am an artist, from Kashir's example, does not tell you when it is fitting. There's some sort of excess some sort of thing lacking from that statement of language that you have, that is the context that the philosopher is in the business of identifying. But what's interesting about that then is that's kind of the dialectic. It's the movement. We see thought is movement. It's as if philosophy has something to do with locating the point you are in the movement of thought so that you do what is fitting relative to where the thought has moved to given the sociological order, et cetera, so forth. Um, I think also on this, this interesting, before I also forget, there was this, and I'll give it to Mr. Luber here, um, is that Javier was talking about how today, you know, we're customizable um, um, consumers, like we can customize more as consumers and different things like that. What's very interesting is then with Ivan Illich, though, as we are given more technology and power, we increasingly disabled from using that technology outside of a technological essence. So the problem is we are given more power to do more things as we are disabled from being capable of doing more things. And so then the optionality is stuck in a certain Kafka-esque hallway where it is going to be used in service of the technological essence, ergo the singularity Nick Land is laughing sort of thing. So the double structure of that Ivan Illich points at where technology enables you while disabling you at the same time, which then would speak why it's fitting that a releasement is needed because what you are doing is taking that power and then saying, well, I, yeah, I can go. So an example for disablement is that today, because you can go to the grocery store, you don't learn how to hunt. Okay. Why would you? It's irrational. You don't need to hunt if you can go to the grocery store. So as you are given the option to use the grocery store, you will simultaneously disabled in the ability to hunt, but you don't experience it as disablement because you can go to the grocery store. So the disablement is invisible, right? But what that means is your ability to think in terms of the kind of subject who can hunt then becomes irrational to condition yourself to be capable of because you don't engage in the actions and practices so that you can think that way. 
And so this is what happens. So what has to happen today is as technology, for example, enables us, we do not in that enablement unconsciously allow ourselves to be disabled from the things that technology does for us because the bet, like a, the non-rational thing to do would be someone, for example, who learns how to hunt and uses food lion. That sounds crazy, but that would be the non-rational thing that would help you avoid the Nash equilibria. Well, so it goes with technology, basically, to avoid the Nick Land sort of thing that he talks about. We have to use technologies, and while we have it, simultaneously learn skills that the technology makes it seem irrational to gain. And do you know what one of those skills is? Philosophy. Philosophy seems like it has no role whatsoever in society. It's not science. It can't get you a job. What have we been doing for the last three hours? And yet philosophy conditions you as a subject to be enabled in a way of thinking that makes it to when you use the technology, then you are not going to be simply in service of the singularity or the replacement of human beings according to some sad, dark enlightenment. Mr. Luber here. But that seems to be the NAS equal. So let, let's put it this way. The problem of scale is the capacity of spreading the conditions, and good to see you, Chiton, thank you, spreading the conditions where the average person would be the kind of subject who would have access to technology, but not fall into disablement with that technology, which is a non-rational behavior that would fall in line with clearing, releasement, and things like that. Can you do that? If you cannot do that, that's not good. Uh, so, you know, for all of the sociological consequences, rather it be a Dugan, a Nick Land, Neil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, isolationism, different things. So it is spreading the conditions of the possibility of people of having access to global pluralism while simul not simultaneously not being disabled by that access and optionality, which means they continue to be enabled, which means they do something non-rational, which would be mentidivergent or neurodivergent, but not sociopathically so. This is how you're doing the neurodivergent, but not in the, the sense of just being the sociopath who goes against customs and givens or isolates yourself away from technology. This would be the course of a mental divergency that would give you the Simone Vase of the, the neurodivergency to avoid the Nash equilibria, but it would require a people who understand the necessity of non-rationality. Well, that would seem like a role of the philosopher then to start making clear the role of the non-rationality, but they would have to be able to show that versus using force. There's more to be said, but let me give it to Mr. Luber. Mr. Luber. Um, well, uh, my fingers hurt. Um, so, okay. But this is, this is how I'm seeing it. Um, we're all in agreement that there is a certain mode that the Greeks were in that basically there wasn't a subject object divide, essentially. Like we all, we all agree with that. And that like what Javier was saying earlier, we, we need to like understand that we, for, we basically forgot to be like one way and there's this oscillation between the top and the bottom type of situation. Um, right, the magic sauce mode. And basically, if, if this is the case, that means there has to be a, a non-rational science, if you will. To me, it's a science of storytelling, which basically, it, and like when people hear that, like I want to I wanna like debunk a few conceptions of that. So, like, to me, a science of storytelling that shows what constitutes a story, but in terms of what endures all stories. And that doesn't mean that there's seven types of stories, like how they would talk about that in school. That would mean that every, it's, it's really easy to think about for me, at least in terms of like the human being, every lived experience is unique and unfolds in its own unfolding whatever that is how however it is that still constitute as an unfolding so in story terms it would be exposition inciting incident climax resolution and that and that and basically in your life you i mean you're not going to be able to be solely aware of what you're doing in that moment you 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 can't but other people can ascribe it and other people can have a hundred different stories about you because there's so many different pinpoints of where you can say what the beginning, middle, and end is in a certain sense. And like this obviously has re repercussions in terms of like Roe v. Wade type shit, but I don't want to touch that for right now. I just want to get my point across. Um, where 
it's every story must be for me thematic every story must have this science of how the pattern is that pattern but the pattern can literally be any type of pattern if you will um what what that means to me is that if more people were to focus on the possibility of that and try to understand the possibility of that they'll discover different and i feel like people do and i think heidegger touches on this when it when you know the, the concept of just inventing new words to capture different access points of being if you will um so he already naturally did that it's focusing on the possibility that no matter what word you pick that there's something underpinning all these words and that there is a actual relation to all of these particulars to this one thing that has pinned it this one dynamic reference point if you will and like it's dynamic in the sense that everything that points away from it and a story and unfolding it's really unique to that it's unique to that particular unfolding um <laughs> yeah the g word um <clears throat> so i i just think i think like if for me, like I talk about it in my book, like there's things called like bounce and distance, for example, that like it doesn't matter what word or what uh, expression you go with, that there is a bounce and distance that that's there. What what I'm what I'm what I'm saying with that is describing a certain way that the dynamic reference point relates to the particular access points, if you will. Um, I think there's a like literally a oceans worth of different expressions that capture this and like they need to be understood collectively like they need to be understood collectively and I'm sorry I'm really just trying to get this thought out but they it's losing me a little bit fuck but uh basically I think by thinking about that type of stuff, which means in a conversation, okay, this is what I was gonna say, in a conversation, it's hard to talk about it. Like for me, it's hard to talk about what bounce and distance is as it relates to philosophy and us talking about getting to the point of understanding this dynamic reference point. But when we're actually creating something, like we were creating something together, we would know all, we would collectively know this dynamic reference point and it's in, truly an active state where we're we're put we're literally accessing a point of being and so in that sense it would be very easy for me to talk about bounce and distance and some and some of these like thematic type of this thematic dimension language if you will um so i definitely think like these type of conversations are like so necessary but they don't set up the space to talk in this like a truly active mode. And that's just like part of an inherent feature of like thinking, if you will, like thinking without situating it, basically. Like if we were, let's say we we're coming up with a business about all of our knowledge of philosophy and we're talking about philosophy and how we would constitute it within a business that would put the, our thinking in an active mode where we would be able to put a story to our, to our, to our knowing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not saying we should do that, but I'm just saying it's, it's just a different mode that, and it's hard to talk about. That's all. No, it's an outstanding comment and the wind got super strong. So if I vanish suddenly, that is why, um, I think what you're saying about a non-rational science, I think gets into art, it gets into where I'll say the fate of beauty is the fate of us because it has something to do with aesthetics. If we don't have beauty, then we don't have a non-rational science. And if we don't have that, then we're going to fall and that gets into the humanities in general. And without that, we fall into a Nash equilibrium and, so, and socially suffer uh, self, um, self-effacement. Um, so there's something about beauty here. And also what you just said is very important. I'll talk about it later, um, is that there's something about philosophy that's trying to say something that cannot be said. This is why I keep emphasizing free speech because free speech means speak free speech is the is the place where people are constantly attuning themselves to trying to say something unsaid 
which means they are facing the limits of thought, which means they are habituated to the creation of clearance, annihilation, and limitation versus presupposition. Because the key to trying to say something that cannot be said is that's not pre that's that's where it's not a presupposition, it's the encountering of a limit. Because the opposite of presupposition is limit, is what we're kind of getting at. Because limit is what emerges in particularity in that very effort. So if people don't have free speech, or they're not allowed to talk freely, and the, then you cannot have this perpetual orbiting of the unspeakable, of which then has you in the ever encountering of the limitation, which is the encountering of the limitless, which is the encountering of the necontropic, which is what is necessary for a, a system to avoid entropy and self-effacement. So you have to have this, which is then the social collective activity of an engaging in the very possibility of the rhetoric of which gives way to the creation of wealth following the history of economics, that if you shut all that down, you end up with the great stagnation of a Tyler Cone, et cetera, so forth. And please also note, there is a history in postmodernism where the structure, where the, what is the subject structured by? Discourse, language. We are a reflection of language, right? They all tell, well, yeah, here's the problem. Dis language, though, does not have to just be presupposition. We're either structured by a language of presupposition or a language of limit, per se. A language of definitions or a language of trying to approach the definitive. And approaching that definitive, you get used to encountering a limit that in of itself leads to the possibility of the A-B childhood, the menti divergence of which then is necessary for avoiding um, Nash equilibrium. And so speech then becomes the very practice and habituation ground of the creation of a subject that is alternative to the postmodern or Frankfurt subject that falls in a Kafka story, but becomes the subject of ergo rhetoric, the subject of childhood, the subject of the being for whom being is a question, but it is a question of which is found in the encounter of limitation, not the speaking of a presupposition. And so being as a question then becomes an encounter of limit, in that encounter is the unveiling of a definitive of which then can unfold as beauty like the particularity of a Michelle. But that's why the fate of us is so tied to free speech and why the philosopher is in the business of freeing speech from presuppositionalism so that it can be the art of encountering limitation that then is declaring so that being can come forth. So the philosopher for me is in the business of freeing speech from the presupposition to be the art of encountering limit. And that's why you're constantly saying there's a presupposition, not a limit. There's a presupposition, not a limit. There's a presupposition, not a limit. Oh, you think you have a limit? No, that's a presupposition. Keep talking. See what happens. You must encounter the definitive. You must encounter the particular. And the universal then is that everything is one as a one of one. But that's the tension with the philosophers always navigating. Because everything is one as a one of one, which means we can generalize because everything is particular, but the philosopher is in the business of keeping things on the side of the particular, not letting them drift into the general, keeping them on the side of the definitive, not letting it drift into the definitional, because that's when power dominates in a manner that removes the possibility of beauty and unfolding. And so I think the arena of free speech is very important. Like if it's Wynn and then Tyler. Mr. Wynn. I hope you I, ho I hope you see my comments saying I love it when you cipher because <laughs> the last three and a half minutes has been like boom 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 like summary after summary of the whole conversation three hours later um I think like because what we've done is we've, we've started with politics and the relation between like politics community like communality like to be communal and the question of philosophy yeah? like that's where we began like the question of thinking in relation to the type of thinking where people today get skeptical and say look like we need technical knowledge to, to, to combat like COVID, climate change, etc. Like we need like experts. And then the question of philosophy for two hours has been there. Like, but like, where does this come in? Like, where do we where do we introduce this? And I think like this is why I've made my personal history. Like, I've moved from political philosophy to well, law, political philosophy to philosophy because I've realized to question limits means to question presuppositions, which break even they, they break down the limits so what you were calling a limit to the communal horizon was itself ready to be skeptical about like even the limits of your conversation that we've had concerning the very dichotomy of like politics and philosophy philosophy is the mother of wisdom and i think this goes back to like the christian idea of like um wisdom is the essence of like a kind of heavy intoxicating drug like in the Old Testament, wisdom was, I think it was, it's, it's either myrrh or, 
or like incense myrrh, la, 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 the three gifts that were given to Christ as a baby. Myrrh is a very intoxicating drug. And in the Old Testament, wisdom is always associated with myrrh in the sense that it was always associated with that kind of effect which destabilizes your limits. So wisdom is always given by God in the sense that what you contingently, historically posit, and this is our common sense today, we posit like onto things what we think they are. Wisdom breaks it down to say like, but he, who are you to even be the subject that posits onto a thing what that thing is? <laughs> Like wisdom is that question of like the presupposition that relates to the political realm, yeah. And so I've made a comment like limit equals what appears if you try to find a truth in what appears. And I think you know, we're quite lucky today. I would say the last 40, 45 years, 50 years, that we've experienced a lot of philosophy which has tried to be very skeptical about society philosophy itself to the degree that even its presuppositions that made it skeptical have come out of the closet you know like they've come out to shine and a lot of them were based upon the subject object split you know like oh we have to wallow in the in the turmoil of semblances of of like interpretations but then this is why heidegger's become i think more relevant today because he's showing you that even the split between this is me thinking something about the thing which I can't really determine, it's just an interpretation. Even that dichotomy which holds that question is falling apart. And I think this is the point. Philosophy is there to continuously kind of, you can say, destructure, annihilate, undo, unravel, unthink in some sense, um, presuppositions. And this again, this is my question. Like, in terms of then praxis or politics, where does this bring you where does like if someone says there's a limit to thinking we just have to accept politics we have to resign ourselves to how things are i think if you're more radical you say even the limits that we've set to the political horizon can be questioned where does that bring us today in terms of like being communal about this type of skepticism i think i kind of still agree with some elements of the postmodern consideration which is it brings you to freedom. Like Zizek, his most recent book is about freedom. You know, I think I even opened this up just to remind myself of the uh, subtitle. It's called Freedom, a Disease Without uh, a Cure. Because for him, like his whole philosophy points to that end point of it's a disease. Like freedom is just continuously reproducing itself at the end point of philosophy. And this is why for me, Heidegger's consideration of letting be is a bit different, but it's kind of similar. Like, Letting be just shows you that the only imperative, the only conditional that philosophy can bring into the contemporary situation of the praxis of politics is to let other people be. But that also means, and this goes to your work, Daniel, like letting social considerations be social and use them for a pragmatic end, you know, to belong together, to show people that you can belong, despite the fact that there are limits to particular qualities of knowledge. There are limits to rationality, but it doesn't mean rationality is bad or good. It just means there are limits. So what you do is let yourself be exposed to the non-rational. And then you'll find that it's OK to have limitations to technocratic knowing. And philosophy teaches you to be skeptical and accept that and affirm that and use it for the case of freedom, which then can be translated as belonging belonging to your community in the sense of letting another person be whatever they want to come to be and then this is the condition as long as they don't harm your way of being and this is the liberal aspect of my whole philosophy but to get to that liberal aspect maybe you need socialism maybe you need rules which let people be in terms of like their socio-economic perspective and i think this is why philosophy becomes very critical because it brings you to that standpoint where you say oh fuck, like if i really need to let someone be i can't just say good luck out there in the wild west of corporations that want to exploit you for profiteering is to say actually to let you be we need interpretations determinations semblances considerations ideas that are historical and have developed a bit human history to allow you to be and that means it's saying to some people who want to exploit everybody else like no like you can't do this because if to let that person be in their particularity in their way of being which is relative to them the only way to do this is to enforce, to impose 
And this is goes to um I forgot I forgot the lady's name that spoke earlier about imposition. And she talked about like the, the point the problem narratives that they impose upon, like authority tries to impose upon. But I think I made a comment like there's a way to impose which makes you aware of the problem of imposition. So you can actually impose the anti imposition stance, you know. And that's where politics is finds its power. It doesn't mean you become passive, it means you become active because you're saying, like, you know, let's use history, let's use interpretations to affirm the experience of letting someone be, give them a house, give them water, give them anything they need, you know. Why not? There's four of us left. <laughs> Delightful. No, I'll give it to Tyler and then it's been a complete treat. Um treat. You know, I know we use that term all the time, Mr. Win. It's been a treat. Yeah, know. yeah, there I it is. I have to restrain myself every time I come into the conversation. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a it's a treat. It's a treat or a delight or grace or goodness. Yeah, I there have, we go. We got a list of similar words. Right? But we go like... through the speech to find the unspeakable, which is the encounter of the friendship and the speak, which is That's unspeakable true. because it is definitive. It is I can, a I can remain in my silence and know that it's graceful and peaceful and good. Amen. And I don't always have to vocalize it. Not in there this moment, maybe, maybe in 10 minutes at the end. But, yeah. If you had to vocalize it, then it would not be a testament to your freedom. Uh, and I think the uh, that the political, I think the political implications are great. The issue becomes that when we think, the issue is right now we do not have the, we don't have the metric by which to ask according to what should government spend or not spend, where should the market be, where should it not be. We don't have a metric. But if indeed wealth, you know, if you take my word for it, if the history of society, well-being and all of these things are tied to a certain quality of speech and a freedom of speech and freedom being in speech being free from, dare I say, the categories of understanding, because it's almost like the philosophy is trying to free speech from understanding into reason to use Hegel or into letting or into non-rationality. Well, then the question becomes the government may indeed say, well, we're going to fund a program that will contribute to the letting, not the, oh, it's a right now most government programs are in terms of human rights. What is a human right? Well, the problem with that is rights always require power, like rights then have an obligation. So then you get into the you get the negative positive rights of Isaiah Berlin. But if instead we ask what should the government do to create the space, the clearing in which speech can be free to free itself and to encounter the construction of the subject of which increases the probability of the creation of wealth to then pay for the debts. That's the other thing. Like government debt could be investment if it's paid for, right? The probability of debt being investment skyrockets it if it's in favor of creating the conditions of rhetoric following history. If it's in the con uh, debt that creates creativity pays for itself. But the problem right now is that government spending on terms of human rights may or may not pay for itself. So you run into deficit problems and all these different things, right? But if indeed the freedom of speech correlates with wealth creation and the probability of capitalism being more non-zero-sum than zero-sum, of it being more able to overcome a Nash equilibrium than not, then government spending in that manner would be investment for the spreading of the non-rationality that would help the society avoid these um, stagnations and so on and so forth. So now you have a metric by which to think about government spending that is not based on an obligatory doctrine or a guilt doctrine or a economically perhaps insolvable doctrine of human rights. That's what's gotten us in trouble. But everything we're talking about, we say, well, what does government need to do to create the conditions of belonging that are tied into the conditions of clearing, the encountering of particularity for the definitive of which then people can speak freely to structure themselves as a subject to be more negentropic, ergo creative, to not fall into the discourse of capture of Deleuze, et cetera, so forth, which would increase the probability of the society being non-zero sum. Ergo, government spending turns into government investment because the problem is right now, government spending based on a doc of a justification, I'll give it to you, Mr. Wen, and then Tyler, because I saw you on mute, is that government spending right now can not make itself sustainable because it's stuck on a, a presupposition of human rights that is unbound and so it bankrupts itself. But if instead it becomes smart, and then it also has a metric of reform. You reform education in terms of what unleashes speech as such or creates clearing. You reform housing in which creates the architect of people encountering in these terms. You now have a metric by which to smartly design society versus base it on simply people should have housing. People should receive an education. That's all well and good. I'm not even disputing that. But the problem is 
The likelihood of it creating the wealth of which then increases the well-being of the society, the creativity, et cetera, so forth is down because your metric is not complete. It is not situated in a logic of the construction of the subject as such to create the wealth to pay for itself. What were you going to say, Mr. Wynn? This people be my comment in the chat, like even so at that point, like even the socioeconomic position to be freed, to have time to think becomes a metric. Yes. And this is what goes back to Javier's comment. Like that's where pragmatics comes in. Like I'm aware that this is an interpretation given to me historically, but this historical interpretation lets me use this metric for what reason? To let someone be, but in a very, very critical way beyond the presuppositions of GDP, business, inflation, which are metrics used today. So the metric becomes a very technical metric, and this is where technique comes back into the <laughs> equation. I can use the idea of like socioeconomic considerations concerning 10 year plans about society for an end. And this is like people in my field of thinking hate this idea of like, don't think about ends or consequences of thinking. Think about truth or non truth. But actually, what philosophy brings you to is the question of an end, which is freedom, which means letting someone be. But in a way where you say, to let someone be, you have to consider a socio economic position, which means to be free to have time to think or be free to have time to belong. And philosophy is the only space which gives you the question of time to think or time to belong. Otherwise, it's business accumulation for profiteering in the, in the hope that that will give people jobs. And that becomes the prioritization and it gives some people jobs and it creates some inflict, like movement in society, but not really. And then you find people have ways to breach that consideration by ever having like offshore tax havens, you know? There's, and it becomes like there's always ways at that point to then. But I want to put that Tyler, and I'm curious. To oh, it's just magnificent. What I'll say is that right now GDP tends to reflect uh, debt because debt is money. If debt indeed is an investment that pays for itself, that's great. The GDP will justify itself. But the probability that the GDP will do so and actually be a reflection of the well-being of the subject because the subject seems to be optimal when it is more like a child or structured by rhetoric is incredibly low if that debt is not being invested in creating the conditions of clearing. So the probability that debt is actually a reflection of a sustainable system and the well-being of people is incredibly low. And so that's the problem where GDP reflects debt equals money, but it is not, but that debt is not in service of clearing, then the probability of the, the GDP metric actually representing some sort of sustainable well being of the subject, if you will, or the citizenship is very low. We can't know for sure because you cannot have certainty, but I would not bet on that. Um, so, no, I think it's very well put. Let me give it to Tyler. Tyler, please. Um, oh, I, I wish that, uh, <clears throat> that Andrew was still here because I was going to try to. Uh... Uh, go out on a limb and try to be a storyteller here for a second. But for the purpose of trying to ask a question uh, to you, Daniel, and well, and to anybody, but because uh, I suppose with telling this story, what I'm hoping, um, maybe several things, but I'm wondering if th these ideas of uh, needing a philosopher to point out presuppositions, I wonder if if I'm understanding this correctly through telling this story. So I kind of alluded to this story earlier when I spoke that <clears throat> a couple days ago, I was talking uh, with a pastor friend of mine who I don't really know that well. Um, but I mentioned how like I, I, over the last handful of years, I've been struggling with, um, I, I went through like a kind of a psychotic break with regard to <laughs> Christianity and, Daniel, you and I have talked about this. Um, and I kind of was throwing it out there as a way of trying to build a bridge almost, get, almost give my lack to, to her. But what I got back was this very direct question of, let me ask you this, do you believe in Jesus? And it kind of, it's like, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I, this is how I respond. I went, yes, yes, I do. Okay. And then the next question was, do you fear God? And then, and I kind of him and haw, and it's just, it's like when it's that direct, it kind of is, um, I, 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 I don't know how to, how to respond, but as I sit with it over, t over the last couple of days, I'm like, I feel like there's some presupposition at work there and i wonder like if 
I, I've just wondered if, is that presupposition maybe even found in Paul, like where he's saying, you know, it's all about confessional, like if, if you don't say Jesus is Lord, that kind of thing. But I, I almost, and this is why I'm asking you, Daniel, is what, maybe Paul was writing that and the situation out of which he was writing that he's saying, look, if people come to you, to this community and are, uh, you know, saying, no, this guy who was Jesus, he really wasn't Lord. Well, then he's, they're not of you. And I can see how, okay, that makes sense. But to right away kind of then from within a, a different situation within the community to say, uh, like, uh, you know, do you, this is a litmus test of whether you're one of us or not. Anyways, I, I'm, I guess I'm I'm bringing this whole story up because I've I've been wrestling with it, but I'm also wondering, okay, this wrestling and trying to figure out why is this not sitting well with me? Is that what we're talking about with the role of philosophy? Why we need philosophers? That kind of thing. That's outstanding. I'll give it to Mr. Wynn. I think the presupposition is what you need is an algebraic point, not a process. Uh, what you, you know, philosophy is keeping people geometrical, if you will, in a process and an unfolding versus in a point. I think you are exactly right that we can never understand Paul if we separate it from the situation he is writing in. He is writing epistles to particular churches in particular places. And in that place, confessing Jesus Christ is probably going to get you killed. Uh, so there's something about dying for what you believe, where in America, not confessing Jesus Christ can get you killed and rejected. So there's a different situational logic, right? Uh, that has to be like, there's a great book on secret faith in the public space by Mausick that talks about how actually there's a long tradition of Christianity and Bonhoeffer, Gregory of Nicaea, Kierkegaard about keeping it hidden because otherwise it turns into currency, social currency. Also, what you're getting at there. I basically think one of the reasons why philosophy seems necessary is because philosophy is some sort of training in the art of indirectness, working through, you know how you were saying how people just give advice now? And it's like, okay, you're done. That's all a reflection of the technological techni essence and different things where philosophy is about, oh, well, what do you mean by that? Is this ability to sit with the discomfort? Like philosophy, everyone says philosophy is about uncomfortable questions. It's actually kind of more about uncomfortable dwelling where somebody comes up to you and says, I'm doubting Jesus. And you're able to take that and not freak out. You're able to dwell in that. And you go, you know, maybe I doubt Jesus too, actually. Let me sit with this guy. Uh, and that sort of uncomfortable dwelling is the space of the clearing where being and beauty can come forth. I think it is very difficult to get beauty versus mere pleasure and pageantry without discomfort, which speaks to an earlier point in different things. I think basically it is very difficult. The other problem is the presupposition that's kind of implied there is that saying the name of Jesus is a magic trick. If you say the right words, the magic will happen and then you'll be all good and everything will work out. Uh, there's something about language that is forever tied to spelling, spell. We can't help but feel like words have a spell kind of power to it that gets into our subconscious so say the name of jesus do you believe etc so forth yes but of course the question is what does it mean to believe in jesus it would get into romans at a, a talk with high root dimitri i think we have to remember that when paul is writing faith like faith in jesus is faithful faithful is process unfolding and so if someone speaks to you in a manner that suggests what you need is faith as a prep proposition versus faithful to a clearing and process that's a problem and so I think those are some of the things that come to mind. Um, that actually makes me think that the role of the philosopher, too, is actually to keep things in the process, not the presupposition, the unfolding, not the algebra. And the problem is that a lot of theology, independent of philosophy, ends up in a kind of unfortunate magic because religion is fundamentally philosophical. So if it denies philosophy, it becomes very um, magical. It almost has to, because it becomes a kind of metaphysics that doesn't have any physics um, in a way, right? But if it's a process, then the basis of the metaphysics is temporal, which means it's process. So it also becomes difficult for theology to be proper philosophical theology when the basis is space-time, not time-space. Um, that's also an issue. Also, there's a hard divide between eternity and like this world, where I think you have to see that new creation is a continuation of this world in the fullness. Narnia, blue becomes more like blue, things become more like at the end of the Narnia saga. If you think this way, 
then your goal is not to have a faith in a moment of finitude that you're going, that's going to then have you pulled out into the infinite. It becomes faithful to the process of the finitude of which unfolds as the infinite in a true infinity that is the work of new creation. So some of those, those are some thoughts that come to mind. And I think it speaks to the proper role of the philosophy. But let me give it to Mr. Wen and then we will. I think Tyler, just like, I'm normally quite good at not making things personal <laughs> for me in the sense of like, but this experience that you've had in terms of like, the question of Christ, the question of relationship, the question of belief, the question of faith. I, like I was in the church for four years and I left because I, th I felt that the church was not giving me at least a type of skepticism which was necessary to explain the, 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 the feelings, the emotions, the spiritual connection I was having with God. Like I'm still a Christian today to speak like faith to word. But the church in itself with its presuppositions concerning the fear of God do you believe in God? Why are you not coming to church? Why have you left the church? Why have you not been here for one Sunday? The, 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 I remember this. I was 20, 23 years old, 22 years old. I didn't turn up on one Sunday and I had these messages like, why, why are you not within the space? Why are you not here? Why are you not coming? And it was like, because I'm risking the idea that God is good enough to give me a type of experience of himself themselves the trinity themselves <laughs> to experience that experience where i don't need to rely upon other people's presuppositions which i've had to kind of adjust to in my experience of christ and it's not just god it's even at that point it's still christ but it's that question of like and i remember even recently i was speaking to this christian who was trying to invite me into their church like two months ago like i was in the coffee place i go to to do my uni stuff and she was like, oh, you should come and stuff. And we got into the theological considerations. And I was like, you know what? Like, I think God is very universalistic. Like, he is, the death of Christ represents this. And I was like, I have these ideas. And she was like, oh, it sounds like you're too concerned with the philosophies of the world. And as Christ said, don't be concerned with philosophy. <laughs> and I was there thinking, like, in a way, it's kind of true. Like, don't get distracted by those philosophies which lead you to la, 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 in some sense. But... I think philosophy is there to always provoke you to relation, to the open space. And that's what the word Heidegger uses, the word clearing, annihilation, undoing, because he's trying to expose what he calls his phenomenological, a phenomenological experience of the kind of mystery of, of a relation, of, of a way of being, which I think speaks more truth to wisdom than a presupposition concerning the fear of God. In my experience of God, and I'm saying this in a very affirmative way, a very strong way. Like, you don't experience fear because there is no fear in law. Oh, Chaitan's back. <laughs> he couldn't resist. <laughs> There's no fear in law. Like, that's what Christ said. Like, in law, in, in love, there is no law. And I think this is the question. Like, if someone's proposing to you a way of, of, of experience, which is rigid in its presuppositions concerning what God might think about you as a human being in your life. Philosophy is that which opens you to the experience of perhaps there's a way of being which doesn't have to be rigid or is graceful or is open, even graceful enough to leave a church or to even graceful enough to be doubtful. Like Saint, my name is Thomas. Saint Thomas was the skeptic. He put his fingers in Christ's wound. Because he said, like, is this real? Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Three days ago, you died, and now you're sitting here. Like, of course I'm skeptical. And Christ was happy because he was like, yeah, please, touch the wound. Like, put your fingers. Like, <laughs> because no, there's no limit. Like, there's no barrier. There's no limitation. And I think that's the joy. Like, and, and this is why Heidegger's good, because he doesn't use the word God until the end. But he uses the word being. And he says, being is that which lets you be. Like, there's no conditional imperative. You don't have to become a type of person. You don't have to be a subject that becomes, like, total or whole or, like, complete. Like, philosophy's quest is to bring you to the experience that you're okay as you are. That's my whole <laughs> project. Like, psychoanalysis, Chaitan, anything is always to bring you to, like, the experience that, like, even if I'm experiencing, like, a psychotic breakdown, I can't do anything to change that experience. And when I let that experience be, that's it. That's all I can do. Like, and this is my personal experience, actually, with psychosis and the church and like thinking and processing. There is this, this idea of like, I can't do anything to change what's happening to me. And in experiencing that, you're experiencing something outside of yourself, which is graceful, meaning you trust 
being in Heidegger's terms, or you trust God in the Christian theological terms, or psychoanalysis, you trust that you don't always have to break down to psycho that uh, psychosis. You can trust that you can have an experience which is released. And that's why even uh, psychoanalysis is based upon certain presuppositions, which are very graceful. Yeah, like, yeah, there's lag, but if you get rid of lag, you'll, you'll be able to bear it, like you'll be able to take it. And that's why psychoanalysis, I think, is pushing towards lack because it says what we call in lack or the real, you can bear it. Like the symbolic is good enough to bear it. Like even if you know there's lack, you can still take it. You can still be with it. You can still enjoy it in some sense, but in a very high, like a higher quality than someone who says, oh, don't go near lack because it's the devil. Like, you know, like it's, church is kind of like this. Like don't go near skepticism because you're being tempted to think it, you know. Like my experiences, I've become way more spiritual in encountering philosophy. And that's coming from a Christian standpoint where I was born again at the age of 18. Like my family's not Christian. I'm not Christian. Had an experience, went to church, agreed, disagreed. And then disagreeing, I agreed all the more but because I became more skeptical, you know. So that's my my final contribution. Well, Daniel, you need to eat some food. Well, that was divine. And Chitan, you are a champion of the people coming back. No, I think that's a great, you know, that makes me think in the same way that there's a problem when you have this, oh, the expert said, therefore you can't speak. There's a way in which like, oh, if you're not in the church, it's like you're not in the expert space. So you can't do that. You can't, it has a similar structure, right? And I think to me, then there's also a kind of idea that God then functions as an expert, right? Like you have to follow what the expert says and you can't like think of it outside of that structure. But then to like the Chitons point earlier of the fall of the expert, there's also a danger in the spiritual but not religious where you say, well, I don't need a community at all. I can, I don't need that structure. I don't, so the public needs the expert, but then there's something about the expert being there that can then infringe on the public or vice versa. And like you're saying, I think a lot of people will speak to philosophy be having this mediating role. It's like, well, the reason I still do religion is because I found philosophy and figured out how to have it not become an expert space, not become a sort of oppressive power structure. I figured out how to mediate it. Like this role of mediation is what I keep going back to, um, which is not a role, but like a way of life or something, right? You know, and so it has this ability in the same way that philosophy seems like it can keep speech free um, because it can keep it from falling into presupposition and stay in the space of movement to always try to say the unspeakable to the encounter of limit to stay in the definitive. So philosophy can keep fault from falling into that or religion from falling into that. And thus it becomes vegan trauma. It keeps that light. It keeps that childhood. It keeps that unfolding that is going. Um, and it seems to, to have that. But you see, it made me think as well to what you were saying about skepticism. Um, skepticism is like what follows if you plant a seed. There's no way to plant a seed and not have the possibility of skepticism. Because what if it dies? What if it doesn't grow? What if it's too cold, right? The very situation of planting a seed is a situation that the existence of skepticism is a testament to the situation being one of growth and thus creativity and possibility, right? So if you remove skepticism, then it can't be a seed. Well, if the church removes skepticism, it can't be a garden. If the garden removes, if the economy or the society removes free speech, which is the ability to exist in a kind of skeptical speed, nothing can grow, right? It has to stay in the zero sum versus the non-zero sum. Because if you cannot ask questions, then you must not be dealing with a partial object, per se. You must not be dealing with something definitive. Thus, it cannot grow or unfold anymore. It must be algebraic, not geometric. And that must be something akin to a facement. And so the ability, so speech, free speech. And again, it's always interesting. Philosophy is always like, do words mean that? It has something to do with language. It's not falling into definition. It's always like, what's the best word? It's treating language like a garden like something that's a seed that's growth. And the skepticism is the keeping language itself as a kind of seed that can blossom something more that then if language structures the subject, when language is such a growth, so the subject can be different than the subject structured by discourse that we see in the Kafka or the Frankfurt or different things like that. And so the freedom of speech seems to be the freedom of us. 
uh, the, the word, right? Spoken. The word is the world. Everything is spoken into existence. The world seems to reflect the word and philosophy seems to about, about keeping the word as worlding, as growing, keeping free speech free by keeping it in from slipping into understanding by keeping it in the realm of reason, which fundamentally requires annihilation. But please, uh, Thomas, Tyler, anyone? <laughs> Oh, real quick, I just wanted to say thanks to you guys. It's, um, uh, I guess I always, I always do feel like when, when I'm in, like, actually, I, I wrote down that when I was confronted with those two, two questions, it actually felt like I was on trial. Yeah. <laughs> and Not that, that is, absolutely, that is what breaks. Well, and it's also kind of interesting. It's like, well, wait a minute, who is, Who's the one accusing here in this? <laughs> what it, but um, and and in contrast to that, just what these kinds of spaces can be, where I can rest, I can bring forth this stuff and kind of share it with you guys, and it's it's like, yep, I've I've been struggling with that too, or you know. So, anyways, I just wanted to say thank you, and it. It's these kinds of conversations that I end up feeling like I, I'm full after this in some way. I'm, I've been, I've somehow taken of the Eucharist. I've somehow encountered the Holy Spirit in this. So anyways, thank you. Well, we're grateful for you, Tyler. I think that's beautifully put. And I, I think, again, I think of so much of this in terms of the speaking, the cipher, the this kind of speech act, the freedom of speech when speech is free, there is some transubstantiation to that, where words become something more than words, where bread becomes something more than bread. I think that's beautifully put. So thank you for being here. Let me give it to Thomas and then Chaitan. Mr. Wynn. Very quick, because I want to hear Chaitan speak. I know it's late for him. I think, like... The problem with all of this is like each time you're saying something, I, I can have like all these ideas based on my personal experience. And like from this standpoint, which is 10 years later, like, of course, I'm affirming it because of my personal experience, but I could also be wrong. Maybe this Christian is right. Maybe I'm not fearing the, the, the fear of God. You know, maybe I'm not feeling it. And that's always and that that perspective is the skepticism of my skepticism, you know. And that's the place you need to be. That's the place that you need to hang out in. It's not just like, oh, be skeptical of the Christian narrative. It's not. It's like, be skeptical of the very narrative, which means that I might be coming away from that world of Christianity that they've understood and they've understood the truth of. Amen. End of story. And I think that this is Christ. Like, And I think if you read the Bible, like, the Bible is the story of Christ going into a condition where he was skeptical. The Judaic Christian of his time, which was historically thrown, he was thrown into it. And he was against the Pharisees. And they were like the highest examples of the Judaism of his time. And everybody believed in the Pharisees. And he said, like, but you haven't, he was saying, like, you haven't read the scriptures. Or he was saying, like, the very translation or historical position of these scriptures are historical in your context, fine, but they're not speaking to the, the, the message which is like translucive of this, which is like about the grace of God and the forgiveness of God, whereas the law of the Pharisees was like rigid and impositional and fear, you know, like the tabernacle through the curtain and you have to do this otherwise for 300 days, you have, you know, and I think this is the point. Christ was homeless. He was skeptical. He was outside of authority. He threw the tables over in the church, in the temple's space because it was a marketplace. I think even that idea of like Christ as someone who would throw the tables over, you need a skepticism to begin to even think that compared to how the church approaches Christ today. And that's all the skepticism means. It means like it's considering another view of Christ, you know, like was Christ Arabic? Yes. Like even I remember like this pastor came to me and printed out this picture of like, um, a Lebanese Christ was like, this is what Christ looks like, you know? And it was like, for him, that was the most radical thing he'd ever done in his life, was showing that there's a difference between the mainstream narrative and his narrative of Christ. And it was like, yeah, he's got a point, like, that's good, but that's a type of skepticism. You know, Protestantism was a radical skepticism of the Catholic narrative. That was huge for his time. Luther was huge for his time. Like, the US church is predominantly Protestant, and it was it had its own radicalism which based itself on skepticism according to the mainstream narrative of christianity 
And I think this is the point. Do we take history in its development? And then this is the mystical side of it. Or do we trust that maybe history has an access to it or has something which is outside of itself, which is you can call God or God's word or God's truth? You know, you don't have to, but like, is there something beyond your own particular interpretation, which is true? And I think the only way to risk that is to step outside of the narrative that someone gives you. And if God's good, he wouldn't judge you for that decision, in my opinion. If God is a good God, he wouldn't judge you. Or he would judge you, but he'd judge you well by saying, good job. <laughs> You're a true Heideggerian, like, or Hegelian, or Lacanian, whatever you want to say. Like, you've, you've, con you've confronted the contemporary situation where you said, like, you know what, like, I don't know how my knowledge can accept that based upon my experience because I've had a mystical experience of God and it wasn't like what you're telling me, but because you're telling me this, I'm doubting myself. That's the place to remain and hang out. That's, that's what prayer is. Prayer is that space of meditation where you sit with silence. You let, you let, <laughs> you let God speak or you let your unconscious come forth and you say, I'm not going to judge this because I feel like whatever this happens to be in the end is how it comes to me and that's it and that's what my work's about it's about releasement you know it's about letting things happen of themselves without ju judging them too much because of course always there's judgment but it's about maybe like weakening judgment and letting things be and affirming it at that point point. and i think in terms of christianity that's christ christ was christ was the like the the lived experience of, of letting other people be like the prostitute he didn't he said to the to the pharisees like tell me who's gonna throw the first stone like gone <laughs> which one of you is gonna throw it because if you throw it you're constrained by a type of over rational thinking which is which has not experienced the non-rationality of love or care or grace or openness you know and i think that's 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 christianity's teaching is grace openness love care charity not always overly rationalizing a narrative of God is God is there to haunt you, and if you're not fearful, you're screwed. That's not that's not my God, unfortunately. Like this next time you speak to this person, just say like, that's not really my kind of God. Like I'm sorry, but <laughs> you know. But anyway, that's well, that is I know that is beautiful, and I I can't wait. Like you get the H bad God's like here's your H bad. For Heidegger, you get a little badge on your shoulder for Heidegger. It's going to be great. Um, there's a few things I'll give it to cheat on. I think, one, you were saying about the definite historical moment. I think that logic applies, like we were saying, the definitive particular person is what is necessary for the encounter for something to come forth. So it is in your encounter with the definitive particular historical moment that something comes forth. There's a similar logic. The, it, the moment is the partial object of history required for the, um, the clearing. I think there's a few more things. I think faith is always of a skepticism because the reason you have faith is because you're skeptical of the world. Like faith is what faith is of a skepticism. So a faith without a skepticism can't be a faith because, because you have faith because what is given in immediacy is not so, right? So there's an interesting thing in which faith is always of a skepticism. It's always a kind of holding of annihilation. Um, and so if it loses the skepticism, that is a problem. And there's a way in which as well, in which philosophy seems to, because also too, like when does the social order collapse? When it stops ha when it stops being skeptical, it like its faith is in the social order versus having faith in the process of the skepticism of the social order, which creates the dance of free speech that keeps everything going without a ground. So I think in the same way that like there's a way in which the role of the philosopher, if I keep talking about that, is to keep the faith in the skepticism, to keep the faith in thought, to keep believing that thinking actually can generate something, to keep faith that speaking can actually do something. Um, in the same way that I think um, the best leaders in a church keep the skept keep the faith in the skepticism. We go, well, of course you're skeptical. It's kind of crazy to think that a guy 2,000 years ago was God. That's kind of nuts. So you think that but what would it mean to think that in a living way that meets that reality of a breaking apart of the vertical and the horizontal right well the philosopher does something too it's like i know it seems like free speech doesn't do anything and all people do when they speak freely is say stupid stuff but let's keep the faith and also free speech is fundamentally a process of skepticism people are talking i don't know about this covid stuff i don't know about that like what do people they want to speak their skepticism and the philosopher is like yes i know people are talking about a lot of stuff that seems crazy but let's keep the faith in this process expert class 
Let's keep the faith in this, this expert. And, I, and hey, I know public, you think the experts are totalitarian and they don't care about it, but let's keep some faith in the role of the experts, okay? I know you're skeptical, but let's maintain some faith. But then the problem is faith without skepticism is closed-mindedness, is totalitarianism. So it has to be faith in skepticism and skepticism in faith, which is fundamentally a tense thing. How do you hold it together? The philosopher seems to be in that role. And they seem to also get people to the place where they find fittedness in that very tension um, in different things. But what is it, Mr. Wynn? Can I just say, like, this is the point. If you if you put pure faith in skepticism alone, you end up yeah. in a lot of the problems we encounter today, like the meaning crisis, exactly. postmodern thinking, nihilism, you know, because you've and like I've, I've taught students before where they've been overly rational about skepticism. And they've said, there is no God. I'm by myself. This is my interpretation. You can't tell me any higher narrative about my existence because it's your interpretation. This is the pathway of skepticism that Hegel confronts. And Hegel stops at a certain point that goes through nihilism. And he says, but if we're skeptical enough, we come back to the idea. It doesn't mean that you just demolish all of the ideas into like the dissonance or spectral, whatever, like relativity of complete thinking. But you have to pass through even the consideration that things are relative to each other you know like that's your position that's my position that's it and i think this is the point of philosophy today is to bring you through relativity the word contingency the word historicity the word particularity the word individuality all of these it is like it's like you have to bring yourself through the specific space time of your own being and this is kirkegaard's idea of god you have to pass through the particular to encounter faith you have to take that leap of experiencing your own relation to God without the other's idea of God, you know? And then maybe what you'll find is some people have good ideas concerning God. <laughs> like, good. And if you can form a community around their ideas, that's a whole new church, a whole new mosque, you know? Like, congratulations. But then but then good skepticism, skepticism starts and says, well, maybe even that's just an interpretation, which then is like, how do you actualize your faith? Where are you talking? How are you talking? In my experience, the church today, the way it talks, it's always about like, like what Daniel's work is about, like quantity rather than quality. It's always about insider, outsider, number one, number two. I'm like this. You should be like this, you know. And it goes back to those dogmatic ways of thinking, which in my my belief is very different from Christ's teaching. Christ's teaching is about like he didn't impose law like he he spoke on the sermon on the mount was the opposite of law like it was law to the degree that you can't fulfill it and he said that's what we as jewish people that believe good luck trying to fulfill that law instead it's not about quantity it's about quality it's about an experience of the divine which means that you instantly love thy neighbor it doesn't mean you have to fulfill that as a legislative act but you look at someone near you who's suffering and you say, like, why are they suffering? And this is philosophy. Why are they suffering? What's causing them to suffer? What forms of relations that are enabling that to continue without us thinking critically about their suffering? Philosophy is just there as a way of care to say, like, look, this person's suffering. Why? Why are we not thinking this? You know, why are we not thinking climate change? Why are we not thinking, you know? Like, I'm sure Christ would be concerned with climate change right now. Like that would be in the Bible if it was written right now. Like Christ is walking down the street and it's like really hot and he's like, oh, why is it hot? <laughs> and the Pharisees are like, don't think about that. You know, like you're not God. You can't think about that. And then they would say, yeah, but we have to because, you know, and I, I'm sure this is the it's, it's care. It's like this idea of grace and care is a way of being. It's not like you can't always legislate it. And Christians today, unfortunately, still want to legislate because they've forgotten the good news of Christ, which is like love and grace and openness. And yeah. And, oh, no, it's beautiful. I'll give it to Cheetah. I mean, basically, um, faith without skepticism loses care and skepticism without faith loses care. And that the game is that we have to use philosophy to be careful to keep skepticism in faith and faith in skepticism so that they stay in a mode of care. So philosophy is careful, full of care, so that it can keep those things together so that they maintain caring. Um, and so I think like, yeah, I mean, we talked about limits. Faith is limited in needing skepticism. Like if faith doesn't have skepticism, it's not, it's presuppositional. And at that point, it's certainty and it's not faith, actually. And skepticism, likewise, needs uh, is limited by its need of a kind of faith. 
or else it becomes nihilism or kind of like naked, right? And this logic of theology applies to economic sociology, free speech, and all of these different things. It's the same sort of structure where the funny thing is when faith is limited by skepticism, it's unlimited because you can always question it actually and keep it alive. That's the joke. The limit becomes the limitless. Likewise, free speech is limitless. It just keeps going and going and going. There's all new life. So the limit, the encounter of the limit is what grows. I'll expand on that in a moment, but let me give it to Chitan. Chitan, you are a champion of the people. <laughs> no, I just got curious. Uh, I had to, this because switched off one, what, gone for what a phone. What time is it, Chitan? What time it's is it? 4.30 4 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 4.30 exact, 4.31. I knew, I knew it was late, but I didn't realize it was so late, but still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's a wonderful discussion uh, what you guys are having. And one of the challenges and thinking with Thomas Wynn here, actually, in that sense that uh, one of the challenges with skepticism is that it sort of splits uh, doubt and certainty. And what generally happens is that the extremes of any one of, at, 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 of any one, you, you have extreme doubt, you, you, you get the ma a magnified certainty at the other end of extreme doubt. And you get magnified doubt in the other end of extreme certainty. You know, in the sense, opposites always end up meeting in the splits in the center. You know, that, that problem always emerges in that sense. And one of the problems and, and, and one of the things with skepticism is that there is, there is no outside of skepticism possible. Any act of thinking would always involve this question of skepticism. So there is no complete outside of it. And yet, when you completely accept a skeptical position, you enter into a zone where you are you, you're creating an artificial space from which you're becoming skeptical of things. You, you create a separate zone for yourself from which everything can be doubted. And that is how you can be certain of yourself. You know, Descartes' famous statement, I think, therefore I am, uh, you know, always comes from that position that, that, that there is certainty of I when I'm doubting the world. And you can see various kind of, you know, plays emerging from that, that kind of a thinking. The interesting thing about skepticism actually emerges is can the skeptical go back and re-inhabit the world by being a skeptical? Which is what Thomas is sort of arguing for. That is, that is what he's sort of indicating us towards. That what is that position from which skeptic can inhabit the world, inhabit the everyday without letting go of his own doubt. In that sense, without splitting doubt in certainty. Finding ways of certainty within his within the doubt, not outside of doubt in that sense. So it's it's not either doubt or certainty that he's dealing with. It's for it, it, it's it's skeptic in that sense starts dealing with uh, formations of certainties within doubts. And formation of doubts within certainties. And what 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 is that sphere that, that emerges? I'm not saying I have an answer, but there is something about that problem of the everyday of inhabiting the world in, in that sense while holding doubt and certainty with each other in that sense. And that is what I think skepticism at, in, in that sense, you know, positions us for. And the second point about the expert question that we were having, and I was trying to frame that problem in that sense. And it, it sort of connects to this. Um, one of the questions of, I think, ex, ex, expert which emerges here is that while philosophy has long ago answered the problem of the expert and, you know, and the way to think about it and so on and so forth, the challenge that the world is experiencing today is they have to answer this question without philosophy. You know, as philosophers, we have very good answers for it. And I think every philosopher has a good answer for it. <laughs> you know, and any of those answers, if, if they could talk to the world we are living in, um, uh, the world would not be what the way it is. Uh, in some senses, the challenge for the world today has become of to think of, of these uh, questions without actually falling back on philosophy, because that, that, that connection of philosophy is lost for us at this moment. And I'm not sure if a connection with philosophy would come before these other forms of thinking would emerge or these other forms of thinking would lead us back to philosophy. I don't have an, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to predict what would happen, but I think both have to happen simultaneously at some level. And one of the things that, are, that is interesting me in my work these days, um, you know, um, both anthropologically and, you know, ways of thinking. I, I don't, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm a philosopher or not, but, uh, you know, my own reading in that sense, um, is this, this tension of 
of forming what are the criteria and what are the forms of thinking that will that that that, that can emerge outside the philosophical domain outside explicit philosophical trajectories that we know of uh, and then I, I think living in india because i'm living in the on, on such far end of things that the talking philosophy people around here is not uh, is not as easy as you probably it would be in europe or you know in america so uh, that challenge is more real for me i don't know how you you would think about it no, and I'll give it to when. I mean, for me, um, that's very well put. There's a few things. I mean, to me, that gets into where, like, in order to see what kind, what could emerge outside of philosophy with skepticism, it requires free speech. Like the condition where people can speak freely and then have access to one another to relate, to see how it formulates, right? And then the funny thing will be, does philosophy naturally emerge from those conditions, even if it is not intentional? That's kind of what I think is an interesting question. Is there something in the human relation that once it is skeptical and it talks in a free exchange way, and it then also is said, you can't insult one another. You can't, you can't shut people down. You actually have to do the three hour podcast thing. Do you see something like philosophy naturally emerge? Because if so, that kind of suggests that philosophy does have this kind of interesting role in the human experience of creating clearings for something to come forward. Uh, so for me, the condition of that possibility is tied to free speech and then changing the education system uh, from the trivia classroom, removing the college monopoly on credentials, bringing back employment testing and things like that, all become part of the infrastructure and structural possibility of doing all of that. It's a wonderful question. There's more to say. Let me give it to Mr. Wen. Four hours of fun is good. Um, I've obviously made some notes based upon what um, Tyler responded with and Chaitan and everything. I think, like, the idea of skepticism is important for everything that I do. Like, it's it's fundamental. My own personal relation to God, to life, to politics, to myself, to desire, to relationships, you know. Anything that I live on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that the one thing I've learned in life is skepticism coming through particular dogmatic ways of thinking and maintaining aspects of them because I feel like I've passed through certain aspects of skepticism, which means dogma entails skepticism. The dogma no longer becomes dogma because the idea of dogmatic means to be without skepticism. It means to presuppose things that just remain in the air and exist of themselves without questioning them based upon the history of human thinking, which has become more skeptical itself which is why we are lucky today. Like, So like Heidegger has this idea. Hegel didn't think things. Nietzsche didn't think things because only because they're a product of their time. Like they were the most radical of radicals in their time. They, had, they touched upon the truth of their time. And it was the most beautiful existent truth of their time. And Heidegger is not saying that he's the last of it because he points, he says there is the end of philosophy and the task of thinking. And this is what I want to say now. I would say that Heidegger, in my personal opinion, but it's not just Heidegger, it's like philosophy today, when you intertwine everything with psychoanalysis, philosophy, any form of like political engagement, skepticism should be understood as a skepticism against not knowing far knowing, knowing as pure knowing of whatever we come to know. And I think this is the problem today. This is the problem of postmodern thinking. We still think that there's just one quality of knowledge, whereby Skepticism means the end of knowledge or knowledge. And we have to balance that act of like, this is spectral, this is impossible, and we're stuck, you know? But I think what philosophy teaches us is skepticism brings us against a type or quality of knowledge, which is what Heidegger in his work calls the history of metaphysics, you know, that which tries to dominate the field of representation, that which tries to correspond to the truth for its notion. And that, that's a very long-winded thing but like it's very not nuanced um i think what what basically philosophy is now bringing us to and i think it's still very silent which gives my work some space to play with it a lot actually is skepticism is that which affirms a way of being not so much a modality of knowledge or modalities of knowing quantity quality i think skepticism brings you to quality and shows you that they're actually like in relation to God and Christianity, there's a way of being. There's a way of Christ. Christ has his way of living, of reacting, of interacting. It doesn't mean it's outside of knowledge. It itself is a modality of experience as knowledge, as logos. 
as releasement, as giving space to, as considering technical aspects of living in the world, you know, to be a carpenter or a wood builder or anything that you happen to be. I think philosophy is that which brings you to an affirmation of a specific way of being, actually. And I would say philosophers have an answer directly to this way of being. Um, and I've got one, one last note. This is where the Mrs. Chaitan's point, the criteria, you mentioned the word criteria, quality. I think there is a criteria today that can be used in terms of skepticism, which says that actually what skepticism brings us to is a criteria for thinking that way of being, which is about giving space to other people letting them be and because for Heidegger the most important point and being or God God's way or being's way is to let things be according to what it comes to be and that goes to your point Daniel like it's having faith in the trust that what comes to be is it and even if you say like oh that's negative like oh my prayer to God didn't come true and I'm ending up I'm homeless or I didn't get the job or the partner left me it's not to say like God's willing that letting, you know, <laughs> it's to say that despite that, there is this kind of happening of itself, which in itself, on my comprehension of good and evil or right and wrong. And that's where faith is, is to say that what moves of itself, what happens of itself, what gives itself, is a condition for me to live in a way which reacts to that in authenticity, which means to be free to speak in any way I want to and to give speech to other people. And I put in parentheses. Free speech, releasement, free speech. All you can do is like achieve it by realizing you can't change it until you speak into it and then you actually change it. And that's where politics comes alive again because you can reinterpret that field. You have the energy to like energy or like you have the, and that's like the motive of philosophy is energy. Or it's like the movement, you know. See, uh, there's something really, uh, I think, important that I think Thomas and you are saying about the question of free speech and thinking in that sense. And philosophy, I think, was always, always marked by this is emphasis upon concepts. By right? if you look at Deleuze's work on you know what is philosophy, it's it's marking this question of concepts because it's marking the terrain of thinking prior to action. In that sense. Uh, I think we are heading into a world and it and whenever thinking is prior to action, you'll enter into the zone of philosophy in that sense. And that's an important zone, you know, where speech, speech becomes extremely important. What Lacanian psychoanalysis sort of puts us in the emphasis of psychosis, which I was sort of talking about last time. I don't think we, in today's world, at least in, in, in India right now, we can we can presuppose free speech anymore. For instance, I don't I don't write on my Facebook these days because I know the job applications I'm sending, the person will go, go back and check my Facebook. <laughs> we have reached that point in India. <laughs> you know, so I don't think I can presuppose free speech in here. In here. I can talk to you on net. Nobody will know it. But if I'm talking to my peers over here, it's, it's a very different story. And the example that I gave you last time of that person, um, you know, who's sort of wrapping herself in, in, in the paper. And once she knows she can see her own clothes, um, there is a form of thinking that emerges from that action of seeing her own clothes. It's not thinking in terms of speech. It's a thinking that is emerging from uh, that activity from which her body feels contained. And once it's contained, you, the, 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 the space back to speech becomes possible. You know, there are forms of practices through which thinking can move when speech is silenced. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think if you go back to Jesus, you go back to any mystical, uh, you know, uh, origins. At all points of time, I think whenever speech means you know, became silenced, the form of, form of practices had to emerge from which speech could move for certain points of time. I think we are entering into that zone. We are, that is why this connection with philosophy is becoming more difficult. Because philosophy functions very well where speech is something which is assumed prior to action. We are thinking and then acting as human beings. And then we can see that our thinking is how right, how wrong. All of that stuff philosophy can handle. Philosophy as such cannot handle where thinking has to move through forms of practices. Which is why that dichotomy between customs and thinking doesn't work. <laughs> you know, all societies were thinking in their own ways. Uh, one of the things that, you know, one of the things that psychoanalysis tells us is that all symptoms are th thoughts in some senses. They, symptoms, symptoms think. 
Uh, how do we think through the question of practices that are thinking? I mean, just leaving it out there. You know, what are the what what will those forms of practices be for our times? Uh, I don't, you know, I, I think. No, it's outstanding. Um, so a few a few thoughts. Um, it is absolutely the case that free speech is being limited around the world, and it would be naive to su suggest otherwise. Um, there is no possibility. Like, so Belonging Again is going to really defend free speech as basically not merely expression, but negentropic for a society, if you grant me a very giant claim in the individual. Right now, that is not possible. It would not be possible until you reform the classroom in its medium and in its very structure to make people used to and habituated to speaking freely and speech as tied to the learning process, not merely the memorization of information. So it would require educational reform, uh, would be central to all this. Second, the other thing that can force it is a geopolitical disaster that is a historic forcing function that makes people say we need to do things differently or maybe we shouldn't have closed down the lines of communication between the West and Russia or maybe we should have had people communing more regularly with foreign countries because otherwise they're turned into uh, Satan figures and we end up in a geopolitical disaster. The other thing could be AI pushes people through unemployment to being more focused on personal relations and different things, and they find out they don't know how to talk to one another. So there will there will not be a recovery of free speech unless you have some sort of historic forcing function, the owl of Nineveh flies at dusk, or you have an educational reform. But of course, the question would be, why would they reform education before there was a disaster? Maybe it would be an economic crisis. You could have the colleges go under because they don't have um, enough debt to sustain themselves. There will have to, unfortunately, be a dusk if you're a betting man. Uh, and the question simply be is, who were the people? Um, yeah, right. Uh, who are the people who had what Hunter and the sociologist would call the faithful presence? who have changed the conditions of possibility of whom could then show the alternative once the forcing function has occurred to make people forced to consider those conditions of possibility that has been shifted. But you need people changing the conditions of possibility that then history forces people to take seriously. And they have to have that double role. And then you could say philosophy now is very much a, pre a preparatory role of being ready to catch the forcing function. Um, and so it's very important, I think, to get into questions of what is philosophy. And I think Mr. Wynn, um, um, I think the point you're getting at as a way of being is really important because basically free speech is a way of being. Speaking is the way of being that philosophy depends. And if speech structures the subject, um, then that is the realm in which the subject is structured either according to discourse, Foucault and all of that, or according to rhetoric. And so speech, the way of being becomes the way of speech per se, the way of language. And this starts to get at why language has so much, why philosophy has so much to do with language and pushing it aside and different things. And because language is the thing that you must speak, but is always a threat in get, of becoming a wall on the way by becoming a hard presupposition or definition or becoming something that's reifying a definite. So you have to use speech to be the way of being because being is structured by speech, but the very using of that speech is what threatens to stop the way. And that's why the speech has to always be kept free. But that means the role of the philosopher in the sense that I'm describing it is to maintain the infrastructure of free speech to keep it free at all times so that being can continue to be structured in a manner as a way versus a definition that then makes it stagnant. And thus the economy is stagnant and so far. But Mr. Wynn, please. Uh, you kind of said what I wanted to say. First one, um, just I think like so what in my research, like moving through nihilism, the question of God, question of absolute knowledge, question of certainty, and moving towards releasement or being's way to be, or God's way to be, or being's way to be, or a way of be which a way of being which reaches authenticity, the later Heidegger stuff. I think like what's given me a lot of opt optimism is to like analyze that historically by saying today's skepticism like you said in a way is good because it's it's brought us to that place where in my opinion from the perspective of releasement or being's way to be is that which lets things be or be opened or be open you know like to be skeptical and to be postmodern, which i think a lot of people are like oh this is my interpretation that's your interpretation you know I think a lot of people, most people today are like this. Like, most people are like, well, this is democracy. Like, you have your opinion, I have mine. I think this is, in a way, like a symbol for the passageway. And this is my optimism. 
towards not just seeing that as the final solution, but to see the solution as to say, well, actually, we're talking about a way of existing. And I think good philosophy today, which means like Zizek, Vatimo, uh, Zipanschic, Sherman, blah, 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 Hegel, Nietzsche. If you look at the end of their philosophies, it's always about letting things be in some sense. Because I think even if they didn't determine it as such, what they're pointing to is a way of experience. Like Nietzsche's overman, Hegel's absolute knowledge or absolute consciousness is talking about a way of experience of being with things in a very different quality where the very problem of limit or nihilism or or obstruction is opened. And I think it's, it's always opened. If you look at like what they talk about, it's always about like being given over to things in themselves or given over to life in its indeterminacy or given over to the experience of God or given over to the experience of what or happens, you know? And I think all of them are very graceful about that quality. Maybe not Zizek, he's quite negative in some sense, la la la. Okay. But I think the idea is skepticism brings you to that point where at least you're provoked to think about different ways of being. And that introduces again the question of the, the 18th century. Like, is there an absolute way to be? Is there a way of being which touches upon some type of authenticity or something? And I think this is coming back. Like, I think even the interest in Zen Buddhism or Taoism in, like, the West is a sign of this, you know? Like, people experience the, the nice things about, like, meditation or what it means to experience, like, even Hinduism. Like, what it means to experience, like, you know, that piece of where they point you to, which is very different from the Western metaphysical narrative, which always tried to just bring you to, like, a rational representation of truth. And I think that's, that's our destiny in a way. Like, this is what Batima calls, like, the decline of metaphysics. But that opens you up to freedom or to liberty or to free speech. So Vatimo's main teaching was free speech. He said, in the transparent society of media, you're given over to someone else's opinion and you're given to it. So you're recognizing difference. And in that experience, you're open to a different way of being. But he wouldn't theorize it as such. He would stop too soon. So in a way, my work is to theorize that way of being between Zizek and Vatimo and Sopancic and others to say what they're pointing to is releasement. And if you, put, if you look at the last years of Heidegger's life, he's saying that, wait, that is being's way to be, or God's way to be, or the absolute disclosure is about releasing things. And I think there's something happening today in the contemporary scene, which is beyond nihilism at that exact point, you know, where it's not about negativity or fear, to go back to what Tyler said, it's not about fearing God, it's about affirming the the space of skepticism or of indeterminacy to say actually in that space I can kind of determine a way of being psychoanalysis if I approach the lack I realize that maybe lack in itself is not negative but it was just my negative relationship to it that creates negativity instead I can affirm that as a way of freedom or experience to open up to mystery and I think there is mystery in psychoanalysis you know <clears throat> to say that actually psychoanalysis as a science can't always think that mystery but it doesn't need to and again, philosophy, philosophy in politics, philosophy in psychoanalysis, philosophy in building a house. How do we dwell? How do we live? It's about a way of being, not about a technique, how to construct or deconstruct, you know? Maybe that's where French philosophy went wrong. It was always over, overly obsessed about deconstructing, and it couldn't think the question of the nothingness that it, that it based its deconstruction upon. And this is Batimo's thing. French philosophy couldn't think Heidegger seriously enough to see a kind of weak way of being. So what Fatima calls a weak and open and charitable way of living. And even he stops too soon. In my opinion. All right. It's been, yeah. Goodbye. Sorry. Well, there's a way in which with philosophy, if we talk about free speech, philosophy can keep, and then I'll, I'll close. But in talking about the limit, it helps it be limitless. And so the net has gone on so long. So the limit becomes limitless, right? Um, and so... I think philosophy keeps free speech as something like free poetry. Heidegger was big on poetry. Poetry is a kind of speak that also has a certain life beyond the words in of itself, and it brings the kind of the concept and the language together. So the philosopher can help free speech be more like free poetry in this sense, and thus a way of being. I think also if speech is so primary that it makes sense that psychoanalysis is a big deal today because there's all about speaking and speak and Lacan and how to speak and the negativity of speech, and it makes sense that if free speech is central, 
then one of the great threats to free speech, which is the condition of negentropy, is the ability to handle negativity because speech is like the great source of negativity for people. And that's where the Lacans and the Hegels and the Zizeks are correct to emphasize the negativity because the experience of speech tends to be before a whole lot of work, incredibly negative. And if you don't admit that, you may interpret the negativity as evidence you're going the wrong way. When in fact, the negativity is the practicing of being able to handle the speech so that you can keep something relating and alive that can then become something like poetry. Poetry tends to be best when written in something like blood. Uh, it requires some sort of bleeding, just like Christ is at his best in bleeding because he shows that beauty can come from wounds. I think also on this relation of skepticism, it would definitely seem you have to have skepticism to keep the faith in the sense that when you're on a path and you're speaking, the tendency of speaking is to say, this is where we need to be. We've arrived at the answer. And the skeptic says, no, no, let's keep going. Let's keep going. But if, well, we haven't arrived. Why should we think there's anywhere to go? Keep the faith. Keep the faith. And so the skepticism in the act of speech is to keep the speech going while not losing the faith that it's going somewhere. And so without the skepticism, you'll stop the path. And if you stop the path, you stop the negentropy because the, neg the negentropy the, the wealth creation is the looking behind you in the path that you've walked. And if you stop walking, you stop creating wealth in terms of socioeconomics and you stop creating a way that can unify diversity. Mr. Wynn, please. You said four words, maybe 10. <laughs> and I've used five already. Um, <laughs> I think this is the point. Like, and I think I have a lot of friends that hate philosophy because they're scared because like they're anxious. Like I've been anxious in my past and I understand that when you feel anxious, you don't want to think about thinking. <laughs> or it seems like you don't want to think about thinking. And I think life, in my opinion, demonstrates in ex is experience phenomenologically, which includes the ideas that life itself is, is very graceful and loving and caring and a lot of negativity towards life or that life gives over to you in itself is always kind of like a pathway to to a clearing or to that experience of peace, you know, even in death, even in breakups, even in horror and torture and, and tribulation and war. And I think this is the question, like, where do these scenarios devolve or evolve or revolve around? And I think it's always to do with human beings that don't experience the clearing. They overdetermine people, they overdetermine events, they can bomb people because they think that they are less than them you know and i think this is the point philosophy is the type of skepticism which also shows you that what skepticism is again it goes back to the the abrahamic reference to lady wisdom like lady wisdom for god in the old testament was the the myrrh the 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 very heavy substance which would intoxicate you in the sense that it deconstructs your narratives about what is and it brings you to that way of being but which is which is given over to faith or given over to the unknown and i think that's your point daniel at the end it gives you over to the experience that you don't know but in the experience of not knowing you you then can know perhaps that life itself is is giving and graceful and or what heidegger would say is gifting the gifts and you you trust the gift because if it's gifting something and that's what it's gifting you have no choice about that that's life <laughs> If that's negative or positive or anywhere beyond or between or under, that's it. That's where philosophy should bring you, I think, is to the disclosure of the possibility that it's good or bad or negative or positive or something else. And I think that's what it means to be to be a, a, a philosopher, to go back to what I said before about do I identify as a philosopher? It means to risk the faith that what is or what gives or what gifts or what takes away death is, is, like is, literally is. Like Yewa, I am. It is, and it's the, and it's that leap. It's that release. One. It's that opening. That I think is the the horror of the abyss, but also that event of maybe something which is, um, which indicates something more than just a horror. It's a way of being, and I think yeah. No, that's I mean when, final when you, four words. No, yeah. there's one. I mean, when you talk about thinking as thinking, that then there's two questions by which to think of that. Is it meta or is it mystery? Meta is a threat to mystery, but if thinking can think about thinking, then it's a true infinity and it has negentropic potential. And the scary thing is if I think about thinking, what if I go down a long void and I'm lost forever and into ever skepticism, but you have to face that fear to have the possibility of experiencing thinking about thinking as a dance. 
as a source of mystery and beauty. And the thing is, when you think about thinking, you come to realize that thought is not unknowable, it's unknown, which means it's a mountain that can be explored. But you have to think about thinking, speak about speaking, like what are the presuppositions, these meta moves, like what is the underlying assumptions so that the path keeps going. And thus there is an unknown that you're heading toward because you are walking, you don't know where you're going, but where you're going is not unknowable. You're keeping the faith that it's unknown. That's what, that's what philosophy has to do. I'm skeptical. You make people skeptical that we should stop here, but you make them keep faith that where you're going is unknown, not unknowable, that it is a mystery. And that actually something comes out of that walk that is creative and negentropic and that structures the subject differently than if you didn't take that walk, but that's a hard faith to keep. I think also it ties as well to the, um, this notion of skepticism as creating a certain zone, Descartes and different things, because there's a million dollar question here. How do you have skepticism without ending up in atomization, like individual, right? Because the moment you're skeptical, doesn't that kind of cut you off, right? The only way to be skeptical without isolating is through speech. Because in speech, you can talk with another person, you're always relating, and you can doubt in the speech, but you're open to the other in that act, in so much as you keep the presupposition away. You have to make sure the presupposition doesn't show up because that will stop the relating and then the skepticism will fall back into atomization. So the only way to keep skepticism skeptical so that faith can be alive is precisely in the free speech or the conversation where I'm sharing in skepticism. I'm sharing that we should stop here on the path. Oh, and you're made. Oh, and then the other thing, the experience of conversation very often is you think thoughts you never thought before. Well, maybe this is unknown, not unknowable. Maybe we are actually heading toward an unknown that's negentropic versus somewhere that's unknowable. Because as I speak, I'm able to generate things I did not know about. And so then that gives you confidence in that free speech that actually there is something that's alive in this and that we are going somewhere only in so much, though, as we can keep walls from going up. Because the moment walls go up, we get in trouble. And I think then on that, and I'll give it to you, Mr. Wen, is that the problem with confession, like conf when Paul talks about confessing Christ, it means speak freely. Make sure you keep the, if you're afraid of dying, say it anyway. Never be afraid to speak. The problem is now you're afraid not to confess the name of Christ. So it's become antithetical to its actual original meaning. The confession of Christ in the sense that you were talking about, Tyler, must be in service of the freedom of speech. The problem is it's been flipped in a meta move against mystery that has then made it a testament to the closing down of speech. So confession and testament must not be in service to an end of thought, but it's supposed to be a testament to the ever freedom of the confession. And if the church speaks, the if the church then comes to position the confession of Christ against that very spirit that Paul is speaking, then it has, through a meta move, become a servant of the very thing that it's supposed to confess against. Mr. Wynn, please. Um, one word. <laughs> Romance is the place of skepticism. When I've met people in my past that I've been romantic with, it's always when they've understood that I might say stupid things that are interpretations based upon my contingent place in the world. When I meet someone who's very beautiful and very attractive, it's because they understand that I can say stupid things, I can say nice things. I'm not going to be judged upon this, like the rigidity of what I'd say or don't say. And I think what romance means is to be open to the, the possibility that there's an experience beyond the confines of what you're trying to represent according to our under, way of understanding knowledge, you know? And I think this is romance. Romance is the place of skepticism. You let the candle shine for you. You smile in the mystery of this person who's before you, not based upon the identity with which today we would try to associate them with, you know, like a static representation or knowledge. Okay. And well, I'll just it. note quickly is that there's a tradition of eros leading to mystery and the unknown. Eros, sex, speech, intercourse is sex. There's something about speaking that is libidinal, and there's something about romance that is the moving of the unknown. Well, this would all follow. Uh, if romance has something to do with this keeping you in the presupposition list, well, then speech, poetry, romance, eros, it's a kind of romantic speaking. I think those things go together and would follow with Dante. Please. Yes, yeah, to give yourself over to the experience of, of not being confined even by your own self-relation, because if the self-relation can be anx anxiety-inducing and it confines and it over-abstracts and overthinks and over-determines what you experience, you know? 
But I think if you give yourself over to it, it doesn't mean it's outside of thinking. It just means that it's a different quality of thinking, which lets you, which lets you be with God or be with the the sexual act, for example, to be with like the nice dinner or a nice drink or anything. And, cons- and this is the point: like you will still continue to think, but in that released way, in that open way, to let thoughts come and go, to be open to the idea that even when you pray to God, it's not going to be pure silence. It's going to be your considerations about your day or that person you saw in a nice way that you haven't seen in four weeks, you know, because they've been, you know. And I think like this is the point of prayer is like prayer is not just like this like static silence. It's a type of silence that lets you think those things and just kind of know that it's fine. Like God's not judging you because you're thinking during, you know, <laughs> it's like, OK, I'm in the world. I'm doing things. And I said two more words because I had a second idea, but I think it's gone. And that's good. I'm going to let that be. <laughs> well, look, I think there's a bunch there because there's also a tradition of the beatific vision, um, mystical experience, orgasm, sex, speech. All of these things have gone together historically. And there's something about speech that is sexual and therefore inherently mystical. And, and the, the less presupposition less, the less presuppositional speech is, the more it seems to participate in that tradition. Um, and then the philosopher, in a sense, is keeping it in that in tradition, making sure the speech is free to be having that participatory function that becomes negentropic. And then I'll give it to Tyler here. And then for me, this also gets into where that would mean if speech, sex, all of these the particular person, limitation in that particular that then turns out to be limitless, this is also where the limit... The limit you encounter is not one you think based on what you like. You can't think a limit. A limit must be encountered. It must be a surprise. This is the key. If a limit is not a surprise, it's not a limit. You, it, a limit has to be encounter or it is thought. And if it is thought, you've thought it. So you've captured it. So it doesn't have the function. The key to a conversation, free speech allows people to encounter things they've never heard before that surprises them and to see how they respond and they get habituated to being surprised. What does love do to you? It surprises you and people tend to go pathological because they're not ready for it. What does God do when he's at his best? He surprises you, right? Reality is the surprise. The great mistake of the West is to associate the natural law with the truth, gravity and so forth, when natural law is simply the precondition necessary for a surprise to be intelligible. If nothing was given, then you couldn't encounter a surprise. It would not be meaningful. And what's another word that is associated with surprise? Miracle. What happens in creativity? A miracle. I didn't know where this came from. Something come up. I didn't know how we ended up talking this long or what came up. It was a surprise. Reality is the surprise. And the surprise is also tied with love, art, beauty, and particularity. And then the key is that it is in free speech that we habituate ourselves to a life of surprise and to be the kind of subjects who can hold it, who can let the surprise be without being overwhelmed. But that requires facing negativity because we tend to respond to surprise naturally in what way? Negatively. That tends to be the natural thing we do with surprise. But her philosophy is about creating the infrastructure where you habituate yourself to surprise so instead it can be miraculous and you can participate in it and spread it with other people. And the spreading of that surprise and miracle would ergo be an act of grace. Mr. Wynn and then Tyler. I saw you on mute, Mr. Wynn. Okay, it goes, it goes to, yeah, I'm just kind of like in awe. I think it goes back to our conversation we had where it's like every time he spoke, I was like, that's the point. That's it. Like, I don't need to say anything, but we will anyway because that's it. I feel like the... Yeah, I'm not even going to say anything. I'm going to let Tyler speak because it's. I love you, Tyler. Please. (laughs) Uh, I was just, I was like, oh my god, this is the most sexual ending to uh, to a net conversation ever. It's just this continual deferment. It's just keep pushing it off, keep pushing it off. (laughs) Anyways, that's all. (laughs) So the limit is limitless, right? It's like my point. Like, like that's my point. You can predict, like, in the surprise and the gift of the uncertainty of what, of what gives itself, you can also accept that there's also a limit in some moments. Like, I'm tired, like, you know, like, in the sexual act, right? That's it. Done, I'm tired. But, like, you, you also become expecting that it can happen again, like, and that's the point. Like, this conversation, like, I know that this is the limit, but it can happen again. You know, and this is this is the freedom and the grace and the gifting of life. It's like there are moments to be politically engaged and there are moments to enjoy a nice cup of tea or something with a friend, you know? Life is so dynamic and in and like inexhaustible in that sense where being is that which gives you these moments without even having to judge them as like, oh, this should keep repeating itself, I should enjoy this forever and ever. It's like, no, there, there can be a limit 
but this limit is also beautiful because like that's a, that's a series of something you know like it can go on indefinitely but I think I watched the film recently um is it called Pretty Little Things or Poor Things by your one of those the guy I hear there are movies the out there stars. And then this lady says, because like she has this pain, a brain implanted from her mother. She's the baby, and she says like, oh, like why does? And she's like, she's a child, like in this person's brain. And she says like, why, why do we not have sex more often? Like it's like a child's question because she was in a. It's quite weird actually. Now I've said that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she asked the question like, why does? Why do people not do this all the time? And the guy was laying there like really tired, like ah, oh, because you know, like there's a limit. There's like a. And she, she's confused because she's like, it's not that good. It should be like continuous and stuff, you know? And it's like, well, actually, you can affirm limit at that point where you, that specific way of being of sex or of prayer or of going to church or of riding a bicycle or of going to work, you know? You can affirm everything. And that's Nietzsche. This is literally Nietzsche. Like, Nietzsche is at that point where you affirm every aspect of the dynamic of life because it's beyond good and evil. And it's what's given to you as life. And if there is a God and he loves you, He's given this life for you in that way. Like, you cannot change that. And if you can, affirm this type of message, which lets you experience what God has given you in the Garden of Eden, you know? And I think this is my final point. Like, Divine. grace Divine. is so radical. Yeah. You can so radical that you can affirm even sex stopping, even this conversation stopping, even this bottle yeah. of water yeah. being empty, because maybe I can fill it up. Maybe one day I can't because of the socio political situation with climate change. There's no more water. But if I know that in comprehension, and that's not a surprise for me, I can change that. And that's also the freedom to do so, you know? Maybe not little old me, but maybe OG Rose is president. You know? oh, no. Chitan, please. <laughs> One line I just quickly say, you know, to, to be in this world actually already involves certain distance from automaticity. You know, if you look at psychoanalysis, it's a compulsive repetition actually takes you away. So to, to be in this world is already in some sense, we are already living in this world below to be in this world in some sense. There's, there's already this 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 gap or this this negative one in that sense that, that exists, which, which, you know, is an interesting question to think about. Not for today, some other time. <laughs> but... I, I think that's a, a brilliant question, point because the issue is that... So in Hegel, a way I, I take some of the philosophy of the right is that freedom is found in the identification with determination. Like if you identify with limit, then that becomes definition and you are free in that definition. You don't choose to be born without wings. That's a def that's a definite, that is um, de a determination. You're not given wings. But if you can identify with not having wings, then you are free because you are free in your determination because you are not bound by thinking about the fact that you don't have wings, right? Now, there's a danger in this that you then identify with totalitarian power, right? You're, you know, I'm determined to be like hungry and whatever, and that's bad. Well, the philosopher comes along and, ah, that's a pre, you stopped in the pre, how, how are you, how do you know that's the determination you should uh, identify with? You've, you've stopped. So let's keep going, right? So the key is the philosopher keeps you identifying with determinations on the road, but never with a determination that, keep, that makes you determined, like the philosopher keeps you identifying with determinations that you need to stay free, ergo moving on the path. And that therefore that's freedom. And the funny thing is that repetition, like you're saying there's like a repetition, like that very repetition is something you can identify with and then it's free, but it's already below. So you identify with the thing that's negative and then actually that belowness that is humbling becomes actually a ground of freedom and you're free in doing the dishes again. We talk about the belonging again. You're free in the repetition. You're free in these different things. And yet, because it is a repetition, is a structure to your freedom and therefore it's not chaotic. This is the issue. The repetition and the determination, if you identify it, means that your freedom has a definition and it is not chaotic. And then the question becomes, for me, the ultimate determination that determines the subject as um, self-effacing, falling apart, et cetera, so forth, is the determination of the surprise. A surprise by definition is determined. It's not something you chose. That's why it's a surprise. If you get to the place where you're conditioned that you can identify with the surprise, then you truly are free because there's nothing life can throw at you that would trip you up. The ability, like to me, so much of philosophy is about training to be able to identify with the surprise. And once you can do that, then you're always free and you're always walking on that path and you're always heading toward the unknown. And really the ability to identify with the surprise 
is quite miraculous. And then if there is something on the socioeconomic political order as a whole that requires the spreading of the capacity to identify with surprise, then that is what we need to scale to avoid the Nash equilibrium of the geopolitical order that is leading to a grass, uh, great stagnation, political turmoil, and all of these different things, of which is fundamentally non-rational because you can't be rational about a surprise. You can't be rational about something you don't expect, but you can be conditioned to handle what you do not expect, and that is the subject of which then is always free because you are not going to be self-effaced by something. And then there's a lot of people talking about themos, the need to have themos in this. Well, that's all thematic. The ability you're talking about, we're still talking after running out of water and it's been five hours. There's something like not stopping until it's complete, until you've let be the being, till you've let it be, till you've let the becoming come, that in, which has an orgasmic and a sexual sort of behavior, until you let the beauty unfold, you keep going. There's something thymotic about that. There is something thymotic rising to the occasion of being able to handle the challenge. It is late. Being able to handle the challenge of the surprise that requires you. And also, here's the key, following Raymond and Owen, Owen thymos requires not having armor. It is far more manly or masculine or thymotic or difficult to go on the battlefield without armor than with armor. A surprise is something you're not armored for. So it is an opportunity for a unique thymotic experience that can address the subject in manners that by not addressing, we have the meaning crisis, because I think a lot of the meaning crisis is in fact something about a thymos crisis, an inability to rise to the occasion of the unexpected and to let it not destroy you. In fact, to use it as material for a creative possibility which would then require you to be able to handle the surprise. And then, of course, there's a limit in that because you're limited from knowing the surprise ahead of time because if you didn't, it wouldn't be a surprise. So you are limited in the surprise because you are limited from knowing what the thing is before it surprises you. And thus the limit, that very limit is the possibility of life always being different and new and changing. Because if there's always the possibility of a surprise, there's always the possibility of creation and something new. And therefore, you don't have to be bored. And if you don't have to be bored, and boredom is not a state where you have nothing to do, but where you don't see significance in what you could do, which tends to come into existence by the 18th century with the growth of neoliberalism, then the fighting of boredom is replaced by the openness to the surprise of which then your capacity to encounter and work with means there's always something to do because there's always more path to be walking because you never let yourself stop on the path with a presupposition. You keep yourself going so you're not bored. And in fact, the concept of boredom is lost because you're just flowing on the path. It's hard to imagine Frodo and Sam bored on the way to Mount Doom. It's hard to imagine one bored when there's always unknown to let unfold. But in order to keep walking toward the unfold, you have to be ready to handle any surprise that's thrown at you. Otherwise, your ability to walk toward the unknown is contingent by you not being surprised by something that destroys you. So then you have to be prepared. You have to do work to be ready, not plan. We talked about that in the parallax course. You have to be prepared for the surprise, which is the work of philosophy on the subject to be able to handle what you do not know, to be able to handle uh, what happens in romance is a great example, to be able to handle the surprise of diversity, the surprise of money, all of these different things so that you are not devastated to where you stop on the road, but you keep going. So you have to be prepared. Um, and, to, and to keep going. And I think all of that is a kind of limit that once you accept and identify, you identify with your necessity to be prepared. That is what keeps you free on the path and that keeps you going. And I think philosophy has something to do with keeping alive a social order that keeps alive that path. Um, and that path then is where you really actually find belonging. And this is kind of the big argument. We, for most of history, have found belonging in a state. We need to find belonging on a path. And of course, Heidegger talked about pathways and clearings and different things. And I think uh, Frodo and Sam found in a way, Frodo found more belonging on the journey to Mount Doom than when he got back to the Shire, right? When he got back to the Shire, he couldn't identify and he had to go off to the Grey Havings or many of the great journeys. Once they go on a quest, they can no longer belong the same way because their belonging was that very path. But of course, there's a problem. Well, that means belonging is doomed once we like destroy the ring, right? There's a finite end to it. Fortunately, a grace is that thought can always think itself. So actually, the quest never has to end uh, because we ourselves can be engaged in a free speech that keeps us in a state of belonging that is the dance of the spe free speech, that is a state of relating to the other, not antagonistic, that is possible because of the skepticism that keeps us open, but we keep the faith in the skepticism in that free speech. So we stay on a path like Frodo and we find belonging in that and don't have to worry about falling back into the being of a state in which we don't feel at home again like Frodo does. But this is only possible with a certain conditioning that makes that philosophy can bring about that keeps presupposition destabilized that keeps you moving that keeps you on the path but keeping faith in that path 
that it is actually going toward an unknown. And I would argue that there is good reason from economic history to believe that a society that does that actually avoids the great stagnation. It tends to create wealth. It tends to actually handle diversity without falling into fascism. It is able to actually relate without the geopolitical tensions that we see today. And they are able to handle things like AI and technology as a tool for creative possibility versus something that one is encountered and self-effaced by. And so it requires this move of which has political and socioeconomic ramifications, which is a society of people that find belonging again on the path. And that path is the freedom of speech of which is the freedom of language and the word that philosophy keeps alive, of which is the erotic act that is the movement toward beauty and Dante, of which is the invitation in the dance that is the love that moves the sun and other stars. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it immensely.